We Didn't Do Anything Wrong Hardly, by Roger Kukendall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanna Schreck, Indianapolis, January 2021. We Didn't Do Anything Wrong Hardly, by Roger Kukendall. After all, they only borrowed it a little while, just to fix it. I mean, it isn't like we swiped anything. We maybe borrowed a couple of things like. But, gee, we put everything back like we found it pretty near. Even, like, the compressor we got from Stinky Brinker that his old man wasn't using. And I traded my outboard motor for my my old man. My father made me trade back. But it was like Skinny said. You know Skinny? Skinny Thompson? He's the one you guys keep calling the boy genius, but shucks, he's no... Well, yeah, it's like Skinny said. We didn't need an outboard motor, and we did need a compressor. You've got to have a compressor on a spaceship. Everybody knows that. And that old compression chamber, that old man, I I mean, Mr. Fields let us use, didn't have a compressor. Sure, he said we could use it. Anyway, he said we could play with it, and Skinny said we were going to make a spaceship out of it, and he said go ahead. Well, no, he didn't say it exactly like that. I mean, well, like, he didn't take it serious, sort of. Anyway, I made a swell spaceship. It had four portholes on it, and an airlock, and real bunks in it, and lots of room for all that stuff that Skinny put in there. But it didn't have a compressor, and that's why. What stuff? Oh, you know, the stuff that Skinny put in there. Like, the radar he made out of a TV set? and the anti-gravity, and the atomic power plant he invented to run it all with. He's awful smart, Skinny is, but he's not like what you think of a genius. You know, he's not all the time using big words, and he doesn't look like a genius. I mean, we call him Skinny because he used to be skinny. But he isn't now. I mean, he's maybe small for his age. Anyway, he's smaller than me. And I'm the same age he is. Of course, I'm big for my age, so that doesn't mean much, does it? Well, I guess Stinker Brinker started it. He's always riding Skinny about one thing or another, but Skinny never gets mad, and it's a good thing for Stinker, too. I saw Skinny clean up on a bunch of ninth graders. Well, a couple of them, anyway. They were saying, well, I guess I won't tell you what they were saying. Anyway, Skinny used judo, I guess, because there wasn't much of a fight. Anyway, Stinker said something about how he was going to be a rocket pilot when he grew up, and I told him that Skinny had told me that there wouldn't be any rockets, and that anti-gravity would be the thing as soon as it was invented. So Stinker said it never would be invented, and I said it would, so, and he said it would not, and I said, well, if you're going to keep interrupting me, how can I... All right, anyway... Skinny broke into the argument and said that he could prove mathematically that anti-gravity was possible, and Stinky said sure he could, and Skinny said sure he could, and Stinky said sure he could, like that. Honestly, is that any way to argue? I mean, it sounds like two people agreeing, only Stinky keeps going sure, like that, you know. And Stinky, what does he know about mathematics? He's had to take remedial arithmetic ever since. No, I don't understand how the anti-gravity works. Skinny told me, but it was something about mesin flow and stuff like that that I didn't understand. The atomic power plant made more sense. Where do we get what uranium? Uh, Gee, no, we couldn't afford uranium, so Skinny invented a hydrogen fusion plant. Anyone can make hydrogen. You just take zinc and sulfuric acid and... Deuterium? You mean like heavy hydrogen? No, Skinny said it would probably work better, but like I said, we couldn't afford anything fancy. As it was, Skinny had to pay 5 or $6 for that special square tubing in the anti-gravity, and the plastic space helmets we had cost us $0.98 cents each. And it cost a dollar and a half for the special tube that Skinny needed to make the TV set into a radar. You see, we didn't steal anything, really. It was mostly stuff that was just lying around. Like, the TV set was up in my attic, and the old refrigerator that Skinny used the parts to make the atomic power plant out of from. And then a lot of the stuff we already had, like the skin diving suits we made into spacesuits, and the vacuum pump that Skinny had already, and the generator. Sure, we did a lot of skin diving, but that was last summer. 
That's how we knew about old man Brinker's compressor that Stinky said was his, and I traded my outboard motor for and had to trade back. And that's how we knew about Mr. Fields' old compression chamber and all like that. The rocket? Well, it works on the same principle as the atomic power plant, only it doesn't work except in a vacuum, hardly. Of course, you don't need much of a rocket when you have anti-gravity. Everyone knows that. Well, anyway, that's how we built the spaceship, and believe me, it wasn't easy. I mean, with Stinky all the time bothering us and laughing at us. And I had to do a lot of lawn mowing to get money for the square tubing for the anti-gravity and for the special tube for the radar and my space helmet. Stinky called the space helmets kid stuff. He was always saying things like, Say hello to the folks on Mars for me and bring back a bottle of Canal Number 5 and all like that, you know? Of course, they did look like kid stuff, I guess. We bought them at the Five and Dime and they were meant for kids. Of course, when Skinny got through with them, they worked fine. We tested them in the airlock of the compression chamber when we got the compressor in. They tested out pretty good for a half hour, then we tried them on in there. Well, it wasn't a complete vacuum, just 27 inches of mercury, but that was okay for a test. So anyway, we got ready to take off. Stinky was there to watch, of course. He was saying things like, farewell, oh brave pioneers, and stuff like that. I mean, it was enough to make you sick. He was standing there laughing and singing something like, up in the air, junior birdman, when we closed the airlock door, we couldn't hear him. Skinny started up the atomic power plant, and we could see Stinky laughing fit to kill. Takes a couple of minutes for it to warm up, you know. So Stinky started throwing rocks to attract our attention, and Skinny was scared that he'd crack a porthole or something, so he threw the switch and we took off. Boy, you should have seen Stinky's face. I mean, you really should have seen it. One minute he was laughing, you know, and the next he looked like a goldfish. I guess he always did look like a goldfish, but, I mean, even more like then. And he was getting smaller and smaller because we had taken off. We were gone pretty near six hours. It was a good thing my mom made me take a lunch. Sure, I told her where we were going. Well, anyway, I told her we were maybe going to fly around the world in Skinny and my spaceship, or maybe go down to Carson's Pond. And she made me take a lunch and made me promise I wouldn't go swimming alone. And I sure didn't. But we did go around the world three or four times. I lost count. Anyway, that's when we saw the satellite on radar. So Skinny pulled the spaceship over to it, and we got out and looked at it. The spacesuits worked fine, too. Gosh, no, we didn't steal it or anything. Like Skinny said, it was just a menace to navigation, and the batteries were dead. It wasn't working right anyway. So we tied it on to the spaceship and took it home. No, we had to tie it on top. It was too big to take inside with the antennas sticking out. Of course, we found out how to fold them later. Well, anyway, the next day, the Russians started squawking about a capitalist plot, and someone had swiped their satellite. Gee, I mean, with all the satellites up there, who'd miss just one? So I got worried that they'd find out we took it. Of course, I didn't need to worry because Sticky told them all right, just like a tattletale. So anyway, after Skinny got the batteries recharged, we put it back. And then when we landed, there were hundreds of people standing around and Mr. Anderson from the State Department. I guess you know the rest. Except maybe Mr. Anderson started laughing when we told him, and he said it was the best joke on the Russians he ever heard. I guess it is when you think about it. I mean, the Russians complaining about somebody swiping their satellite, and then the State Department answering a couple of kids borrowed it, but they put it back. One thing that bothers me, though... We didn't put it back exactly the way we found it, but I guess it doesn't matter. You see, when we put it back, we goofed a little. I mean, we put it back in the same orbit, more or less, but we got it going in the wrong direction. End of We Didn't Do Anything Wrong Hardly by Roger Kukendall Recording by Joanna Schreck, Indianapolis, January 2021「How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. » The Big Trip Up Yonder by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
This is a recording by Jack Murray. The Big Trip Up Yonder by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Gramps Ford, his chin resting on his hands, his hands on the crook of his cane, was staring irascibly at the five-foot television screen that dominated the room. On the screen, a news commentator was summarizing the day's happenings. Every 30 seconds or so, Gramps would jab the floor with his cane tip and shout, Hell, we did that a hundred years ago? Emerald and Lou, coming in from the balcony, where they had been seeking that 2185 AD rarity privacy, were obliged to take seats in the back row, behind Lou's father and mother, brother and sister-in-law, son and daughter-in-law, grandson and wife, granddaughter and husband, great-grandson and wife, nephew and wife, grandnephew and wife, great-grandniece and husband, great-grandnephew and wife, and, of course, Gramps, who was in front of everybody. All save Gramps, who was somewhat withered and bent, seemed, by pre anti gerasone standards, to be about the same age, somewhere in that late 20s or early 30s. Gramps looked older because he had already reached 70 when anti gerasone was invented. He had not aged in the 102 years since. Meanwhile, the commentator was saying, Council Bluffs, Iowa, was still threatened by stark tragedy, but 200 wary rescue workers have refused to give up hope and continue to dig in an effort to save Albert Haggerton. 183, who had been wedged for two days in a... I wish you'd get something more cheerful, Emma whispered to Lou. Silence, cried Gramps. Next one shoots off his big bazoo while the TV's on is going to find himself cut off without a dollar. His voice suddenly softened and sweetened. When they wave that checkered flag at Indianapolis Speedway and old Gramps gets ready for the big trip up yonder. He sniffs sentimentally while his heirs concentrated desperately on not making the slightest sound. For them, the poignancy of the prospective big trip had been dulled somewhat through having been mentioned by Gramps about once a day for 50 years. Dr. Brandon Keyes Bullard, continued the commentator, president of Wyandotte College, said in an address tonight that most of the world's ills can be traced to the fact that man's knowledge of himself has not kept pace with his knowledge of the physical world. Hell, snorted Gramps. We said that a hundred years ago. In Chicago tonight, the commentator went on, a special celebration is taking place in the Chicago Lying In Hospital. The guest of honor is Lau W. Hitz, age zero. Hitz, born this morning, is the 25th million child to be born in the world. The commentator faded and was replaced on screen by young Hitz, who squalled furiously. Hell, whispered Lou to Emerald. We said that a hundred years ago. I heard that, shouted Gramps. He snapped off the television set and his petrified descendants stared silently at the screen. You, there, boy. I didn't mean anything by it, sir, said Lou, aged 103. Get me my will. You know where it is. You kids all know where it is. Fetch, boy. Gramps snapped his gnarled fingers sharply. Lou nodded dudley and found himself going down the hall, picking his way over bedding to Gramps' room, the only private room in the Ford apartment. The other rooms were the bathroom, the living room, and the wide windowless hallway, which was originally intended to serve as a dining area, and which had a kitchenette in one end. Six mattresses and four sleeping bags were dispersed in the hallway and living room, and the day bed in the living room accommodated the eleventh couple, the favourites of the moment. On Gramps' bureau was his will, smeared, dog-eared, perforated, and blotched with hundreds of additions, deletions, accusations, conditions, warnings, advice, and homely philosophy. The document was, Lou reflected, a fifty-year diary, all jammed onto two sheets, a garbled, illegible log of day after day of strife. This day, Lou, would be disinherited for the eleventh time, and it would take him perhaps six months of impeccable behaviour to regain the promise of a share in the estate, to say nothing of the daybed in the living room for M and himself. Boy, called Gramps. Coming, sir. Lou hurried back into the living room and handed Gramps a will. Pen, said Gramps. He was instantly offered eleven pens, one from each couple. Not that leaky thing, he said, brushing Lou's pen aside. Ah, there's a nice one. Good boy, Willie. He accepted Willie's pen. That was the tip they had all been waiting for. Willie, then Lou's father, was the new favourite. Willie, who looked almost as young as Lou, though he was 142, did a poor job of concealing his pleasure. He glanced shyly at the daybed, which would become his, and from which Lou and Emerald would have to move back into the hall, back to the worst spot of all, by the bathroom door. Gramps missed none of the high drama he had authored, and he gave his own familiar role everything he had. Frowning and running his finger along each line, as though he were seeing the will for the first time, he read aloud in a deep, portentous monotone, like a bass note on a cathedral organ. I, Harold D. Ford, 
residing in building 257 of Alden Village, New York City, Connecticut, do hereby make, publish, and declare this to be my last will and testament, revoking any and all former wills and codiciles by me at any time heretofore made. He blew his nose importantly and went on, not missing a word and repeating many for emphasis, repeating in particular his ever more elaborate specifications for a funeral. At the end of the specifications, Gramps was so choked with emotion that Lou thought he might have forgotten why he'd brought out the will in the first place. But Gramps heroically brought his powerful emotions under control and, after erasing for a full minute, began to write and speak at the same time. Lou could have spoken his lines for him, he had heard them so often. I have had many heartbreaks here, leaving this veil of tears for a better land, Gramps said and wrote, but the deepest hurt of all has been dealt to me by... He looked around the group, trying to remember who the malefactor was. Everyone looked helpfully at Lou, who held his hand up resignedly. Gramps nodded, remembering and completing the sentence. My great-grandson, Louis J. Ford. Grandson, sir, said Lou. Don't quibble, you're in deep enough now, young man, said Gramps, but he had made the change. And from there, he went without a misstep through the phrasing of the disheritance, causes for which were disrespectfulness and quibbling. In the paragraph following, the paragraph that had belonged to everyone in the room at one time or another, Lou's name was scratched out and Willie substituted as heir to the apartment, and, the biggest plum of all, the double bed in the private bedroom. So, said Gramps, beaming, he erased the date at the foot of the will and substituted a new one, including the time of day. Well, time to watch the McGarvey family. The McGarvey family was a television serial that Gramps had been following since he was 60, or for a total of 112 years. Can't wait to see what's going to happen next, he said. Lou detached himself from the group and lay down on his bed of pain by the bathroom door, wishing Em would join him. He wondered where she was. He dozed off for a few moments until he was disturbed by someone stepping over him to get into the bathroom. A moment later, he heard a faint gurgling sound, as though something were being poured down the wash basin drain. Suddenly it entered his mind that Em had cracked up, that she was in there doing something drastic about Gramps. Em? He whispered through the panel. There was no reply, and Lou pressed against the door, the worn lock, whose bolt barely engaged in its socket, held for a second, then let the door swing inward. Morty! gasped Lou. Lou's great-grandnephew, Mortimer, who had just married and brought his wife home to the Ford Menage, looked at Lou with consternation and surprise. Morty kicked the door shut, but not before Lou had a glimpse what was in his hand. Gramps' enormous economy-sized bowl of anti gerasone which had apparently been half-emptied, and which Morty was refilling with tap water. A moment later, Morty came out, glared defiantly at Lou, and brushed past him wordlessly to rejoin his pretty bride. Shocked, Lou didn't know what to do. He couldn't let Gramps take the mouse-trapped Annie Gerasone, but if he warned Gramps about it, Gramps would certainly make life in the apartment, which was merely insufferable now, harrowing. Lou glanced into the living room and saw that the Fords, Emerald among them, were momentarily at rest relishing the botches that the McGarveys had made of their lives. Stealthily, he went into the bathroom, locked the door as well as he could, and began to pour the contents of Gramps' bottle down the drain. He was going to refill it with the full-strength anti gerasone from the 22 smaller bottles on the shelf. The bottle contained a half gallon, and its neck was small, so it seemed to Lou that the emptying would take forever, and the almost imperceptible smell of anti gerasone like Worcestershire sauce, now seemed to Lou, in his nervousness, to be pouring out into the rest of the apartment, through the keyhole and under the door. The bottle gurgled monotonously. Suddenly, up came the sound of music from the living room, and there were murmurs and the scraping of chair legs on the floor. Thus ends, said the television announcer, the 29th hours and 121st chapter in the life of your neighbours and mine, the McGarveys. Footsteps were coming down the hall. There was a knock on the bathroom door. Just a sec, Lou cheerily called out. Desperately, he shook the big bottle, trying to speed up the flow. His palm slipped on the wet glass, and the heavy bottle smashed on the tiled floor. The door was pushed open, and Gramps, dumbfounded, stared at the incriminating mess. Lou felt a hideous, prickling sensation on his scalp and the back of his neck. He grinned engagingly through his nausea, and, for the want of anything remotely resembling a thought, waited for Gramps to speak. Well, boy, said Gramps at last, looks like you got a little tidying up to do. And that was all he said. He turned around, elbowed his way through the crowd, and locked himself in his bedroom. The fours contemplated Lou in incredulous silence a moment longer, and then hurried back to the living room, as though some of his horrible guilt would taint them, too, if they looked too long. Morty stayed behind long enough to give Lou a quizzical, annoyed glance. Then he also went into the living room, leaving only Emerald standing in the doorway.
Tears streamed over her streaks. Oh, you poor lamb. Please don't look so awful. It was my fault. I put you up to this with my nagging about Gramps. No, said Lou, finding his voice. Really, you didn't. Honest, Em. I was just... You don't have to explain anything to me, hon. I'm on your side, no matter what. She kissed him on one cheek and whispered in his ear. It wouldn't have been murder, hon. It wouldn't have killed him. It wasn't such a terrible thing to do. It just would have fixed him up so he'd be able to go any time God decided he wanted him. What's going to happen next, Em? said Lou, hollowly. What's he going to do? Lou and Emerald stayed fearfully awake almost all night, waiting to see what Gramps was going to do. But not a sound came from the sacred bedroom. Two hours before dawn, they finally dropped off to sleep. At six o'clock, they arose again, for it was time for their generation to eat breakfast in the kitchenette. No one spoke to them. They had twenty minutes in which to eat, but their reflexes were so dulled by the bad night that they had hardly swallowed two mouthfuls of egg-tight processed seaweed before it was time to surrender their places to their son's generation. Then, as was accustomed for whoever had been most recently disinherited, they began preparing Gramps' breakfast, which would present be served to him in bed, on a tray. They tried to be cheerful about it. The toughest part of the job was having to handle the honest-to-God eggs and bacon and oleomargarine on which Gramps spent so much of the income from his fortune. Well, said Emerald, I'm not going to get all panicky until I'm sure there's something to be panicky about. Maybe he doesn't know what it was I busted, Lou said hopefully. Probably thinks it was your watch crystal, offered Eddie, their son who was toying apathetically with his buckwheat-type processed sawdust cakes. Don't get sarcastic with your father, said Em, and don't talk with your mouth full either. I like to see anybody take a mouthful of this stuff and not say something, complained Eddie, who was 73. He glanced at the clock. It's time to take Gramps his breakfast, you know. Yeah, it is, isn't it, said Lou, weakly. He shrugged. Let's have the tray, Em. We'll both go. Walking slowly, smiling bravely, they found a large semicircle of long-faced forwards standing around the bedroom door. Em knocked. Gramps, she called brightly. Breakfast is ready. There was no reply, and she knocked again, harder. The door swung open before her fist. In the middle of the room, the soft, deep, wide, canopied bed, the symbol of the sweet by and by to every forward, was empty. A sense of death, as unfamiliar to the forwards as Zoroastrianism, or well, the causes of Sepoy mutiny stilled every voice, slowed every heart. A wed, the heirs began to search gingerly, under the furniture, and behind the drapes, for all that was mortal of Gramps, father of the clan. But Gramps had not left his earthly husk but a note, which Lou finally found on the dresser, under a paperweight which was a treasured souvenir from the World's Fair of 2000. Unsteadily, Lou read it aloud. Somebody who I have sheltered and protected and taught the best I know how all these years last night turned to me like a mad dog and diluted my anti gerasone Or tried to. I am no longer a young man. I can no longer bear the crushing burden of life as I once could. So, after last night's bitter experience, I said goodbye. The cares of this world will soon drop away like a cloak of thorns and I shall know peace. By the time you find this, I will be gone. Gosh, said Willie brokenly. He didn't even get to see how the 5,000-mile speedway race was going to come out. All the solar series, Eddie said, with large, mournful eyes. For whether Mrs. McGarvey got her eyesight back, added Morty. There's more, said Lou, and he began reading aloud again. I, Harold D. Ford, etc., do hereby make, publish, and declare this to be my last will and testament, revoking any and all former wills codiciles by me at any time heretofore made. No, cried Willie, not another one. I do stipulate, read Lou, that all of my property, of whatsoever kind and nature, not be divided, but do devise and bequeath it to be held in common by my issue, without regard for generation, equally share and share alike. Issue, said Emerald. Lou included the multitude in a sweep of his hand. It means we all own the whole damn shoot and match. Each eye turned instantly to the bed. Share and share alike, asked Morty. Actually, said Willie, who was the oldest one present, it's just like the old system, where the oldest people head up things with their headquarters in here, and... I like that, exclaimed Em. Lou owns as much of it as you do, and I say it ought to be for the oldest one who's still working. You can snooze around here all day, waiting for your pension check, while poor Lou stumbles in here after work, all tuck it out, and... How about letting somebody who's never had any privacy get a little crack at it? Eddie demanded hotly. Hell, you old people have 
plenty of privacy back when you were kids. I was born and raised in the middle of that goddamn barracks in the hall. How about you? Yeah? Challenged Morty. Sure, you've all had it pretty tough, and my heart bleeds for you, but try honeymooning in the hall for a real kick. Silence, shouted Willie imperiously. The next person who opens his mouth spends the next six months by the bathroom. Now clear out of my room, I want to think. Her vase shattered against the wall, inches above his head. In the next moment, a free-for-all was underway, with each couple battling to eject every other couple from the room. Fighting coalitions formed and dissolved with the lightning changes of the tactical situation. Em and Lou were thrown into the hall, where they organized others in the same situation and stormed back into the room. After two hours of struggle, with nothing like a decision in sight, the cops broke in, followed by television cameramen from mobile units. For the next half hour, patrol wagons and ambulances hauled away forwards, and then the apartment was still and spacious. An hour later, films of the last stages of the riot were being televised to 500 million delighted viewers on the eastern seaboard. In the stillness of the three-room Ford apartment on the 76th floor of Building 257, the television set had been left on. Once more, the air was filled with cries and the grunts and the crashes of the fray, coming harmlessly now from the loudspeaker. The battle also appeared on the screen of the television set in the police station, where the Fords and their captors watched with professional interest. Em and Lou, in adjacent 4 by 8 cells, were stretched out peacefully on their cots. Em called Lou through the partition. You got a wash basin all your own too? Sure, wash basin, bed, light, the works. And we thought Gramps' room was something. How long has this been going on? She yelled out her hand. For the first time in 40 years, hon, I haven't got the shakes. Look at me. Cross your fingers, said Lou. The lawyers are going to try to get us a year. Gee, Em said dreamily. I wonder what kind of wires you'd have to pull to get put away in solitary. All right, pipe down, said the turnkey, or I'll toss the whole kid and caboodle of you right out, and the first one who lets on to anybody outside how good jail is ain't never getting back in. The prisoners instantly fell silent. The living room of the apartment darkened for a moment as the riot scenes faded on the television screen and then the face of the announcer appeared, like the sun coming from behind a cloud. And now, friends, he said, I have a special message from the makers of anti gerasone a message for all you folks over 150. Are you hampered socially by wrinkles, by stiffness of joints and discoloration or loss of hair, all because these things came upon you before anti gerasone was developed? Well, if you are, you need no longer suffer, need no longer feel different and out of things. After years of research, medical science has now developed super anti gerasone In weeks, yes, weeks, you can look, feel, and act as young as your great-great-grandchildren. Wouldn't you pay $5,000 to be indistinguishable from everybody else? Well, you don't have to. Safe, tested super anti gerasone costs you only a few dollars a day. Right now, for your free trial card, just put your name and address on a dollar postcard and mail it to super box 500000 Schenectady, New York. Have you got that? I'll repeat it. Super, box 500,000. Underlying the announcer's words was a scratching of Gramps' pen, the one Willie had given him the night before. He had come in a few minutes earlier from the Idle Owl Tavern, which commanded a view of building 257 from across the square of asphalt known as the Olden Village Green. He had called a cleaning woman to come straighten the place up, then had hired the best lawyer in town to get his descendants a conviction a genius who had never gotten a client less than a year and a day. Grants had then moved the day bed before the television screen so he could watch from the reclining position. It was something he dreamed of doing for years. Schenectady, murmured Gramps. Got it. His face had changed remarkably. His facial muscles seemed to have relaxed, revealing kindness and equanimity under what had been taut lines of bad temper. It was almost as though his trial package of super anti gerasone had already arrived. When something amused him on television, he smiled easily, rather than barely managing to lengthen the thin line of his mouth a millimetre. Life was good. He could hardly wait to see what was going to happen next. End of The Big Trip Up Yonder by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Recording by Jack Murray. The Common Man, Part 1, by Guy McCord also known as Dallas McCord Reynolds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Ralph J. Martin. The Common Man, Part 1, by Guy McCord, also known as Dallas McCord Reynolds. It would, of course, take a trio of ivory tower scientists to conceive of tracking down that statistical entity, the common man, and testing out an idea on him, and only the ivory tower type would predict that egregiously wrongly. Frederick Braun, MD, PhD, and various other Ds, pushed his slightly crooked horn rims back on his nose and looked up at the two-story wooden house. There was a small lawn before it, moderately cared for, and one tree. There was the usual porch furniture. The house was going to need painting in another six months or so, but not quite yet. There was a three-year-old hover car parked at the curb of a make that anywhere else in the world but America would have been thought of ostentatious in the view of seeming economic status of the householder. Frederick Braun looked down at the paper in his hand, then up at the house again. He said to his two companions, By Caesar, I will admit it is the most average-looking dwelling I have ever seen. Patrick O'Gara said impatiently, Well, do we or don't we? Her hair should have been on a ponytail or bouncing on her shoulders, or at least in the new Etruscan revival style, not drawn back in its efficient bun. Ross Woolley was unhappy. He scratched his fingers back through his reddish crew cut. This isn't going to sound silly, Patricia said testedly. We've been through all that, Rossi. Good heavens. Nothing ventured, nothing. Braun let the sentence dribble away as he stuffed the paper into a coat pocket, which had previously been used as a waste receptacle for many a year and led the way up the cement walk, his younger companions immediately behind. He put his finger to the doorbell and cocked his head to one side. There was no sound in the depths of the house. Dr. Braun muttered, Bell out of order. It would be, Ross said sourly. Remember, average, here, let me, he rapped briskly on the wooden door jam. They stood for a moment, then he knocked again, louder, saying almost as though, hopefully, maybe there's nobody home. All right, all right, take it easy, a voice growled even as the door opened. He was somewhere in his thirties, easygoing face, brownish hair, bluish of eye and moderately good-looking. His posture wasn't the best, and he had a slight tummy, but he was a goodish masculine specimen by Midwestern standards. He stared out at them, defenses now that it was obvious they were strangers. Were they selling something, or in what other manner were they attempting to intrude on his well-being? His eyes went from the older man's thin face to the football hero's heft of the younger, then to Patricia O'Gara. His eyes went up and down her figure and became approvingly in spite of the straight business suit she affected. He said, What could I do for you? Mr. Crowley? That's right. I'm Ross Woolley, and my friends are Patricia O'Gara and Dr. Frederick Braun. We'd like to talk to you. There's nobody sick here. Patricia said impatiently, Of course not. Dr. Braun isn't a practicing medical doctor. We are research biochemists. We're scientists, Ross told him, putting it on what he assumed was a man's level. There's something on which you could help us. 
Crowley took his eyes from the girl and scowled at Ross. Me? Scientist? I'm just a country boy. I don't know anything about science. There was a grudgingly self-depreciation in his tone. Patricia took over, a miracle smile overwhelming her air of briskness. We'd appreciate the opportunity to discuss it with you. Dr. Braun added in the clincher. And it might be remunerative. Crowley opened the door wider. Well, just so it doesn't cost me nothing. He stepped back for him. Don't mind the place. Kind of must up. Fact is, the wife left me about a week ago, and I haven't gotten around to getting somebody to come in and kind of clean things up. He wasn't exaggerating. Patricia Ogar had no pretensions to the housewife's art herself, but she sniffed when she saw the condition of the living room. There was a dirty shirt drooped over the sofa back, and beside the chair which faced the TV set, there were a half a dozen empty beer cans. The ashtrays hadn't been emptied for at least days, and the floor had obviously not been swept since the domestic tragedy which had sent Mrs. Crowley packing. Now that the three strangers were within his castle, Crowley's instinct for hospitality asserted themselves. He said, Make yourselves comfortable. Here, we'd all get these things out of the way. Anybody like a drink? I got some beer in the box, or he smirked at Patricia. I can got some port wine you might like, not this belly wash you buy it by the gallon. They declined the refreshments. It wasn't quite noon. Crowley wrestled the chair which had been before the TV set around so he could sit facing them and then sat himself down. He didn't get this and his face showed it. Frederick Braun came to the point. Mr. Crowley, he said, did it ever occur to you that somewhat amidst our nearly 100 million American males, there is the average man? Crowley looked at him. Braun cleared his throat and with his thumb and forefinger pushed his glasses more firmly on the bridge of his nose. I suppose that it isn't exactly the technical way in which to put it. Ross Woolley shifted his football shoulders and leaned forward and... No, doctor, that's exactly the way to put it, he said to Crowley very seriously. We've done this most efficiently. We've gone through absolute piles of statistics. We've done what? Crowley all but wailed. Take it easy, will you? What are you talking about? Patricia said impatiently, Mr. Crowley, you are the average American, the man on the street. The common man. He frowned at her. What do you mean, common? I'm as good as anybody else. That's exactly what we mean, Ross said placidly. You are exactly as good as anybody else, Mr. Crowley. You're the average man. I don't know what the devil you're talking about. Pardon my language, miss. Not at all, Patricia sighed. Dr. Braun... Why don't you take over? We seem to be all speaking at once. The little doctor began to enumerate on his fingers. The center of population has shifted to this vicinity. So the average American lives here in the Middle West. Population is also shifting from rural to urban. So the average man lives in a city of approximately this size. Determining average age height, weight, and simple with government data as complete as they are. Also racial background. You, Mr. Crowley, are predominantly English, German, and Irish, but have traces of two or three other nationalities. Crowley was staring at him. How in the devil did you know that? Ross said wearily, we've gone through a lot of trouble. Dr. Braun hustled on. You've had the average amount of education. Didn't quite finish high school. 
you make average wages working in a factory as a clerk. You spent some time in the army, but you never saw combat. You drink moderately, are married, and have one child, which is average for your age. Your IQ is exactly average, and you vote Democrat, except occasionally when you switch over to Republican. Now, wait a minute, Crowley protested. You mean I'm the only man in this whole country that's like that? I mean, you mean I'm the average guy right in the middle? Patricia O'Gar said impatiently. You are the nearest thing to it, Mr. Crowley. Actually, possibly one of a hundred persons would have served our purpose. Okay, Crowley interrupted, holding up a hand. That gets us to the point. What's this here purpose? What's the big idea prying like into my affairs until you learned all this about me? And what's this stuff about me getting something out of it? Right now, I'm between jobs. The doctor pushed his battered horn rims back on his nose with his forefinger. Yes, of course, he said reasonably. Now we get to the point. Mr. Crowley, how would you like to be invisible? The three of them looked at him. It seemed to be his turn. Crowley got up and walked into the kitchen. He came back in a moment with an open can of beer from which he was gulping even as he walked. He took the can away from his mouth and said carefully, You mean like a ghost? No, of course not, Braun said in irritation. By Caesar, man, had you no imagination? Can't you see it was only a matter of time before someone, possibly working on an entirely different subject of research, stumbled upon a practical method of achieving invisibility? Now wait a minute, Crowley said in his voice belligerent. I'm only a country boy, maybe, without an egghead background. But I'm just as good as the next man and just as smart. I don't think I like your altitude. Attitude. Ross Woolley muttered unhappily. He shot a glance at Patricia O'Gar, but she ignored him. Patricia turned on the charm. Her face opened into a smile and she said soothingly, Don't misunderstand, Mr. Crowley. May I call you Don? I'm sure we're going to be associates. You see, Don... We need your assistance. This was more like it. Crowley sat down again and finished a can of beer. Okay. It won't hurt to listen. What's the pitch? The older man cleared his throat. We'll cover it quickly so that we get to the immediate practical aspects. Are you interested in biodynamics? Um, uh, no, of course not. Let me see. Are you at all familiar with the laws pertaining to refraction? No. He cleared his throat again, unhappily. Have you ever seen a Medusa, Mr. Crowley? The gelatinous, umbrella-shaped, free, swimming form of marine invertebrate related to the coral polyp and the sea anonone? Russ Woolley scratched his crew cut and grimaced. Jellyfish, doctor, jellyfish. But I think the Portuguese man of war might be better example. Oh, jellyfish, Crowley said. Sure, I've seen jellyfish. I got an aunt who lives near Baltimore. We used to go down there and swim in Chesapeake Bay. Sting the devil out of you. What about it? Patricia leaned forward, still smiling graciously. I really don't see a great deal of point going into theory, gentlemen. She looked at Ross and Dr. Braun and then back to Crowley. Don, I think what the doctor was leading up to was an attempt to describe in layman's language the theory of the process into which we've stumbled. He was using jellyfish as an example of a life form all but invisible. But I'm sure you're not interested in technical terminology, are you? A good deal of goobly gawk, really, don't you think? Yeah, that's what I say. Let's get to the point. 
You mean you think it's possible to make a guy invisible? Nobody could see him? It's not a matter of thinking, Ross said sourly. We've done it. Crowley stared at him. Done it? What do you mean? Personal? You got invisible? Yes, all three of us. Once each. And you come back all right? So anybody can see you again? The doctor said reasonably. Here we are, quite visible. The effect of the usual doses lasts for approximately 12 hours. They let him assimilate it for a few minutes. Some of the ramifications were coming home to him. Finally, he got up and went into the back again for another can of beer. By this time, Ross Woolley was wishing he would renew his offer, but the other had forgotten his duties as host. He took the can away from his mouth and said, You want to make me visible? You want me to, like, kind of experiment on? His eyes thinned. Why pick me? The doctor said carefully, Because you're the common man, the average man, Mr. Crowley. Before we release development, we would like to have some idea of the scopes of the effect. The beer went down chuck a luck. Crowley put the can aside and licked his bottom lip and then rubbed it with a fingertip. He said slowly, Now take it easy while I think about this, he blinked. Why, you could just walk into a bank. The three were watching him empty-faced. Exactly, Dr. Braun said. Frederick Braun stared gloomily from the hotel suite's window at the street below. He peered absently at his thin wrist, looked blank for a moment, then realized all over again that his watch was being cleaned. He stared down at the street once more, his wrinkled face unhappy. The door opened behind him, and Patricia O'Gara came in briskly and said, No sign of the guinea pig, huh? No. Where's Rossi? The doctor cleared his throat. There was an item on the newscast, a humor bit. It seems that the head waiter of the gourmet... Have you ever eaten at the gourmet, Patricia? Do I look like a millionaire? At any rate, a half a pound of the best Caspian caviar disappeared, a spoonful at a time, right before his eyes. Patricia looked at him. Good heavens. Yes, well, Ross is going to pay the tab. Patricia looked at her watch. The effects will be wearing off shortly. Crowley will probably be back any time. We warned him about returning to visibility in the middle of some street, completely nude. She sank into a seat and looked at the doctor. I suppose you admit I was right. Her voice was Chris. The other turned on her. And just why would you say that? This caviar bit. Our friend Donald Crowley has obviously walked into the gourmet restaurant having heard it was the most expensive in New York, and ate as much as he could stuff down the most expensive item on the menu. The elderly little doctor pushed his battered horn rims further back on his nose. Tell me, Patricia, when you made the experiment, did you do anything, uh, anything at all that saved you some money? Uncharacteristically, she suddenly giggled. I had the time of my life riding on a bus without a fare. Braun snorted. Then Dr. Crowley, in eating his caviar, did substantially the same thing. It probably been a life's ambitious of his to eat at an ultra-swank restaurant and then walk out without paying. To be frank, the doctor cleared his throat unapologetically. It's always been one of mine. Patricia conceded him a chuckle, but then said impatiently, It's one thing, my saving 15 cents on a bus ride, and his eating 
$25 worth of caviar. Merely a matter of degree, my dear, Patricia said in irritation. Why in the world did we have to bring him to New York, where he could pull such childish tricks? We could have performed the experiment right there in Far Cry, Nebraska. Dr. Braun abruptly ceased his pacing he had begun and found a chair. He absently stuck a hand into a coat pocket, pulled out a crumpled piece of paper, stared at it for a moment as though he had never seen it before, grunted, and returned it to his pocket. He looked at Patricia O'Gar. We felt on completely unknown territory, he would feel less constrained, don't you remember? In his hometown, his conscience would be more apt to restrict him. Suddenly, something came to her. She looked at her older companion suspiciously. That newscast, was there anything else on it? Don't look innocent, you know what I mean. Well, there was one item. Out with it, she demanded. The Hotel Belfonte threatens to sue that French movie star, Bridget whatever her name is. Bridget Lauren, Patricia said, staring. What's that got to do with Donald Crowley? The good doctor was embarrassed. It seems that she came running out of her hotel suite, um, uh, semi-dressed and screaming that the hotel has a ghost. Good heavens, Patricia said with sudden vision. That's one aspect I hadn't thought of. Evidently, Crowley did. Patricia O'Gar said definitely. My point's been proven. Our average man is a slob. Give him the opportunity to exercise unlimited freedom without danger of consequence, and he becomes an undisciplined, dangerous lout. Ross Woolley had come in, scowling, just in time to catch most of that. He tossed his hat onto a table and fished in his pocket for a pipe and tobacco. Nuts, Pat, he said. In fact, it's just the opposite has been proven. Don just on a fun binge. Like a kid in a candy shop. He hasn't done anything serious. Went into a fancy restaurant and ate some expensive food. Sneaking into the hotel room of the world's most famous sex symbol and got a close-up, he grinned suddenly. I wish I had thought of that. Ha! Ah, Patricia snorted. Our engagement is off, you peeping Tom. Children, children, Braun chuckled. I admit, though, I think Ross is correct. Don's done little we three didn't when we first given the robe of invisibility. We experimented, largely placefully, even childishly. Patricia bit out. This experiment is ridiculous anyways, and I don't know why I ever agreed to it. Scientific nonsense. Where are our controls? For it to make any sense, we have to work with scores of subjects. Suppose we do agree that the manner in which Don Crowley has reacted is quite harmless. Does that mean we can release this discovery to the world? Certainly not, Ross said suddenly. But you agreed that we go by the results of this. I agreed to no such thing, Rossy Woolly, you overgrown lug. All I agreed to was consider the results. I was and am... The opinion that if the person our politician so lovingly called the common man was release of restrictions inhibiting him, he'd go hog wild and destroy both society and himself. What is to prevent murder, robbery, rape, and a score of other crimes? 
given invisibility for anyone who has a couple of dollars with which to go into a drugstore and purchase our serum. Her fiancé sighed deeply, jamming tobacco fiercely into the bowl of his briar. He growled, Look, you seem to think that the only thing that restricts a man is the fear of being punished. There are other things, you know. Good heavens, she said sarcastically. Name one. There is the ethical code in which he was raised, based on religion or otherwise. There is the fact that man is fundamentally good, to use a trite term, given the opportunity. My education has evidently been neglected, Patricia said, still argumentatively. I've never seen evidence to support your claim. I'm not saying individuals don't react negatively, given opportunity to be antisocial, he all but snarled. I'm just saying people in general, common little people, trend towards decency, desire the right thing. Individuals, my neck, Patricia snapped back. Did you ever hear of Rome and the games? Here a whole people, millions of them, were given the opportunity to indulge in statistic spectacles to their heart's desire. How many of them stayed home from the games? She laughed and ridiculed. Ron flushed. Some of them did, confound it. Dr. Brunt had been taking in their debate uncomfortably, as though in spite of himself he said no. Very few, I'm afraid. Religious ethic, Patricia pursued relentlessly. The greatest of commandments is thou shalt not kill. But comes along a war in which killing becomes not only permissible, but an absolute virtue and all our good Christians, Jews, Mohammeds, even Buddhists, who supposedly are not allowed to kill mosquitoes, wait in with sheer happiness. War releases abnormal passions, Ross said grudgingly. You don't need a war. Look at the Germans, supposedly one of our most highly civilized people. When the Nazi government released all the restraints on persecution of the Jews, gypsies, and others, you know what happened. This began in peacetime, not in war. Dr. Braun shifted in his chair and he said in his low voice, We needn't look beyond our own borders. The manner in which our people have conducted themselves against the Maronites from the very beginning of white occupation and North America is quite shocking. Ross said to him, I thought you were on my side. The Indian Wars were a long time ago. We're more advanced now. Braun said softly, My father fought against Geronimo in Arizona. It wasn't so long ago as all that. Ross Woolley felt the argument going against him and lashed back. We've been over and over this. What's your point? Patricia said doggedly. The same point I tried to make from the beginning. This discovery must not be generally released. We'll simply have to suppress it. The door opened behind them. They turned. Nothing was there. Ross, scowling, lumbered to his feet to walk over and close it. Hey, take it easy, a voice laughed. Don't walk right into a guy. Ross stopped, startled. Dr. Braun and Patricia stood up and stared too. Crowley laughed. You look all like you've seen a ghost. Ross rumbled a begrudgingly chuckle. It'd be all right if we saw the ghost. It's not seeing you that's discerning. The air began to shimmer, somewhat like heat in the desert's face. Crowley said, Hey, the stuff's wearing off. Where's my clothes? Where you left them? There in that bedroom, Ross said. We'll wait for you. He went back and rejoined his associates. 
The door to the bedroom opened. There was a shimmering, more obvious now, and then the door closed behind it. He rejoined us just in time, Dr. Braun murmured. Another ten minutes and he would have, um, materialized down on the street. Ross hadn't finished the discussion. He set his face all in but a pout. What you don't realize, Pat, is the world has gone beyond the point where scientific discoveries can be suppressed. If we try to keep this lid on this today, the Russians or the Chinese or somebody will hit on it tomorrow. Patricia said impatiently, Good heavens, let's don't bring the Cold War into it. Ross opened his mouth to snap something back at her, closed it again and, and shrugged his bulky shoulders angrily. In a matter of less than ten minutes, the bedroom door reopened and this time a grinning Crowley emerged, fully dressed, he said. Man, that was a devil of an experience. They saw him to a chair and had him talk it all through. He was candid enough, bubbling over with it all. In the some eleven and a half hours he'd been on his own, he had covered quite an area of Manhattan. Evidently, the first hour had been spent in becoming used to the startling situation. He couldn't even see himself, which, to his surprise, affected walking and even use of his hands. He had to get used to it. Then there was the fact that he was nude and felt nude and hence uncomfortable walking about in mixed pedestrian traffic. But that phase passed. Early in the game, he found that there was small percentage in getting into crowds. It led to all sorts of complications, including the starting of minor rows, one person thinking another was pushing when it was simply a matter of Crowley trying to get out from underfoot. Then he went through a period of the wonder of it all, being able to walk anywhere and observe people who had no suspicion that they were being observed. It was during that phase that he sought out the hotel in which he had read the chesty French movie actress Bridget Lauren was in residence. Evidently, he hit the nail right on the head. Bridget was at her toilet when he arrived on the scene. In telling about this, Crowley leered amusedly at Patricia from the side of his eyes. She ignored him. He'd then gone through a period when full realization of his immunity had hit him. At this point, he turned to Braun. Hey, Doc, have you ever eaten any caviar? You know, that Russian stuff. Supposed to be the most expensive food in the world. The doctor cleared his throat. Small amounts and hors d'oeuvres at the cocktail parties. Well, maybe I'm just a country boy, but the stuff tastes like fish eggs to me. Anyways, back to the story. He had gone into Tiffany's and into some of the other swank shops, and then into a bank or two, and stared at the treasures of Manhattan. At this point, he looked at Ross. You know, just being invisible don't mean all that. How are you going to pick up a wad of thousand dollar bills and just walk out the front door with them? Everybody see the dough just kind of floating through the air. I came to the same conclusion myself when I experimented, Ross said wirily. He hadn't ridden on subways. Free. He had eaten various food in various swank restaurants. He even had drinks in name bars, sampling everything from ataxia to vintage champagne. He was of the opinion that even though he remained visible for the rest of his years, he'd still stick to bourbon and beer. He had gone down to Wall Street and into the offices of the top brokerage firms and into the sanctum sanctatoriums of the wealthiest of mucky mucks, but had been too impatient to stick around long enough to possibly hear something that might be profitable. He admitted grudgingly that he wouldn't have known what to listen for anyways. Frustrated there, he had gone back uptown and finally located the hangout of one of the more renowned sports promoters who was rumored to have a 
gangster connections and was currently under bail due to a boxing scandal. He had stayed about that worthy's office for an hour, claiming nothing more than several dirty jokes he had never heard before. All of his activity had wearied him, so he went to the Waldorf, located in an empty suite in the tower, and climbed into a bed for a nap after cooling phoning room service to give him a call in two hours. That had almost led to disaster. Evidently, someone on room service had found the suite to be supposedly empty and sent the boy up to investigate. However, when he heard the door open, Crowley had merely rolled out of the bed and left, leaving a startled bellhop behind staring at rumpled bedclothes which had seemed to stir of their own accord. The rest of the day was little different from the first hours. He had gone about gawking in places he wouldn't have had he had been visible, into the dressing rooms of the Roxy, into the bars of swank private clubs, into the offices of the FBI. He would have liked to walk in on a poker game with some real high rollers playing, such as Nick the Greek, but he didn't have time nor know how how to go about finding one. Crowley wound it all up with a gesture of both hands, palms upward. I gotta admit, it was fun, but what the devil good is it? They looked at him questioningly. Crowley said, I mean, how's it practical? How can you make a buck out of it if you turn it up to the public like? Everybody go around robbing everybody else and you all wind up equal. Dr. Braun chuckled in depreciation. There would be various profitable uses, Don. One priceless one would be scientific observation of wildlife. For that matter, there would be valid usage in everyday life. There are often personal reasons for not wishing to be observed. Celebrities, for instance, wishing to avoid crowds. Yeah, Crowley laughed, or a businessman out with his secretary. Braun frowned. Of course, there are many other aspects. It would mean the end of such thing as the Iron Curtain, and also the end of such things as American immigration control. There are many, many ramifications, Don, some of which frighten us. The world would be never quite the same. Crowley leaned forward confidentially. Well, I'll tell you. I was thinking it all out. What we got to do is turn it over to the army and soak them plenty for it. The others ignored his cutting himself a piece of the cake. Ross Woolley merely grunted bitterly. Patricia said impatiently, We thought of most of these things through, Don. However, Dr. Braun happens to be quite a follower of Lord Russell. Crowley looked at her blankly. He's a pacifist, she explained. Dr. Braun pushed his glasses back more firmly on his nose and said, the military have already have quite enough gadgets to destroy quite literally everything, and I trust one set of them no more than the other. If both sides had our discovery, then very well. Each would go about attempting to find some manner of penetrating the invisibility or taking various measures to protect their top secrets. But to give it to one would be such an advantage that the other would have to embark immediately upon a desperate attack before the advantage could fully be realized. If we turn this over to the Pentagon for exclusive use, the Soviets would have to begin a preventive war as soon as they learn of its existence. You are red, Crowley said, scowling. The doctor shrugged hopelessly. No, he said. Crowley turned to the other two. If you think it's a patriotic thing to do, why don't one of you sell it to the government? 
Patricia said testically, You don't understand, Don. Even if it were so thoroughly in disagreement that we could act unilaterally, we couldn't. You see, this is a three-way discovery. No one of us knows the complete process. His face twisted. Look, maybe some of this egghead stuff doesn't get through to me, but I'm not stupid, see? You got that stuff, haven't you? You gave me that shot this morning. Ron looked over, saying reasonably, Don, this discovery was hit upon by accident. The three of us are employed in the laboratories of a medical research organization. I am the department head. Patricia and Ross were doing some routine work on a minor problem when they separately stumbled upon some rather startling effects, practically at the same time. Each separately brought their discoveries to me. And working, you might say, intuitively, I added some conclusions of my own and... Well, I repeat, the discovery was stumbled upon. Crowley assimilated that. None of you knows how to do it, make those injections like by himself. That is correct. Each knows just one phase of the process. Each must combine with the other two. Patricia said impatiently, and thus far, we wish to keep it that way. Rossi believes the discovery should be simultaneously revealed on a worldwide basis and let man adapt to it as best he can. I think it should be suppressed until man has grown up a little, if he ever does. The doctor facilitates between the two positions. What he would truly like to see is the method kept only for use of qualified scientists. But even a good doctor realized what a dream that is. Crowley took them all in, one at a time. Well, what the devil are you going to do? That's a good question, Ross said unhappily. This experiment is a farce, Patricia said irritably. After all our trouble locating Don, our common man, we have found out nothing we didn't know before. His reactions were evidently largely similar to our own, and she broke it off and frowned thoughtfully. The other three looked at her questioningly. Patricia said, You know... We simply haven't seen this thing through as of yet. What do you mean, Pat? Ross growled. She turned to him. We haven't given Don the chance to prove which one of us is right. One day is insufficient. Half the things he wished to do, such as sneaking around, picking up stock tips in Wall Street, and inside information on sporting events. Hey. Take it easy, Crowley protested. I was just, like, curious, Ross said heatedly. That's not fair, I'll admit. I, too, thought of exactly the same possibilities. But thinking about them and going through with them are different things. Haven't you ever thought of what you do, given the chance to be a worldwide supreme dictator? But truly, if the job were offered, would you take it? Good heavens, Patricia said disgustedly. Remind me to break off our engagement if I haven't already done it. I hate overpowering men. All I'm saying is that we have to give Don at least a week. One day isn't enough. Dr. Braun cocked his head to one side and said uncomfortably, I'm not sure... But that in a week's time, our friend Don might be able... See here, Don. Would you mind going down to the hotel's bar while we three talk this through? 
Crowley obviously took umbrage to that, but there was nothing to be done. Frowning peevishly, he left. The doctor looked from one to the other of his associates. By Caesar, do you realize the damage friend Don could accomplish in a week's time? Patricia laughed at him. That's what I keep telling the two of you. Do you realize the damage that any person could do with invisibility? Not to speak of giving it to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the world, Ross said. We started this. Let's go through with it. I back Pat's suggestion that we give Don sufficient serum to give him 12 hours of invisibility a day for a week. However, we will ration it out to him day by day so that if things get out of hand, we can cut his supply. That's an idea, Patricia said, and I suspect that within half the period, we'll all be convinced that the process will have to be suppressed. Ross leaned forward. Good. I suggest we three keep this suite and get down a room elsewhere so he won't be inhibited by our continual presence. Once a day, we'll give him enough serum for one shot, and he can take it at any time he wishes to. He ran his beefy hand back through his red crew cut in gesture of satisfaction. If he seems to get it out of hand, we'll call it all off. Dr. Braun cleared his throat unhappily. I have premonition of disaster. But I suppose if we've come this far, we should see the experiment through. Patricia said ungraciously, At least the lout will be limited in his accomplishments by his lack of imagination. Imagine going into that French girl's dressing room. Yeah, Ron said, Lucasly trying to make his big face open look dreamy. You wretch, Patricia laughed. The wedding is off. But Crowley was no lout. He was full of the folk wisdom of his people. God helps those who help themselves. It's each man for himself, and the devil take the hindmost. Not to speak of. Never give a sucker an even break. If I didn't do it, somebody else would. Had he had been somewhat more of a student, he might have also run into that nugget of ancient Greece. The morals are the invention of the weak to protect themselves from the strong. Once convinced that the three eggheads were incapable of realizing the potential of their discovery, he had little difficulty in arguing himself into the stand that he should. It helped considerably to realize that in all the world, only four persons, including himself, were aware of the existence of the invisibility serum. He spent the first day in what Marx called the Das Kapital, the original accumulation of capital. Although it would seem unlikely that even in his wild accusations of the most confirmed Marxists, no great fortune was ever before begun in such wise. It was not necessary, he found, to walk into a large bank and simply seemingly levitate the money out of the front door. In fact, that would have meant disaster. However, large sums of money are to be found elsewhere on Manhattan, and for 11 hours, Crowley used his native ingenuity and American know-how for most of which he had gleaned from watching TV crime shows, by the end of the day, he had managed to accumulate in the neighborhood of $100,000 and was reasonably sure that the news would not get back to his sponsors. The fact was, he had cleaned out the treasuries of several numbers rackets and those of two bookies. It was important, he well realized, that he'd be well underway before the three eggheads decided to lower the boom. The second day, he spent making his preliminary contacts. 
in an operation which was helped by his activities the day before. He was beginning to already get the feel of the underworld element with which he had decided he was going to have to work, at least in the early stages of his operations. Any leader, he be military, political, or financial, knows that true greatness lies in the ability to choose assistance. Be you a Napoleon with his marshals, a Roosevelt with his brain trust, a J.P. Morgan with his partners, the truism applies. No great leader has ever stood alone. But Crowley also knew instinctively that he was going to have to keep the number of his immediate associates small. They were going to have to know his secret, and no man is so naive as not to realize that while one person can keep a secret, it becomes twice as hard for two, and from that point on, the likelihood fades into geometric progression. On the fifth day, he knocked on the door of the suite occupied by Dr. Braun and his younger associates and pushed his way in without waiting for a response. The three were sitting around waiting his appearance and to issue him his usual day's supply of serum. They greeted him variously. Patricia with her usual brisk, almost condescending smile, Dr. Braun with a gentle nod and speaking of his first name, Ross Woolley sourly. Ross obviously had some misgivings the exact nature of which he couldn't quite put his finger upon. Crowley grinned and said, Hello, everybody. Sit down, Don, Braun said gently. We have been discussing your experiment. While the newcomer was finding his seat, Patricia said testedly, Actually, we're not quite happy about your reports, Don. We feel in if you'll pardon us, an evasive quality about them, as though you weren't completely frank. In short, Ross snapped, have you been pulling things you haven't told us about? Crowley grinned at them. Now you folks are downright suspicious. Dr. Braun indicated some notes on the coffee table before him. It hardly seems possible that your activities could be confined largely to going to the cinema, to the swankier nightclubs, and eating in the more famed restaurants. Crowley's grin into a half-embarrassed smirk. Patricia thought of a small boy who had been caught in mischief, but was still somewhat proud of himself. He said, well, I gotta admit, there have been a few things. Come on over to my place and I'll show you. He looked at Braun. Hey, Doc, about how much is one of them Rembrandt's paintings worth? Braun rolled his eyes toward the ceiling. Great Caesar, he murmured. He came to his feet and looked around at the rest of them. Let's go over there and learn the worst, he said. At the curb, before the hotel, Ross Woolley looked up and down the street for a cab. Crowley said, his voice registering self-depreciation. Over here. Over here was a several-tone, fantastically huge hover limousine. A natalie dressed sharp-looking, expressionless-faced young man behind the wheel. All three looked at Crowley. He opened the door. Climb in, folks. Nothing's too good for you scientists, huh? Inside, sitting next to a window with Patricia beside him and Dr. Braun at the far window and Ross in the jump seat, Crowley said expansively. This is Larry. Larry, this is Dr. Braun and his friends I was telling you about. Ross Woolley and Patrick O'Gar. They're like scientists, Larry said. Hey! Without inflection, and pulled the heavy car into traffic. Ross spun on Crowley. Don, where'd you get this car? Crowley laughed. You'll see. Take it easy. You'll see lots of things. They were too caught up in their own thoughts in the barrage of demands that they were leveling at Crowley to notice direction. It wasn't until they were already on the George Washington Bridge that Patricia blurted, 
Don, this isn't the way to your hotel. Crowley said tolerantly, Take it easy, Pat. We're taking a short detour. I have something I want to show you in Jersey. I will like this, Ross snapped. The redhead shifted in his heavy shoulders in a reflective protest against the confining tweed coat he wore. Relax, Crowley told him reasonably. I've been thinking things out quite a bit, and I've got a lot to discuss with you folks. They were crossing the bridge now, and Larry headed into the maze, which finally unraveled itself to the point where it was obvious they were heading north. Larry hit the lift lever, and they rose ten feet from the surface. Braun said evenly, You have no intention of taking us to your room. You use that as a ruse to get us out of your hotel and further across the bridge until we are now in a position where it's quite impossible for us to summon police assistance. Crowley grinned. That's right, Doc. Didn't I tell you these three were real eggheads, Larry? Look how quick he figured that out. Larry grunted in what might have been amusement. Ross growling low in his throat turned suddenly in a jumpsuit and grabbed Crowley by the coat front. What's going on here? Crowley snapped, Larry! From seemingly nowhere, the chauffeur had produced a thin black automatic with now lazily pointing it, not so much at Ross as at Dr. Braun and Patricia. He said evenly, Easy, friend. Ross released his grip. Put that thing away, he blurted. Sure, sure, Larry said his voice, all but disinterested. The gun disappeared. Crowley, now only stifled, ruffled, said now, Take it easy, Ross. Nothing's going to happen to you. I'm going to need you folks, and I'm going to treat you right. Where are we going? I had the boys rent me a big estate like up in the Catskills. Big place. Nice and quiet. In fact, the last tenants used it for one of these rest sanitariums. You know, rich people with DTs are trying to get a monkey off their back. The boys, Patricia said softly. He looked at her and grinned again. Crowley was obviously enjoying himself. I ain't got a few people working for me, he explained. Dr. Brom blurted, You fool! You mean you revealed the existence of the process Pat Ross and I worked out to a group of ignoramuses? Crowley said angrily, Now look, Doc, don't get on about that bit. Maybe I'm just a country boy, but I'm as smart as the next man. Just because some of you eggheads spend half your life in college don't mean you've got any monopoly on good common sense. I went to the school of hard knocks, understand? And I got plenty of diplomas to prove it. Take it easy on that ignoranus talk. Patricia said suddenly, Don's right, Dr. Braun. I think you've badly underestimated him. Ross snorted sourly at that remark. We've all underestimated him. Well, I think you'll agree that our friend Don will get no more injections of the indivisibility serum. Crowley chuckled. They looked at him. Three sinkings of stomach taking place simultaneously. Now you know, I thought that might be your altitude. Attitude, Ross muttered. So I went through the trouble of coming up to your suite last night and sort of confiscating your supply. By the looks of it, I'd say there was enough for another ten shots or so. See, Patricia said to Ross, you're not as smart as you thought you were. Don's one up on you. End of The Common Man, Part 1, by Guy McCord, also known as Dallas McCord Reynolds. Narrated by Ralph J. Martin. The Common Man, Part 2, by Guy McCord, also known as Dallas McCord Reynolds. Narrated by Ralph J. Martin. The Common Man, Part 2. 
the estate which the boys had secured for Crowley was two or three miles out of Tannersville on a mountainside and quite remote. He took considerable pride in showing them about, although it was obvious he had been here before only once himself. He was obviously enjoying the situation thoroughly and had planned it out in some detail. Besides the empty-faced Larry, who had driven the car, they were introduced to two more of Crowley's confederates, neither of whom gave any indication that the three were present under duress. The first was a heavy-set, moist-palmed southerner with a false air of jovial, shook hands heartily and said nothing with a good many words for a few minutes, then excused himself. The third confidant was an older man of sad mien who would have passed easily in the swankiest of Washington, New York, or London private clubs. He was introduced simply as Mr. Whiteley, greeted them pleasantly as though all were fellow guests, had a word to say about the weather then, and passed on. Patricia was frowning. Your southern friend, Paul Teeter, it seems to me I've heard his name before. Paul Crowley grinned. Oh, Paul's been in the news from time to time. Ross was looking after Mr. Whiteley, who had disappeared into the main building. They were standing on the lawn as part of the guarded tour Crowley had given them. He growled. I suppose the two of them are experienced confidence men or something. Take it easy with those cracks, Ross, Crowley said. Whiteley used to have a seat on the stock exchange, a real big shot, but that was before they disbarred him, or whatever they call it. See here, Dr. Braun said urgently, we've had enough of all of this, Don. I propose we go somewhere where it will be possible for us to bring you to your senses and save you from disaster. Kind of a power, eh? Okay, Doc. Come on in here. He led them to the entrance, conducted them inside and into a library that led off the main entrada. He said, By the way, Larry has a few of his boys up here just kind of like estate watchmen. Some of them aren't much used to being out of the city, and they get nervous, so... Ross growled, all right, all right. Don't try to make a third-rate villain in a B-movie. You have guards about, and it would be dangerous to try to leave without your permission. How about that? Raleigh exclaimed as though amazed. Man, you eggheads catch on quick. Nothing like a college education. He waved them to chairs. I'm going to have to leave for a while. Whiteley's got some big deal brewing, and we gotta work it out. He grinned suddenly. And Larry's got a different kind of deal. One he's been planning for years, but hasn't been able to swing one or two details. It's a caution how many details a little man who wasn't there can handle in one of these king-size capers. He had used the pseudo-criminal term, caper, with considerable satisfaction. Crowley was obviously having the time of his life. Very well, Braun said. We'll wait. When the other had left the room, leaving the door open behind him, the doctor turned to his two younger associates. What children we've been! Ross Woolley growled unhappily. Brother, we couldn't have picked the worst so-called common man if we tried! That character as nutty as a stuffed date. Do you realize what he's in a position to do? Patricia twisted her mouth thoughtfully. I wonder if any of us really realize. I'm afraid even with all our speculation, we never truly thought this out. Dr. Braun pushed his glasses back on his nose with a forefinger. He shook his head. You make a mistake, Ross. We didn't make a bad choice in our selection of Don Crowley for our typical common man. Ross looked at him and snorted. Braun said doggedly, Remember, 
we attempted to find the average man, the common man, the little man, the man in the street. Well, it becomes obvious to me we did just that. Patricia said thoughtfully, I don't know. I'm inclined to think that from the beginning you two have underestimated Don. He has certainly shown considerable ingenuity. Do you realize that he's done all this in a matter of less than a week? Done what? Ross said sarcastically. She gestured. Look at this establishment. He's obviously acquired considerable money, and he already has an organization, or at least the beginnings of one. That is beside the point, Braun said ruefully. I say that he is reacting as would be expected, as the average man in the street would react given the opportunity to seize almost unlimited power and with small chance of reprisal. Patricia shrugged as though in disagreement. Braun looked at Ross Woolley. Close the door, Ross. Lord knows when we'll have another chance to confer. Obviously, something must be done. Ross came quickly to his feet, crossed to the door, looked up and down the hallway, which was empty, then closed the door behind him. He came back to the others and drew his chair in closer so that they could communicate in low voices. Braun said, One thing is definite. We must not allow him to secure further serum. For all we know, he might be planning to inject some of those gangsters he's affiliated himself with. Patricia shook her head thoughtfully. I still think you underestimate Don. He must realize he can't trust them. At this stage, he has to confide in at least two or three fully to utilize his invisibility. But in the long run, it isn't to his advantage to have anybody know about it. If the authorities such as the FBI began looking for an invisible man, sooner or later... They would penetrate the field of invisibility. You mean to think that Crowley will use these men for a time and then destroy them? He'll have to, or sooner or later the secret will be out, Braun said in soft logic. If he can't allow anyone to know about it, then we too must be destroyed, Ross growled. Then we got to finish him first, Butcher said. I don't know. Don is showing considerably more sense than you two evidently gave him credit for. I think in many ways what he's done is quite admirable. He's seen his chance and has grasped it. Why? I wouldn't be surprised that Don will be the most powerful man in the country within months. The two men were staring at her. Ross sputtered. Have you gone completely around the bend? Are you defending this, this? A voice chuckled. Mind your language, buster. Just take it easy or you'll wind up with some missing teeth. Ross jumped to his feet as though crouched with an electric prod. Dr. Braun stiffened in his chairs and his eye darted about the room. Patricia alone seemed collected. Don Crowley, she exclaimed exclaimed. You should be ashamed of yourself, listening in on private conversations. Yeah, the voice said. However, it's handy to know what the other side is dreaming up in the way of a bad time for you. Sit down, Buster. I've got a few things to say. Muttering, Ross resumed his place. The doctor sighed deeply and sank back into the sofa he had been occupying. The three could see an indentation magically appear in the upholstery of an easy chair across from them. Crowley's voice said confidently, You know from the first, I've kept telling you, eggheads, that I'm not stupid. But none of you bothered to listen. You think just because you spent six or eight years of your life in some college that you're automatically smarter than the other people. But I got a theory, like that it doesn't make any difference if you spend your whole life going to college, 
you still don't wind up smart if you didn't start that way. Ross began to mutter something, but Crowley snapped. Shut up for a minute. I'm talking. He resumed his condescending tone. Just for example, take a couple of guys who got to the top. Edison in science and Khrushchev in politics. For all practical purposes, neither of them went to school at all. Khrushchev didn't even learn to read until he was 28 years old. Then take Dr. Braun here. He spent half his life in school, and where'd it got him? He'd make more dough if he owned the local garage and dealer franchise for one of the automobile companies in some jerkwater town. And look at Ross. He'd probably make more money playing pro football than he does messing around with all those test tubes and Bunsen burners and everything. What good has all the school done either? Dr. Braun said gently, Could we get to the point? Take it easy, Doc. I'm in charge here. You just sit and listen. The point is, you three with your smart Alec egghead education started off thinking that Mr. Common Man, like you call me, is stupid. Well, it just so happens I'm not. Take Pat here. She's smarter than you two, but she had the same idea. That this here country boy isn't as smart as she is. She's going to fox him, see? As soon as she saw the way the cards were falling, she started buttering up to me. She even figured out that I was probably right in this room listening to you, planning how to trip me up. So she pretended to take sides against you. Why, Don, Patricia protested. Come off it, kid. You probably hate my guts worse than the others. You were the one who thought this particular average man was a slob. That all common people were slobs. Patricia's face went expressionless, but Ross, knowing her well, could sense her dismay. Crowley was right. She had been trying to play a careful game, but their supposedly average man had seen through her. Crowley's voice went thoughtful. I've been doing a lot of thinking this week. A lot of it. And you want to know something? You know what I decided? I decided that everybody talks a lot about the common man. But actually, he's never had a chance to, like, express himself. He's never been able to put over the things he's always wanted. Haven't you ever heard of democracy? Ross said sourly. Who do you think elects our officials? Shut up, I told you. I'm talking now. Sure, every four years, the lousy politicians come around. They stick their coonskin caps on their heads or... Indian bonnets, and start saying ain't when they make their speeches. Showing they're just folks, see? They go out into the country and stick a straw in their mouth and talk about crops to the farmers, all that sort of thing. But they ain't really common folk. Most of them are lawyers or bankers or something. They run those political parties and make all the decisions themselves. The common man never really has anything to say about it, Braun said reasonably. You have a choice. Do you think one candidate is opposed to your interests? You can elect the other. Crowley grunted his contempt. But they're both the same. No, there hasn't been no common man in Washington since Lincoln. And maybe he wasn't. Well, I'll tell you something. The kind of talk I hear down in the corner saloon from just plain folks makes a lot more sense to me than all this stuff the politicians pull. Braun cleared his throat and stared at the seemingly empty chair from whence the other belligerent's voice came. Are you thinking of entering politics, Don? Maybe I am. Good heavens, Patricia ejaculated. Oh, I'm not smart enough, eh? Well, listen, baby. 
The eggheads don't seem to be so great in there. Maybe it's time the common man took over. Dr. Braun said reasonably, But see here, Crowley, the ability to achieve invisibility doesn't give you any advantages in swinging elections or... He broke off in mid-sentence and did a mental double-take. Crowley laughed in contempt. The biggest thing you need to win elections, Doc, is plenty of dough. And I'll have that. But I'll also have the way to do more muckraking than anybody in history. I'll sit in on every important private get-together those crook politicians have. I'll get the details of every scheme they cook up. I'll get into any safe or safety deposit box. I'll have the common people you sneer so much about screaming for their blood. Ross rumbled. What do you expect to accomplish in office, Crowley? The voice became expansive. Lots of things. Take this Cold War. If you drop into any neighborhood bar, you'll hear what the common man thinks about it. The three of them stared at the seemingly empty chair. Drop the bomb first, Crowley snapped. Finish those reds off before they start it. In fact, I'm not even sure they got the bomb. They're not smart enough to. There was Sputnik, you know, Ross interrupted sourly. Yeah, but built by those captured German scientists. We're way ahead of those Ruskies and everything. Hit them now, finish them off. The eggheads in Washington are scared of their own shadows. Another thing I'd end is getting suckered in by those French and English politicians. What does America need with those countries? They always start up these wars and get us to bail them out. And I say, stop all this foreign aid and keep the money in our own country. And we can do a lot of cleaning up right here, too. We got to kick all the commies out of the government. Make all the commies and the socialists and these egghead liberals illegal. In fact, I'm in favor of shooting them. When you got an enemy, finish them off. And take the Jews. I'm not anti-Semitic, like you understand. Some of my best friends are Jews. But you got to realize that wherever they go, they cause trouble. They stick together. They take over the best businesses and all. Okay, you know what I say? I say, kick them out of the country. And they all came over here poor and made their money here. So let them leave the way they came. We'll, like, confiscate all their property except personal things. Patricia had closed her eyes in pain long before this. She said softly, I imagine somewhere along in there we'll get to the Negroes. I'm not against them, just so they stay in their place. But this integration stuff is bunk. You gotta face facts. Negroes aren't as smart as white people. Neither are chinks or Mexicans or Puerto Ricans. So, okay. Give them their own schools, up, up to high school is all they need, and let them have jobs like waiters and janitors and like that. They shouldn't take a white man's job, and they shouldn't be allowed to marry white people. It deteriorates the race like. Crowley was really becoming wound up now, wound up and expansive. There's a lot of things I'd change, see? Take freedom of speech and press like that. Sure, I believe in that. I'm 100% American. But you can't allow people to talk against the government. Freedom of speech is okay, but you can't let a guy jump up in the middle of a theater and yell fire. Why not, Ross growled. Freedom of speech is more important than a few movie houses full of people. Besides, if one man is allowed to jump and yell fire, then somebody else can yell out, You're a liar! There is no fire! You're not funny, Crowley said ominously. I wasn't trying to be, Ross muttered, and then blurred into sudden action. He shot to his feet, then arms extended, dashed towards the source of the voice. He hit the chair without slowing, grappled crazily. I got him! He wrestled awkwardly, fantastically, seeming 
in an insane tumbling without an opponent. Patricia was on her feet. She grasped an antique bronze candle holder and darted toward the now-fallen chair and to where Ross was wrestling desperately on the floor. Crowley tempted to shout, but was largely smothered. Patricia held the candlestick at the ready, trying to find an opening, trying to locate the invisible Crowley's head. Frederick Braun staggered to his own feet, bewildered, shaking. A voice from the door said flatly, Okay, that's it, said Sharper. I said cut it out. You all right, Mr. Crowley? It was Larry. His thin black automatic was held almost negligently in his right hand. He ran his eyes up and down Patricia, taking in the candlestick weapon. His ordinarily empty face registered a flicker of amused approval. Patricia grasped, Oh, no, dropped her bludgeon and sank into a chair, her head in her hands. Ross, his face in dismay, came slowly to his feet. The redhead stared at the gunmen momentarily, considering further attack. Larry, ignoring both Braun and Patricia, swung the gun to cover him exclusively. I wouldn't, he said emptily. All of a sudden, Ross's head jerked backward. His nose flattened crushingly, then spurted blood. He reeled back, his head flinging this way and that. Bruises and cuts peered magically. Raleigh's voice raged, You asked for it, wise guy. How do you like these apples? The sanguine Larry chuckled silently. Hey, take it easy, chief. You'll kill the guy. Ross had crumpled to the floor. There were still sounds of blows. Rowley raged, You're lucky I'm not wearing shoes. I'd break every rib in your body. Patricia was stirring in hopeless horror. She said sharply, Don, remember, you need Ross. You need all of us. Without all of us, there can be no more serum. The blows stopped. There will be no more serum anyways, Braun said shakily. The thin little man stood before his chair, not moving at all since the action began. Crowley's heavy breathing could be heard, but he managed to snarl. That's what you think, Doc, Braun said. By Caesar, I absolutely refuse to. Crowley interrupted ominously. You know, Doc... That's where this particular common man has it all over you eggheads. You spend so much time reading, you don't take in the action shows on TV. Now, what you're thinking is that even if we were to twist your arm a little, you'd stick to your guns. I suppose like it was Pat we was working on while you had to sit and watch. The elderly's brave front collapsed and his thin shoulders slumped. Crowley barked a laugh. Patricia by now was bent over the unconscious Ross, crying even as she tried to help him. Crowley said to the silent, all but disinterested Larry, Have these three put in separate rooms in that section they used for the violent wing when the place was a nut house. Have a good guard and see they don't talk back and forth. Yo, the boss, Larry said languidly. Crowley was thorough. For that, they had to give him credit. They were kept divided, each in a different room cell, and with at least two burly, efficient guards on constant watch. They were fed on army-type trays, and their utensils were checked carefully. There was no communication allowed, even with the guard. The second day, Crowley took measures to see their disappearance raised no alarm at either their place of employment or at the residences. This raised few problems since all were single and all had already taken off both from the job and from their homes in order to carry out their experiment. Crowley forced them to write further notes and letters finding excuses for extending their supposed vacations. He also had Larry return to the hotel suite, pay their bill, pack their things, and bring them to the Catskills estate which had become their prison. 
He had them make up lists of materials and equipment they would need for further manufacture of serum upon which they had stumbled and set off men to acquire the things. And on three occasions during the following weeks, he had them brought from their cells and spent an hour or so with them at lunch or dinner. Crowley evidently needed an audience beyond that of his henchmen. The release of his basic character, formerly repressed, was progressing geometrically, and there seemed to be an urgency to crow, to brag, to boast. On the third of these occasions, he was already seated at the table when they were ushered into the dining room. Crowley dismissed the guards with a wave of his hand as though they were livered servants. All had eaten, but there were liquors and coffee, cigars and cigarettes on the broad table. Ross sank into a chair and growled, Well, what has the great man Ross now? Crowley grinned at him, poured coffee, then a dollop of Napoleon brandy into it. He gestured with a hand, Help yourselves, folks. How you feeling? You getting all the books you wanted? You look kind of peaked, Pat. Miss O'Gara to you, you ape with delusions of grandeur, she snapped. When are you going to let us out of these prison cells? Crowley wasn't provoked. The strong can't afford to laugh at the malcontented weak. That's one of the things you'll never know, he said easily. You sure you want out? Something the doc said the other day had lots of fact in it. The fewer people know about this secret of mine, the better off I'll be, and the better off I am, the better off the whole country is going to be, and I got to think about that. I got responsibilities. A combination of Engine Charlie and Louis IV, eh? Ross muttered, feeling his beefy hand back over his crew cut. It was a relief to get out of his room and talk with the others, but he didn't want Crowley to see that. What's that? The other was impatient of conversation that went above his head. Braun explained gently. One said, I am the state, and the other, anything that's good for my corporation is good for the United States, or something quite similar. Crowley sipped at his coffee royal. Well, anyway, Pat, the day you're ready to leave that cell, you better start worrying, because that'll mean... I don't need you anymore. Ross growled, You didn't answer my question. Rob any banks lately, great man? The other eyed him coldly. Take it easy, buster. Maybe in the early stages of the common man movement, we have to take some strong arm measures, but that stage is about finished. Patrick O'Gar was interested in spite of herself, who said, You mean you already have all the money you need? He was expansive. Obviously, there was nothing to lose with these three, and he liked the sounding board. In spite of his alleged contempt for eggheads, there was an element in Crowley which wished to impress them, to grant him equal status in their own estimations. There's a devil a lot to know about big finance. You need a starter, but once you get it, the stuff just rolls in automatic. He grinned almost boyishly, especially when you got a certain little advantage, like me. Braun said interestedly, Oh, and how do you put your advantage to work? Well, now, I gotta admit, we aren't quite out of the woods. We need more capital to work with. But after tonight, we'll have it. Remember that Brinks job up in New England a long time ago? Well, we got something lined up even bigger. I work with Larry and his boys to pull it. Then there's another thing cooking that Whiteley's been keeping tabs on. It looks like IBM is going to split its stock, three for one. I gotta attend their next secret executive meeting and find out. If they do, we buy in just before, see? We buy on margin, buy options, all that sort of jazz. Whiteley knows all about it. Then we got another big deal in Washington. Looks like the government might devaluate the dollar. Whiteley explained it to me, kind of. Anyway, 
I got to go sit in on a conference the president's going to have. If they really decide to devalue, then Whiteley and me, we go ahead and put every cent we got into Swiss gold. Then the day after devaluation, we switch it all back into dollars again. Double our money. Oh, we got all sorts of angles, Doc. By Caesar, Braun ejaculated. You seem to have... Patricia had poured herself some coffee and was sipping it black, even as she stared at him. But, Don, what do you need all this money for? You already have more than plenty. Why not call it all off? Get out from under. Ross grunted. It's too late, Pat. Can't you see? He's got the power urge already. Crowley ignored him and turned to her, pouring more coffee and cognac for himself. I'm not running up all this dough just for me. You think you're the only one that's got ideals? Like, let me tell you. I just might be a country boy, but I got ambitions to put some things right in this world. Such as, Patricia prodded, bitterness in her voice. Ah, uh, we went through all that the other day. The thing is, now it's really underway. If you was seeing the newspapers these days, you'd know about the Common Man Party. Uh-oh, Ross muttered unhappily. It's just getting underway, Crowley said modestly. But we're hiring two of the top Madison Avenue outfits to handle publicity, and we're recruiting some of the best practical politicians in the field. Practical politicians, Ross snorted. Types like Huey Long, McCarthy, Pendergast, I suppose. The other misunderstood him. Yeah, and even better. We're going in big for TV time. Full-page ads in the newspapers and magazines, that sort of thing. The average man getting tired of the same old talk from Republicans and Democrats. Paul Teeter thinks we might have a chance in the next election. Given enough dough to plow into it, Ross leaned back disdainfully. What a combination! Whiteley, the broker who has been barred from activity on Wall Street, Teeter, the crooked politician, but with some connections from top to bottom, and Larry, whatever his name is, Mazzaroni, Larry supplied. You know where I first ran into his name? In one of them true crime magazines. He's a big operator. I bet he is, the redhead growled. Probably me with good mafia connections. I'm surprised you haven't attempted to take over that outfit. Crowley laughed abruptly. Just take it easy and all these things will work their way out. But meantime, I didn't bring you jokers here to make snide remarks. I got work for you. I'm fresh out of that serum, and you three are going to brew me another batch. They looked at him. Dr. Braun, Ross Woolley, Patricia O'Gar, their faces registering stubbornness, revolt, and dismay. He shook his head. Larry and some of his boys have experience, I gotta admit. I wouldn't even want to watch. I'm for standing firm, Braun said stiffly. There are but three of us. The most they can do is kill us. But if this man's insanity is a release upon the world... Crowley was shaking his head in deprecation. I like when you say the worst we can do is kill you. Man, haven't you heard about the Nazis and commies and all? You ought to read some of the men's adventure magazines. How do you think Joe Stalin got all them early Bolsheviks to confess? You think they weren't tough buzzards? Why make us go through all the trouble? Then you just cave in eventually anyways. Save yourself the grief. Patricia said impatiently, He's a right, I'm afraid. I would collapse rather quickly under physical coercion. You might last a bit longer, Ross, possibly longer still. But in the end, we would concede. Crowley said, as though in amazement, You know, eggheads aren't as stupid as some would reckon. Okay, folks, I got a laboratory all fixed up with your things. Let's go. Uh, Ross, old pal, 
I'm carrying heat, as Larry would say. So let's not have any trouble, eh? He had been as good as his word in regards to the lavatory. It was obviously one of the rooms used by the staff when the place had been a sanitarium. Now, each of the three all had equipment and supplies they required. Crowley took a seat at the far end of the room facing them. There had been a guard outside the door when they entered, and a call would bring them in in seconds. Even so, Crowley sat in such a wise that his right hand was ready to plunge inside his coat to the gun that evidently was holstered there. He said, Okay, folks, let's get about it. It took them a half an hour or so to sort out those materials each needed in his own contribution to the end product. Their captor looked at his watch impatiently. Let's get a move on here. I thought this was going to take a few minutes. Patricia said testily, What's the hurry, Don? He grinned at her. Tonight's the big night. This evening, just before closing, I'll walk into, well, you don't have to know the name. Like I said, it'll make the Brinks job look like peanuts. They lock up the place and leave, see? Okay, about two o'clock in the morning when the city's dead, Larry and the boys drive up into an alley behind. I go around one by one, sock the four guards on the back of the head. Then I open up for Larry, and they take their time and clear the place out. From then on, we got all the dough we need to start pyramiding it up the stock exchange and like that. Patricia had drawn on rubber gloves, pulled a lab apron around her. She began searching for test tubes, measuring devices. She murmured softly, What keeps you from telling yourself you're nothing but a crook, Don? When we first met you, it seems terribly long time ago, back there in Far Cry, you didn't seem to be such a bag egg. We didn't know then he was a cracked egg, Ross muttered. He looked to where Crowley slouched. His eyes narrowed as though considering his chances of rushing the other. Crowley grinned and shook his head. Don't try it, buster. Crowley looked at Patricia. You don't get it, sister. It's like somebody or other said the ends uh, justify the means. That means... I know what it means, Patricia said impatiently. Dr. Braun, who rather hopelessly was also beginning to work at the equipment their captor had provided, said reasonably, Don, the greater number of thinkers of the world have rejected that maxim. If you will um, uh, analyze it, you will find that the end and the means are one. Yeah, yeah, a lot of complicated egghead gas. What I'm saying, Pat, is that what I'm eventually heading is good for everybody. At least it's good for all the real 100% Americans. Everybody's going to go to college and guaranteed to come out with what you three got, a doctor's degree. Everybody's going to get a guaranteed annual wage, like whether or not they can do any work. It's not a guy's fault if he gets sick or unemployed or something. Everybody. The shades of all the social reformers who ever lived, Ross muttered. By Caesar, Braun said in despair. I have an idea you'll get the vote of every half-wit in the country. Crowley came to his feet. I don't like that kind of talk, Doc. Maybe I'm just a country boy. But I know what the common man wants. What I'm going to do is give it to him. Patricia looked up from her work long enough to frown at him. What special are you going to get out of this, Don? That took him back for a moment, and he scowled at her. Come, come, she said. You've already admitted to we three just what you think you are going to do. Now... How do you picture yourself after all this has been accomplished? His face suddenly broke into its grin, a somewhat sly element in it now. You know, when I get this all worked out, the folks are going to be pretty thankful. I bet, Ross muttered. He too was working at his element of compounding the serum. 
Yeah, they will, Buster, Crowley said reluctantly. And they're going to want to show it. Have you ever seen one of those movies like Ben-Hur back in the Roman days? Can you imagine everybody in the whole country thinking you were the best guy ever lived? You know, like an emperor? Like Caligula, Dr. Braun said softly. I don't know any of their names, but they really had it made. Snap your fingers, and there's a big banquet with the best floor show in the world. Snap your fingers, and here comes the sexiest dames in Hollywood. Snap your fingers in some big entertainment like Chariot Race or something. Once I put this over, a common man party, that's the way people are going to feel about me and want to treat me. And if they don't, you'll make them? Ross said sarcastically. You're too smart for your own britches, egghead, Growly snarled. He looked at his watch. Let's get this rolling. I got to get down to the city and start this caper going. Russ handed a test tube to Dr. Braun and began stripping the gloves from his hands. That's my contribution, he said. Patricia had already delivered hers. Dr. Braun combined them, then heated the compounds, adding a distillate of his own. He said, When this cools... Ross crossed the room to the door and said something to the guard there. He returned in a moment with an anthropod ape in a cage. He sat it on a table and looked at them. Okay, he said to Braun, his voice dangerous. Let's see you inject the monk with this new batch of serum. Braun raised his eyebrows. The other watched him narrowly, saying nothing further. Dr. Braun shrugged, located a hypodermic needle, and prepared it. In a matter of moments, the animal was dejected. Ross said sourly, You don't trust your fellow man, Don? No, I don't. And stop calling me Don. It's Dan. Daniel Crowley. The three of them looked at him in bewilderment. The ape was beginning to shimmer as though he was being seen through a window wet with driving rain. Don's my goody, goody brother. We used to live in the same house with me. But ever since we were kids and I got picked up on a juvie delinquent rap for swiping a car, he's been snotty. Anyway, now he's moved to Fresco. Patricia blurted. But you, but you let us believe you were Donald. He brushed it off with a flick of his hand. You said you had some deal where I could make some money. Okay, I was between jobs. The ape was invisible now. Crowley peered in at him. Seems to work all right. Dr. Braun sighed. I am not a Borgia, Daniel Crowley. You're not a what? Never mind. I wouldn't poison even you if that is what you feared. Daniel Crowley took up the new container of serum and put a lid on it. He said, I got to get going. The guy out front will get you back to your rooms. No tricks with him, Buster. He was talking directly to Ross. He's already beat a couple of homicide raps. Back in their cell rooms, they found that there was but one guard. Evidently, the all-out robbery attempt to be held this night involved practically all of Larry Mazzaroni's forces. Beyond that, this guard did not seem particularly interested in keeping them from talking back and forth to each other through the peoples that centered their doors. After a couple of hours, during which time they largely held silence, Immersed in their own thoughts, Dr. Braun called out, Patricia, Ross, I should tender my apologies. It was my less than brilliant idea to find the average man and to use him as a guinea pig. No apologies necessary, Patricia said impatiently. We all went into it with open eyes. But you were correct, Pat, the doctor said unhappily. Our common man turns out to be a Frankenstein monster, Ross growled. That's the trouble. 
it turned out he wasn't a common man, but his brother, whose petty criminal record evidently goes back to juvenile days. Even that doesn't matter, Patricia said testily. I've about come to the conclusion that it wouldn't have made any difference who we would put in Don's, I mean, Daniel Crowley's position. Man is too near the animal, yet at least, to be trusted with such power. Any man. Why, Pat, Dr. Braun said doggedly, I don't quite believe you correct. For instance, would you feel the same about me? Would I have reacted like our friend Dan? Then he chuckled in depreciation. That's my point, she said. I think you would. Ultimately, once again, look at the Caesars. They held godlike power. You're thinking of such Tiberius, Caligula, Nero, Commodus. I'm also thinking such as Claudius, the scholar who was practically forced to take the imperial mantle. And Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher who, though bound up in learning himself, allowed his family free reign in their vices, and finally turned the empire over to his son Commodius, one of the most vicious men of all time. But take Caligula and Nero, if you will. Both of them stepped into power comparatively clean with the best prospects, well approved well loved. What happened to them when given power without restraint? Ross grumbled. I admit I missed the boat, but not for the reasons Pat presents. In a sane society, our serum would be a valuable contribution, but in a dog-eat-dog -dog world where it's each man for himself, then it becomes a criminal tool, Patricia said sarcastically. And can you point out a sane society? Ross grunted. No, he said. After a moment, he added, You know, in the way, Crowley was right. We three eggheads didn't so well up against what he called his common sense. I tried to slug him with negative results. Dr. Braun, you tried sweet reason on him. Forgive me if I laugh, Pat. You tried your womanly wiles, but he saw through that too. The chickens have not all come home to roost, Patricia said mysteriously. What time is it? Ross told her. She called to the guard. See here, you. Shut up. You ain't supposed to be talking at all. Go to sleep. I want to speak to Mr. Maserani. It's very important, and you are going to be dreadfully sorry if you don't bring him. Larry can't be bothered. He's getting ready to go down to the city. I know what he's doing, but if he doesn't listen to me, he's going to be very unhappy and probably full of bullet holes. The guard came over to her door and stared at her for a long moment. He checked the lock on her door, then those of Dr. Braun and Ross Woolley. Well, see who's sorry, he grunted. He turned and left. When he returned, it was with both Larry Mazzaroni and Paul Teeter, Dan Crowley's political advisor. Mazzaroni growled, What goes on? You square looking for trouble? Patricia said testily, I suggest you let us out of here, Mr. Mazzaroni. If you do, we pledge not to press kidnapping charges against you. I believe you are aware of the penalty in this state. You trying to be funny? Definitely not, Mr. Mazzaroni, Patricia said icily. Daniel Crowley bragged to us your plans for tonight. The hoodlum muttered a contemptuous obscenity under his breath. Paul Teeter, the heavy-set southerner, said jovially, And what does this have to do with releasing you, Miss O'Gara? 
Admittedly, Dan is a bit indiscreet, but... He let the sentence fade away. Yes, Patricia said. I realize that he is a non-professional in your ranks and have little doubt that eventually you would have to surmount whatever precautions he has taken to keep you in underling positions. That's beside the point. The point is that by this time, Daniel Crowley has, um, infiltrated the institution you expected to burglarize tonight. He is inside, and you are still outside. There are four guards who are also inside, whom he is expected to eliminate before you join him. He told you everything, all right, the jerk, Larry said coldly. But so what? So Dan Crowley had us make up a new amount of serum tonight and tested it on a chimpanzee in the lab. And if you'll go and check, you'll find undoubtedly the chimp is again visible. The gunman looked at Paul Teeter blankly. The other's reactions were quicker. The serum lasts for 12 hours, Teeter barked. This batch lasts for three hours, Patricia said definitely. Your friend Crowley is suddenly going to become visible right before the eyes of these four guards, and long before he expected to eliminate them. Teeter barked, Larry, check on that monkey. Dr. Braun spoke up for the first time since the appearance of the two, he said dryly. You'll also notice that the animal is sound asleep. It seems that I added a slow-acting, but rather potent sleeping compound to the serum. The gunman startled from the room in the rush. Ross called after him. If you look closely, you'll also note the chimp's skin has turned brilliant red. There have been some basic changes in the pigment. Holy smokes, Paul Teeter protested, mopping his face with a handkerchief. Didn't he take any precautions against you people at all? Ross said, he was too busy telling us how smart a country boy he happened to be. Larry returned in moments, biting his lip in the first nervous manifestation any of them had ever seen in him. He took Teeter to one side. Patricia called to them impatiently. You have no time and no one to contact Crowley now. Don't be fools. Mend your bridges while you can. Let us out of here and we'll prefer no charges. Larry was a man of quick decision. He snapped to the blank-faced guard who had simulated only a fraction of all this. Go back to the boys and tell them to start packing to get out of here. Tell them the fix is chilled. It's all off. I'll be there in a few minutes. Okay, chief. The other had a philosophical outlook of those who were meant to take orders and knew it. He left. Larry and Teeter opened all the cell doors. Teeter said, How do we know we can trust you? Ross looked at him. Larry said, It's a deal. Give us an hour to get out of here. Then use the phone if you want to call a taxi or whatever. I ain't stupid. This thing was too complicated to begin with. When Teeter and Morzaroni were gone, the three stood alone in the corridor and looked at each other. The doctor pushed his glasses back onto his nose with a thumb and forefinger. By Caesar, he said. Ross ran a hefty paw back through his red crucra and twisted his face into a mock grimace. Well, he said, I have to revise my former statement. I use brute strength against Crowley. The doctor used sweet reason and pat her womanly wiles, and all failed. But as biochemists, each working without the knowledge of the others, we used science, and it paid off. I suppose the thing to do now is buy three jet tickets for California. Braun and Patricia looked at him blankly. Russ explained, Didn't you hear what Crowley said? His brother Donald didn't move out to San Francisco. He's a real common man. We'll have to start this experiment all over again. Dr. Braun snorted. Patricia O'Gard, hands on hips, snapped. Ross, Willie, our engagement is 
off. End of The Common Man by Guy McCord, also known as Dallas McCord Reynolds. Narrated by Ralph J. Martin. The Beast in the Void by Paul W. Fairman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Angelisi. The Beasts in the Void by Paul W. Fairman. Holloway was used to big game hunters in their expeditions to other worlds, but this trip was sheer madness, a spaceship stalking among. The examiner looked doubtful and said, but Mr. Holloway, regulation requires that I read your log before I take verbal testimony. Holloway's face was drawn and ravaged. His bloodshot eyes sat in black pits. They were trained on the examiner, but looked through him rather than at him. Holloway said, But I must talk. I've got to tell you about it. I have to keep talking. But Holloway's words tumbled out. It started in the control cabin there in deep space. When Mrs. Kelvy came in, she was the blonde one. I turned around and she said, Captain, there's a big tiger in the companionway. The desperate Holloway, fearful of being stopped or running out of words, went into minute detail. She made the statement as a pouting complaint, almost casually. Then, before I could speak, she realized what she said and her face changed. A kind of horrified double take. A tiger in the companionway of a spaceship. This last was an incredulous question she asked herself. Then she fainted. I looked outside. I thought I saw something blurred and indistinct, but it vanished quickly if it really was there at all. The companionway was empty. No tiger, no animal of any kind. The examiner, holding up a hand of protest, looked like a man directing traffic. Please, Mr. Holloway, please. We must remember regulations. Holloway's eyes closed for a moment, but he resolutely forced them open as though afraid of something. The scene was Holloway's two-room suite in the Space Portal Hotel. There were three men present. Holloway, Skipper of the Space King, John Mason, Port Resident, and Merle Kennedy, Section Examiner of the Space Authority people. Kennedy regarded Holloway with frank concern. Good heavens, the man was a complete mess, looked ready to collapse. Kennedy turned to Mason. This can be postponed, you know. Mason was regarding Holloway also. Strange, he thought. Holloway had left in a fanfare of publicity. Now it appeared his return would be even more dramatic. Maybe Holloway was that kind of a chap, the kind things just happened to. He was quite young, though he certainly didn't look it now. He had been known as a playboy ever since his father struck it big in Venusian oil. But good-looking, personable... He had worn the label well. He'd been good copy because the public regarded him with patronizing affection. To them, he'd been a nice kid having fun, not a young wastrel wasting his father's money. Naturally, he would pick a glamour girl to play the romantic feminine role, and Melody Hayden had filled the bill perfectly. Together they had enchanted the public. Princess and Prince Charming stuff. Then tragedy. Disaster in a rocketing sports car. Melody's coffin sealed before the funeral, young Holloway coming off without a scratch. Melody's death was a bombshell, and everyone asked, What will he do now? Expecting, of course, something sensational. He didn't let them down. Dramatically, he announced a completely new life. He bought a spaceship and forswore his old ways. He had quite a reputation as a big game hunter. He'd stalked the vicious Plutonian ice bears and lain in Venusian swamps waiting for the ten-ton lizards to rise out of the slime. He had knocked over the wildest of animals, a telepathic Uranian mountain wolf, and had dropped in flight a Martian radar bat, a feat duplicated by only three other marksmen of record. So what more natural occupation than guiding hunting parties in deep space? Holloway had been obviously torn by Melody's tragic death. Perhaps out among the stars he could forget. There had been some trouble, Mason recalled, in clearing Holloway's first cruise. A party of five, not to any established hunting ground, but a D.U. thing. Destination unknown. And they were always trouble. Clearance had been made, though. And now, here was Holloway back again, dramatically, of course, with one of his party dead and the other four in trance-like stupors. 
strange. And stranger still, Holloway's reason for wanting to talk immediately, with no rest, no medical attention. It will help keep me awake. I mustn't go to sleep. Can't I make you understand? I've got to stay awake. Mason pitied the man. He turned to Kennedy. I have the log here, sir. Perhaps you could go over it now. Holloway leaned forward. I'll tell you what's in the log, every word of it, if I just sit here waiting. Mason laid a hand on his knee. It's all right, old chap. I won't let you go to sleep. You and I will talk while Mr. Kennedy goes through the log. It won't take long. Mason handed the book to Kennedy. He was almost apologetic. It's a strange log, sir. It strange? Kennedy frowned. Logs had no right to be strange. There were regulations, rules stating exactly how a log should be kept. Well, sir, the lad is young. His first trip. I just meant there's perhaps a little more in the log than should appear there. We'll see, Kennedy said. There was a slight frost on his words. If disciplinary measures were in the offing, it would pay not to get too cozy with Holloway and the resident. Kennedy opened the log. The first entry was dated June 3rd, 4.10 p.m., Earth time. Kennedy frowned. Permissible, of course, but sloppy. Very sloppy. The better skippers computed from Orion immediately after blastoff. Kennedy sat back and began to read. June 3rd, 4.10 p.m. We blasted at 2.18 p.m. A good getaway. Course 58.329 by the polar angle. No blast sickness among the passengers. They are old hands. I put the automatic board into control at 3.50 p.m. I checked the tubes. Pressures balanced and equal. I don't like this cruise. I don't like Murdo. He's a domineering slob. The other four, well, Keebler is an alcoholic, Kelvy an empty-headed opportunist. I don't particularly dislike them. They're just a worthless pair who would rather fawn on Murdo and take his insults than work for a living. The two wives are both young. Martha Keebler has a child's mind in a woman's body. Jane Kelvy is an oversexed witch with an indecent exposure complex. I may have trouble with her. Already she's parading around in skimpy shorts and a bra. Evidently Murdo doesn't care for women. He pays no attention to her. Money and power are his dish. And a terrible restlessness. Melody, baby, I wish you were here. June 4th, 3 p.m. I had a talk with Murdo about this silly cruise. Tried to swing him onto something that makes a little more sense. Pluto, Venus, Ganymede. Some hunting ground I'm familiar with. No good. Even a suggestion, and he thinks you're crossing him and snorts like a bull. Still demands to go to this place where big game prowls in space. Where elephants and leopards and snakes and anything you can name flies around your ship and look in your ports. Where you do your hunting in spacesuits right out in the void. Why in hell did I fall for this idiocy? Guess I just didn't care. Maybe I thought it was a good idea because it sounded like a cruise you could get killed on without much trouble. No, I shouldn't say that. Melody wouldn't like me to say it. She was so wonderful, so level-headed. How wrong they all were about us. About her. Because she was so beautiful, I guess. I tried to tell them I'd married an angel, and they took bets among themselves on how long it would last. The answer to that would have been forever. It still is. I've lost so much and learned so much in such a very short time. The hell with Murdo and his four puppets. I'll take them out and bring them back. Then I'll go somewhere alone and I won't come back at all. Melody. Course 28.493 by the polar angle. Went through small asteroid field. Kennedy looked up sharply. He frowned. This log is unacceptable. Holloway was pacing the floor, his eyes blank and terrible. Unacceptable? Course and position should be noted within each 24-hour period. You missed June 5th entirely, you— Kennedy leafed through the pages. Why, at times you missed three and four days in sequence. Sometimes I didn't have time to write. Mason tried to hide his disgust. How did men like Kennedy get into positions they weren't fitted for? The ass. Couldn't he see this man was suffering? Mason said— why not reserve comment until you're finished, Mr. Kennedy? Kennedy's eyes widened at the sharp tone of Mason's voice. Really? When residents start dictating to examiners. Kennedy saw the stiffness in Mason's face, and something more. He went quickly back to his reading. June 6th, 1 p.m. I talked some more with Murdo about this fool cruise. 
He got wind of our destination, wherever it is, from some rich idiot in Paris. And I don't use idiot figuratively. His informant was in some kind of a private nut house, an exclusive insane asylum of idiots with lots of money, and he had lucid intervals. At one of these times, he told Murdo where he'd been and what had happened. I don't think Murdo believes all of it, but he wants to see for himself. Well, if he wants to spend his money chasing meteorites, it's his business. Keebler got drunk as a goat, strapped him in his bunk, and left him there. Murdo spent a few hours explaining guns to Mrs. Keebler. I think he enjoys the look of wonder on her face. Makes him feel very superior knowledge-wise. Her face is just built that way, and so far as she's concerned, he could be talking Greek. He thinks she's very beautiful. I wonder if he ever saw Melody's picture. Course 36.829 by the Orion Angle. All clear. June 9th, 1 a.m. Course 36.841 by the Orion Angle. Small asteroids. Jane Kelvey is bored and has started taking it out on me. When I passed her door, it was open. She was taking a sponge bath, stark naked, in the middle of the cabin. She turned around to face me and did a very bad job of acting flustered, trying to cover herself up with a small sponge. How crude can a female get? She was hoping I'd come in. If I had, it would have been to slap her face. I got away as fast as I could. June 10th, 7 p.m. Course 41.864 by the Orion Angle. Brushed a small asteroid. I've been noting the time wrong. It should be figured on a 24-hour cycle, midnight to midnight. The hell with it. Had a fight with Murdo. He wanted to take over the ship. His words were, let's get some speed out of this slop bucket. I reminded him I was captain. He reminded me he was footing the bills. I asked him how he would like to be locked in his cabin for the remainder of the cruise. He didn't say, but I guess he wouldn't have liked it because he quieted down. Keebler had been quietly drunk for the last two days. Lucky Keebler. June 13th, 18 hours. Course 26.932 by the Virgo angle. Went four degrees off course to avoid small planetoid. Jane Kelvey came to my cabin an hour ago. The rest were asleep. She wore a blue dressing gown with nothing under it. I want to set down what happened in case there's ever a kickback, although I don't think there ever will be. I was sitting in a chair and she came up behind me, and it was very unfortunate because I saw the blue dressing gown first. By sheer chance, it was almost exactly like the one Melody wore that first night. I was thinking of Melody. Melody was all around me and inside me, in my mind, in my heart, in all my aching regrets. So when that dressing gown brushed me, something electric happened inside, and I got up and took Jane Kelvey in my arms. It wasn't more than three or four seconds, but in that time the gown had been brushed aside. Then I came to my senses and pushed her away. The dressing gown stayed parted. She stepped back, confused. She said, What's the matter? Are you scared? I'm disgusted. Button your gown. Get out of here. What are you? Not one of those noble creatures, I hope, who wouldn't touch a man's wife. I said get out. I wouldn't touch you regardless. But you just did. It was a mistake. I... Look, I'm a woman. You're a man, I think. We're alone in space and life is short. Let's have fun and then... Forget about it. I slapped her across the mouth. A skipper can be jailed for life for striking a passenger, even with cause. But I slapped her, and I'm setting it down in the log. Kennedy looked up from his reading. Jane Kelvey. She is the dead one? Mason nodded. Kennedy looked at Holloway with marked severity. Are you sure you only slapped her? Mason exploded. Good God, man! Did you see the body? You're not implying he did that to her, are you? I'm not implying anything, Kennedy said within a restrained grimness that infuriated Mason. Why don't you finish the log before you start passing judgment? Kennedy leafed through the pages. I... wait a minute. This log doesn't cover the whole cruise. It breaks off in the middle of a sentence. Read what's there, man. Read what's there. Very serious. Very serious, Kennedy muttered. Not completing a log. No license should have been issued this man. Lax. Very lax. He sat back to make himself more comfortable and prepared to go on with his reading. June 30th. Three hours. Course 29.341 by the Virgo Angle. I think that's the course. 
The instruments are acting funny. In fact, a lot of things seem to be wrong. Some of the constellations aren't in the right places anymore. I began noticing these things a couple of days ago and spoke to Murdo. I suggested we turn back. I told him it was my duty as a skipper to look out for the welfare of my passengers, and that included not continuing if vital instruments showed signs of failure. He sneered at me and said, I thought you were a big game hunter, Holloway. I told him I'd hunted big game. Yes. It doesn't sound like it. You sound like a timid old woman. So you've made some miscalculations. The course is still right. It's on the flight pattern and the automatic control board, and I know it's correct because I gave it to you. But if instruments fail, nothing stays right. Okay, you're the skipper. If you've turned yellow and want to show your tail, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. He almost got his jaw broken, but I was able to hold myself. Then, suddenly, I didn't care. I didn't care whether Murdo stayed alive or got killed. As to the others, they'd come on the cruise with their eyes open. They deserved whatever they got, and I certainly didn't give a damn about myself. Guess I wasn't cut out to skipper a ship. A skipper should care. That's all he should do, just care. I'd rather dream about Melody. I don't know what the date is. The chronometer stopped, so I don't even know what time it is. But what does it matter about the time if you don't even know what day it is? We just go on and on. Murdo. I can't figure out. Windbag or not. Braggart or no. He has an iron will. I think he's scared, but he won't admit it. And some stubborn streak inside him won't let him turn tail and run. He hides his fear behind long accounts of his hunting trips. He describes the vicious animals he's killed. He bores us with accounts of his skill as a great hunter. The rest listen because they have to. I go to my cabin and remember Melody. The rest are scared, too, but they're too scared of Murdo to let him know it. That's an odd one. Scared for your life, but afraid to tell the big man because he might kill you. Would Murdo kill in a fit of rage? I don't know. Keebler stays drunk, so none of it bothers him. Keebler's wife, I think, is in love with Murdo, but it's a kind of little girl love. She never quite grew up. Kelvy glues himself to Murdo and sticks like a plaster. He seems to consider Murdo a haven, as though Murdo's bulk will make everything all right. Jane Kelvy hasn't quit making passes at me, but they're half-hearted. She bothers me. I'm uneasy when she's around. I get the feeling that any minute she might drop to her knees and beg. What do you do with a woman on her knees before you, begging? Maybe before long her husband will look good to her. Maybe she'll be able to get him away from Murdo's side for a while. I look at both of these women and realize what I lost. Melody. Jane Kelvey came to my cabin. It's hit her that things aren't right. She's scared. She asked, Why did you tell Murdo you wanted to turn back? Because I thought we'd come too far. Do you still think so? Everything will be all right. The instruments. Are they working again? I lied to her. They're working. Do you think it's really as Murdo says? That there are animals out in space? I don't know. She looked wan and forlorn, and I was sorry for her. She said, I've only been on one hunting trip in my life. Is that so? In India, a boy carried my gun for me. When the tiger came, the boy handed me the gun and told me where to point. I fired, and I didn't hit the tiger. Someone else shot it. That was too bad. No, it was all right. He was such a big, beautiful animal, so sleek and powerful. I saw her body tremble as she closed her eyes. I said, you better get some rest. She passed a hand over her eyes and then gave me an odd, wistful smile. Animals are smarter, I think. We do make awful messes out of our lives, don't we? I'm afraid we do. But is it our fault? God makes us this way. We can't help that. No, I guess we can't. Why did God make us like we are? I don't know, Jane. Let's hope he does. Isn't that sacrilege or something, doubting him? I guess it is. She reached out suddenly and touched my face. You're a nice guy. I don't blame you for slapping me. I'm sorry. You're pretty nice yourself. The smile faded. I'm not, she said miserably, and left the cabin. Poor kid. I forgot her and thought of Melody. Something's gone wrong with everything. 
Not a very scientific statement for a skipper to make, but that's how it is. The stars have disappeared. The instruments jumped around as though they had minds of their own. The dial needles spin around like crazy. And something else. Something even worse. Space has changed. I mean, there's something out there in space. First, I just felt it. A raw uneasiness. Then I trained a light through the port and I could see it. Stuff that looks like dust but isn't. It's hazy and yet it sparkles. And you have a sense of being on a ship that pushes its way through a fog so thick the friction holds you back. And there's something more about this sparkling fog. You look out at it and it seems to be looking back at you. Or maybe I'm losing my mind. Anyway, that's the way it seems. As though it's waiting for you to speak to it. Say hello or something. I guess I'm going crazy. The sparkling fog is affecting the others, too. They've all quieted down, and they slip along the bulkheads as though they were being followed. Only Murdo blusters back. He says, What the hell? We expected something different, didn't we? Well, this is sure different enough, isn't it? I'd turn back, but I don't know how. I have nothing to go by. The instruments make no sense. I am going crazy. I looked out the port just now and saw a water buffalo. It was standing right out there in space with its head down looking at the ship. I had a light turned on it, and suddenly it charged and hit the port head on. It bounced off and went staggering away and disappeared. But it left a big white scratch on the quartz outside. At least I think it did. Wait, I'll look again. Yes, a big white scratch. It's still there. So how can I be mad? Maybe it's a new kind of madness. Some of the sparkling fog has penetrated the ship. Turn out the light and you can see it in the cabin. Not as thick as out in the void, but thick enough to see. Thick enough to stand there and ask you to talk to it. Murdo is ready to turn back. He came to the control room and said, I saw it out there. You saw what? His face was pale and his hands twitched. A boa constrictor. Exactly like the one I killed four years ago on the Amazon. It came to the port and looked in at me. It must be your imagination. No, it was there. Let's turn back. Get out of this. I wish we could. You mean, I don't know where back is. We might just as well go as we are. Changing course doesn't help if you don't know your directions. Our only hope is to drive on out of this cloud. If I turned, I might go right back into it. Then one direction is as good as another. That's right. His mind wandered as he turned away. I didn't know it would be like this, he muttered. I thought it would be fun. Sport. I thought we'd put on spacesuits and go out and make a kill. I thought, the spacesuits are ready. Do you want to try it? He shuddered, his hanging jowls almost flapping. You couldn't drag me out there. The stuff is getting thicker in the ship. Jane came into my cabin. She had an odd look on her face. She said, there's a big tiger in the companionway. I got up from my bunk and suddenly she seemed to realize what she'd said. She repeated it. Then she fell down in a faint. I put her in my bunk and looked out into the companionway. The sparkling fog glittered, but there was no tiger. When she came to, she didn't seem to know where she was. Then she smiled. I must have been drinking too much, she said. Then she realized where she was. But look where it got me. Into your bunk. Do you feel all right now? I guess so. I can get up now. I do have to get up, don't I? I think you'd better. After she left, I did some thinking. The sparkling haze has been outside the ship, and I'd seen a water buffalo through the port. Murdo had seen a boa constrictor. Then the haze penetrated the hull and got inside the ship, and Jane had seen a tiger in the companionway. Were they phantoms? Was Jane's tiger a tiger of the mind? Murdo swore his snake had been real, and my buffalo left a mark on the port. I sat there trying to think, with the sparkling fog drifting around me. It seemed to be trying to tell me something. Things grow worse. Today, at mess, Murdo was holding forth about a plutonian ice bear he killed. I think he was trying to cover the gloom that has settled over us. Anyhow, he just got to the point where the bear was charging down on him when we heard the roar of thunder from outside. Maybe I'd better repeat that for the record. We heard a roaring through the walls of the spaceship in the void. Nothing goes through the walls of a spaceship in the void, but we all heard it and jumped to the port, and we all saw it. 
an ice bear, as big as ten of the largest that ever lived in the Plutonian ice flows. A huge ravening beast that rushed through the void at the ship and tried to tear the port out of its metal seat, with teeth as big as the height of a man. The women fell back, screaming. Keebler, in his usual stupor, stared blankly as though not realizing what was going on. Kelvy looked to Murdo for guidance. When none came, he crouched behind a chair. Murdo fell back slowly, step by step as though his eyes were fastened to the course and it was hard to pull away. I don't remember what I did. Murdo was saying, my God, my God, my God, as though chanting a ritual. He tore his eyes from the sight and looked at me. You wanted big game, Buster, I croaked. There it is. But it can't be real. It can't. Maybe not. But if that port gives, I'll bet it won't be from vacuum pressure. Vacuum draws. It doesn't press. Kelvy babbled inanely, but nobody paid attention to him. The beast made two more charges on the ship, then drew back screaming in rage from a snapped tooth. And all around us, there in the ship, the sparkling fog glittered and tried to talk. Two hours. The beast still rages in the void outside our ship. Jane is dead. She was horribly mangled. I put her in her bunk and laid a blanket over her, and now the blanket is soaked in her blood. No one could have helped her. It happened in the lounge. She was in there alone. I was in the control room. I don't know where the rest were. I was working uselessly with the controls when I heard a terrible scream mixed with a hideous snarl. I ran into the companionway and stared toward the lounge. Murdo appeared from somewhere, and we were shouldering each other on the companion ladder. Murdo fell heavily. Then we were both looking into the lounge. It was too late to help Jane. We saw her there, still and bloody. A shiny black leopard was crouching gory-mouthed over her body with its paws on her breast. Its eyes were black magnets, holding mine. I said, get a gun, trying to speak without moving my lips. But, damn you, get a gun! Murdo staggered away. It seemed a year before he came back with a Hensy Special 442. The leopard was tight, ready to spring. I didn't dare move a muscle. I said, over my shoulder, get him. Don't miss. The last was a little silly. How could a man miss with a Hensy at ten feet? Murdo fired and tore the leopard's head off. It was down already, so it didn't move. It sat there, headless, its tail twitching slightly. Then it was still. I didn't hesitate this time. I said, come on, we've got to get this out of here before the others show. We put the dead leopard into the forward storage bunker. Then I picked up poor Jane and carried her to her room. Murdo helped me up the ladder. The others were in the companionway, and they pressed back in horror to let me pass. For the first time since we started, Keebler was sober. Ashen, shaky, stone sober. He broke, screamed, and ran for his bottle, the world of reality too terrible for him to bear. There was no huddle, no conference, no meeting of the minds. Everyone else went to the galley and sat staring into space, stared at the dancing little sparkles in the air. I went to my cabin. When confronted by a reality, no matter how crazy and improbable, a man must not turn from it. He cannot carry the mangled body of a woman in his arms and then say to himself, this isn't real because it doesn't make sense. It does make sense. Some kind of sense, or it would not exist. A man must say, rather, I don't understand this, and maybe I never will, but God gave me a brain and I must try. I can't sit back and deny reality. I must try to understand it. I cleared my mind and tried to rationalize the things around us. Out in the darkness, there was a terrible roaring and yammering, the thuds and bellows of violence. I went to the port. There, in the light of the ship, the ice bear and the water buffalo were fighting. It was a terrible and magnificent thing, but to me it was anticlimax, a sideshow of almost casual interest. The ice bear outsized the water buff by too much to be in any danger, but the buff fought savagely, and the ice bear had no easy time. The buff opened a long, deep gash in the bear's throat when the bear missed a lunge, and the Blutonian mammal fell back with a roar of pain and fury. They came together again, and this time the bear got the buff in a hug, and it was all over. The buff's spine broke, and the bear bent the body double, then tore it to pieces. I wondered if the others were watching. I went back to pacing, back to my thinking. I have been thinking, 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 racking my brain, and of one thing I'm sure, 
Some invisible intelligence is trying to help me, trying to give me knowledge. Sparkling fog? A great and wonderful thing has happened, and I know. Do you realize what that means? To know in a situation like this, and to be wonderfully and wildly happy? The knowledge was not all given to me. There was a thought process of my own developing. The thing given me was the basic knowledge upon which to build, and proof of this knowledge, absolute and indisputable proof. The sparkling fog is mine stuff. I will not defend that statement. I will not rationalize it, but I will seek explanations, consider possibilities. Known. This sparkling fog through which we drift is intelligent matter, the stuff of thoughts, the basic material from which consciousness springs. It is consciousness itself. Supposed. It is probably electronuclear in composition, and appears to be completely innocent. By that I mean it has no intention to harm, perhaps because it does not understand the difference between good and evil, harm and help, pain and pleasure. It has only one urge, the basic urge of all creation, to evolve, to develop. As the tree has but one basic urge, to grow and greaten, the flower has but one desire, to bloom, to improve, to assert itself through evolution and become better. Perhaps, and who can successfully deny it, this great space cloud could be a storage place of the creator himself, a storage place for mind stuff. When an infant or an animal or a plant is touched with the magic thing called life, where does the magic come from? Is it created at the very moment, or does it come somehow from a source pile? Is this cloud a source pile of life itself? No one can say, but I think I've hit a limitation on this mind stuff. I'm going to try an experiment and pray to God it works. I'm going to find Murdo and knock him unconscious. I have solved the mind stuff. What just happened is the last bit of proof I need. I went to the galley. Murdo was wandering away. I found him in the lounge. I stepped casually in front of him, set myself, and drove a straight right to his jaw. He went down like a log. I closed my eyes and counted to twenty, praying to God to make me right in my belief, in the crazy theory I evolved. I opened my eyes and turned to the storage locker. I looked inside. The dead leopard was gone. I went to the port and looked out. The huge ice bear had been ravening insanely among the shreds of the water buffalo's body. As I watched, both bear and buff began fading. Before my eyes, they disappeared, evolved back into the stuff of the sparkling fog. I had proved my theory. Now all the parts dropped into place. The mind stuff has only the ability and the urge to evolve, nothing else, no imagination. It can evolve only if given something to reproduce. This it can get only from a human mind. It is able to see an image pictured in the human memory and reproduce it in a state of absolute reality. Witness. Jane saw a tiger in the companion way. Clear in her memory was the image of the tiger she had shot at in India. The mind stuff saw it and reproduced it in reality. The water buffalo came from my own mind. I killed one exactly like it a year ago. The ice bear was out of Murdo's memory, as was the black leopard and the snake. Witness. The three animals created inside the ship did not appear until the mind stuff from outside penetrated the hull and entered the ship. They were of normal size, but the animals created outside the ship were far out of proportion, the ice bear especially. Why? Because, I believe, the mind stuff is denser in the void. There it has more strength. My defense against the mind stuff was formulated almost accidentally. I remembered the sequence of Jane's tiger. She saw it, entered my cabin, realized its significance, and fainted. I looked into the companionway and saw the tiger fading. So I knocked out Murdo for final proof and got it. As soon as he lapsed into unconsciousness, the recreations from his mind turned back into sparkling fog. Obviously, and a heaven-sent phenomenon it is, the mind stuff immediately loses its subject image when the mind from which it came goes unconscious. The mind stuff has no memory of its own and cannot hold its recreated image in the evolved form under conditions of unconsciousness. The answer now becomes simple. I drugged Murdo before he regained consciousness. I drugged the other three by means of whiskey and food. They have been unconscious for twelve hours. Nothing has happened. I shall keep them that way. The mind stuff is trying to complain to me, almost petulantly, as a child. I sensed it sharply. 
It does not understand the wrong it has done and feels it has been deprived of its right. I have no time for the mind stuff. I guard myself against it and ignore it. There are other things on my mind. Shall I go back if we ever escape from the sparkling fog? I don't know. I don't want to go back. I want to go on and on forever just like this. But the others cannot go on like this. It would be murder. I don't know. I don't know. I must keep awake. I use drugs. I must not sleep. Not sleep. We have cleared the fog. The instruments are working again. Again the stars glow. What shall I do? Melody. Kennedy looked up from his reading. As I said, he spoke severely. You break off at an abrupt point. You did not complete the log. Holloway's red eyes were glazed. I had other things to do. I was tired of keeping a log. Mason sought to draw Kennedy off his query. There is an odd point, he said, looking at Holloway. Only animals were created. Do you think the mind stuff was capable only of recreating animals? Holloway spoke in an exhausted monotone. It took the clearest image from the strongest minds. Murdo thought mainly of hunting. He pondered on his more spectacular kills. Thus the mind stuff used his images. I see. Holloway seemed to sag, to shrink, he said. The mind stuff could recreate anything. It brought Melody back to me. Kennedy sprang to his feet. There was no reference in this log to... Mason turned on him. Shut up, you fool. He laid a gentle hand on Holloway's shoulder. Tell us about it, old chap. Holloway turned his burning eyes on the closed door to the next room. She's in there. I wanted to get rid of you. I was afraid you would take her away from me. But it's no use. I can't hold my consciousness much longer. Then she will vanish. Holloway tried weakly to rise from his chair. He called, Melody! Melody, baby! The door opened. A beautiful girl in a blue dressing gown came gracefully into the room. She walked straight to Holloway and took his tortured head in her soft hands. Her eyes pleaded with the men. He suffers so. He will not sleep. I can't make him sleep. I... I don't understand. Holloway's head dropped suddenly onto his chest. He slumped down in his chair, and as he did so, a change took place. The two men stood rooted, staring. As Melody began to fade, slowly, slowly, into a transparent image, into a mist, into a handful of sparkling fog. Then she was gone. Mason knelt by the bone-thin body in the chair. He made a quick examination and got wearily to his feet. Holloway's dead, he murmured. Drugs of that nature would kill an elephant. I can't understand how he lives so long. Kennedy blinked and seemed to come out of a trance. He frowned. And the investigation hardly started. Mason shook his head and looked pityingly at Kennedy. It was just no use with a man like him, Mason said. There's one point entirely apparent without an investigation. What's that? Mason's voice was sharp and cold. That our little playboy, for all his reputation of frivolity, was a better man than you and I put together. Does that register, Mr. Kennedy? Kennedy flared. Now see here, I'm only doing my job. Oh, shut up, Mason said, and strode out of the room. End of The Beasts in the Void by Paul W. Fairman Recording by Sarah Angelisi The Wind People by Marion Zimmer Bradley this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins Wind People by Marion Zimmer Bradley It had been a long layover for the Starholm's crew, hunting heavy elements for fuel. Eight months on an idyllic green paradise of a planet. A soft, windy, whispering world inhabited only by trees and winds. But in the end, it presented its own unique problem. Specifically, it presented Captain Merrihew with the problem of Robin, male, father unknown, who had been born the day before, and a month prematurely, to Dr. Helen Murray. Merrihew found her lying abed in the laboratory shelter, pale and calm, with the child beside her. 
The little shelter, constructed roughly of green planks, looked out on the clearing, which the star home had used as a base of operation during the layover. A beautiful place at the bottom of a wide valley in the curve of a broad, deep-flowing river. The crew, tired of being shipbound, had built half a dozen such huts and shacks in these eight months. Murrayhugh glared down at Helen. He snorted, This is a fine situation. You of all people in the whole damn crew. The ship's doctor. It's, it's... Inarticulate with rage, he fell back on a ridiculously inadequate phrase. It's criminal carelessness. I know. Helen Murray, too young and far too lovely for a ship's officer on a ten-year cruise, still looked weak and white. Her voice was a gentle shadow of its crisp self. I'm afraid four years in space made me careless. Mary Hugh brooded, looking down at her. Something about the ship's gravity conditions, while not affecting potency, made conception impossible. No child had ever been conceived in space, and none ever would. On planet layovers, the effects wore off very slowly. Only after three months of ground had Dr. Murray started routine administration of antiseptin to the 22 women of the crew, herself included. At that time, she had still been unaware that she herself was already carrying a child. Outside, the leafy forest whispered and rustled, and Mary Hugh knew Helen had forgotten his existence again. The day-old child was tucked up in one of her rolled coveralls at her side. To Mary Hugh, he looked like a skinned monkey. But Helen's eyes smoldered as her hands moved gently over the tiny round head. He stood and listened to the winds and said, at random, These shacks will fall to pieces in another month. It doesn't matter. We'll have taken off by then. Dr. Chowlin came into the shack, an angular woman of thirty-five. She said, Company, Helen? Well, it's about time. Here, let me take Robin, Helen said in a weak protest. You're spoiling me, Lynn. It will do you good, Chow Lin returned. Mary Hugh, in a sudden surge of fury and frustration, exploded. Damn it, Lin! You're making it all worse! He'll die when we go into overdrive. You know as well as I do. Helen sat up, clutching Robin protectively. Are you proposing to drown him like a kitten? Helen, I am not proposing anything. I am stating a fact. But it's not a fact. He won't die in overdrive because he won't be aboard when we go into overdrive. Marihu looked at Lynn helplessly, but his face softened. Shall we put him to sleep and bury him here? The woman's face turned white. No! She cried in a passionate protest, and Lynn bent to disengage her frantic grip. Helen, you'll hurt him. Put him down there. Marihu looked down at her, troubled, and said, We can't just abandon him. He'll die slowly, Helen. Who says I'm going to abandon him? Marihu asked slowly. Are you planning to desert? He added after a minute, There's a chance he'll survive. After all, his very birth was against every medical precedent. Maybe... Captain! Helen sounded desperate. Even drugged, no child under ten has ever endured the shift into hyperspace drive. A newborn would die in seconds. She clasped Robin to her again and said, It's the only way. You have Lynn for a doctor. Reynolds can handle my collateral duties. This planet is uninhabited. The climate is mild. We couldn't possibly starve. Her face, so gentle, was suddenly like a rock. Enter my death in the logs if you want to. Mary Hugh looked from Helen to Lynn and said, Helen, you're insane. She said, Even if I am sane now, I wouldn't be long if I had to abandon Robin. The wild note had died out of her voice, and she spoke rationally but inflexibly. Captain Mary Hugh, to get me aboard the star home, you will have to have me drugged or taken by force. I promise you I won't go any other way. And if you do that, and if Robin is left behind, or dies in overdrive, just so you will have my services as a doctor, then I solemnly swear that I will kill myself at the first opportunity. My God, said Mary Hugh, you're insane. Helen gave a long, tiny shrug. Do you want a mad woman aboard? Chow Lin said quietly. Captain... I don't see any other way. We would have had to arrange it that way if Helen had actually died in childbirth. Of two unsatisfactory solutions, we must choose the least harmful. And Mary Hugh knew that he had no real choice. I still think you're both crazy, he blustered. But it was surrender, and Helen knew it. Ten days after Star Home took off, young Colin Reynolds, technician, committed suicide by the messy procedure 
of slicing his jugular artery, which in zero gravity distributed several quarts of blood in big round goblets all over his cabin. He left an incoherent note. Merrihew put the note in a disposal, and Chow Lin put the blood in the ship's blood bank for surgery. They hushed it up as an accident, but Merrihew had the unpleasant feeling that the layover on the green windy planet was going to become a legend spread in whispers by the crew, and it did. But that's another story. Robin was two years old when he first heard the voices in the wind. He pulled at his mother's arm and crooned softly in imitation. What is it, lovely? Pretty, he croned again to the distant murmuring sound. Helen smiled vaguely and patted the round cheek. Robin, his infant imagination suddenly distracted, said, Hungry! Robin, hungry! Berries! Berries after you eat, Helen promised absently and picked him up. Robin tugged at her arm. Mommy pretty, too, she laughed, a rosy and smiling young Diana. She was happy on the solitary planet. They lived quite comfortably in one of the large shacks, and only a little frown line between her eyes bore witness to the terror which had closed down on her in the first months, when every new day had been some new struggle, against weakness, against unfamiliar sounds, against loneliness and dread, nights when she lay wakeful, sweating with terror, while the winds rose and fell again, and her imagination gave them voice, bleak days, when she wandered dazedly around the shack or stared moodily at Robin. There had been moments, only fleeting and penanced, with hours of shame and regret, when she thought that even the horror of losing Robin in those first days would have been less than the horror of spending the rest of her life alone here, when she had wondered why Mary, who had not realized she was unbalanced, and forced her to go with him. By now, Robin would have only been a moment's painful memory, still not strong, knowing she had to be strong for Robin, or he would die assuredly if she had abandoned him. She spent the first months in a somnolistic dream. Sometimes she had walked for days at a time in that dream. She would wake to find food that she could not remember gathering. Somehow, pervasive, the dream voices had taken over. The whispering winds had been full of voices and even hands. She had fallen ill and lain for days, sick and delirious, and had heard a voice, which had hardly seemed to be her own, saying that if she died, the wind voices would care for Robin. And then the shock and irrationality of that startled her out of delirium, agonized and trembling, and she pulled herself upright and cried out, No! And the shimmer of eyes and voices had faded again in vague echoes, until there was only the stir of sunlight on the leaves, and Robin, chubby and naked, kicking in the sunlight, cooing with his hands, outstretched to the rustle of leaves and shadows. She had known then that she would get well. She had never heard the wind voices again, and her crisp, scientific mind rejected the fanciful theory that if she only believed in the wind voices, she would see their forms and hear their words clearly. And she rejected them so thoroughly that when she heard them speak, she shut them away from her mind, and after time, heard them no longer except in her restless dreams. By now she had accepted the isolation and the beauty of their world, and begun to make a happy life for Robin. For lack of other occupation last summer, Though the winter was mild and there was no lack of fruits and roots even then, Helen had patiently snared male and female of small animals like rabbits, and now she had a pin of them. They provided a change of diet, and after a few smelly, unsuccessful experiments, she devised a way to supple their fur pelts. She made no effort at gardening, though when Robin was older, she might try that. For the moment, it was enough that they were healthy, safe, and protected. Robin was listening again. Helen bent her ear, sharpened by the silence, but heard only the rustle of wind and leaves, saw only falling brightness along a silvered tree trunk. Wind, when there were no branches stirring? Ridiculous, she said sharply, then snatched up the baby boy and squeezed him before hoisting him astride her hip. Mommy doesn't mean you, Robin. Let's look for berries. But soon she realized that his head was tipping back and that he was listening again to some sound she could not hear. On what she said was Robin's fifth birthday, Helen made a special bed for him in another room of the building. He missed the warmth of Helen's body and the comforting sound of her breathing, for Robin since birth had been a wakeful child. Yet on the first night alone, Robin felt curiously freed. He did something he had never dared do before, for fear of waking Helen. He slipped from his bed 
and stood in the doorway, looking into the forest. The forest was closer to the doorway now. Robin could fuzzily remember when the clearing had been wider. Now slowly, beyond the garden patch, which Helen kept cleared, the underbrush and saplings were growing back, and even what Robin called the burn place was covered with new sparse grass. Robin was accustomed to being alone during the day, even in his first year. Helen had had to leave him alone, securely fastened in the house or inside a little tight fenced yard, but he was not used to being alone at night. Far off in the forest, he could hear the whispers of other people. Helen said there were no other people, but Robin knew better, because he could hear their voices on the wind, like fragments of the songs Helen sang at bedtime, and sometimes he could almost see them in the shadowy spots. Once, when Helen had been sick a long time ago, and Robin had run helplessly from the fence yard to the inside room and back again, hungry and dirty and furious, because Helen only slept on the bed with her eyes closed, rousing up now and then to whimper like he did when he fell down and skinned his knees. The winds and voices had come up into the very house. Robin had hazy memories of soothing voices, of hands that touched him more softly than Helen's hands, but he could not quite remember. Now that he could hear them so clearly, he would go and find the other people, and then if Helen was sick again, there would be someone else to play with him and look after him. He thought gleefully, "'Won't Helen be surprised?' and darted off across the clearing. Helen woke, roused not by a sound, but by a silence. She no longer heard Robin's soft breaths from the alcove, and after a moment she realized something else. The winds were silent. Perhaps, she thought, a storm was coming. Some change in the air pressure could cause this stillness. But Robin? She tiptoed to the alcove as she had suspected. His bed was empty. Where could he be? In the clearing? Was a storm coming? She slid her feet into handmade sandals and ran outside, her quivering call ringing out through the silent forest. Robin! Oh, Robin! Silence. And far away, a little ominous whisper. For the first time since the first frightening year of loneliness, she felt lost, deserted in an alien world. She ran across the clearing, looking around wildly, trying to decide which way he could have wandered. Into the forest? What if he had strayed toward the river bank? There was a place where the bank crumpled away, down toward the rapids. Her throat closed convulsively, and her call was almost a shriek. Oh, Robin! Robin, darling, Robin! She ran through the paths worn by their feet, hearing snatches of rustle, winds and leaves suddenly vocal in the cold moonlight around her. It was the first time since the spaceship had left that Helen had ventured out into the night of their world. She called again, her voice cracking in panic. Robin! A sudden stray gleam revealed a glint of white, and a child stood in the middle of the path. Helen gasped with relief and ran to snatch up her son, then fell back in dismay. It was not Robin who stood there. The child was naked, about a head shorter than Robin, and female. There was something curious about the bare and gleaming flesh, as if she could see the child only in the full flush of the moonlight. A round, almost expressionless face was surrounded by a mass of colorless streaming hair, the exact color of the moonlight. Helen's audible gasp startled her to a stop. She shut her eyes convulsively, and when she opened them, the path was black and empty, and Robin was running down the track toward her. Helen caught him up, and with a strangled cry and ran, clasping him to her breast, back down the path to their shack. Inside, she barred the door and laid Robin down on her own bed and threw herself down shivering, too shaken to speak, too shaken to scold him, curiously afraid to question. I had a hallucination, she told herself. A hallucination, another dream, a dream. A dream like other dream. She dignified it to herself as the dream because it was not like any other dream she had ever had. She had dreamed it first before Robin's birth, and had been ashamed to speak of it to Cha Lin, fearing the common-sense skepticism of the older woman. On their tenth night on the green planet, the star home was a dim recollection now, when Mary Hugh's scientists had been convinced that the little world was safe, without wild beasts or disease or savage natives. The crew had requested permission to camp in the valley clearing, beside the river. Permission granted, 
They had gone apart, in couples almost as usual, and even those who had no enduring liaison at the moment had found a partner for the night. It must have been that night. Colin Reynolds was two years younger than Helen, and their attachment, enduring over a few months of ship time, was based less on mutual passion than a sort of boyish need in him, a sort of impersonal feminine solicitude in Helen. All of her affairs had been like that. Companionable, comfortable, but never passionate. Curious enough, Helen was a woman capable of passion, of great depths of devotion, but no man had ever roused it, and now no man ever would. Only Robin's birth had touched her deeply pent-up emotions. But that night, when Colin Reynolds was sleeping, Helen stayed restlessly awake, hearing the unquiet stirring of wind on the leaves. After a time, she wandered down to the water's edge, staying a cautious distance from the shore, for the cliff crumbled dangerously, and stretched herself out to listen to the wind voices. And after a time, she fell asleep, and had the dream, which was to return to her again and again. Helen thought of herself as a scientist, without room for fantasies, and that is why she called it, fiercely, a dream. A dream born of some undiagnosed conflict in her. Even to herself, Helen would not recall it in full. There had been a man, and to her it seemed that he was part of the green and windy world, and he had found her sleeping by the river. Even in her drowsy state, Helen had suspected that perhaps one of the other crew members, like herself, sleepless and drawn to the shining water, had happened upon her there. Such things were not impossible, manners and mores being what they were among starship crews. But to her, half-dreaming, there had been some strangeness about him, which prevented her from seeing him too clearly even in the brilliant green moonlight. No dream, and no man, ever seemed so living to her. And it was this fierce rationalization of the dream which kept her silent. Much later, when she discovered, to her horror and secret despair, that she was with child, she had felt that she would lose the haze and secret delight of the dream if she openly acknowledged that Colin had fathered her child. But at first, in the cool green morning that followed, she had not been at all sure it was a dream. Seeing only sunlight and leaves, she held back from speaking, not wanting ridicule. Could she have asked each man on the star home, Was it you who came to me last night? Because if it was not, there are other men on this world men who cannot be clearly seen even by moonlight. Severely, she reminded herself, Murray Hughes' men had pronounced the world uninhabited, and uninhabited it must be. Five years later, hugging her sleeping son close, Helen remembered the dream, examined the content of her fantasy, and once again shivered, repeated, I had a dream. It was only a dream. A dream, because I was alone. When Robin was fourteen years old, Helen told him the story of his birth and of the ship. He was a tall, silent boy, strong and hearty, but not talkative. He had heard the story almost in silence, and looked at Helen for a long time in silence. He finally said in a whisper, You could have died. You gave up a lot for me, Helen, didn't you? He knelt and took her face in his hands. She smiled and drew a little away from him. Why are you looking at me like that, Robin? The boy could not put instant words to his thoughts. Emotions were not in his vocabulary. Helen had taught him everything she knew, but she had always concealed her feelings from her son. He asked at last, Why didn't my father stay with you? I don't suppose it entered his head, Helen said. He was needed on the ship. Losing me was bad enough. Robin said passionately, I'd have stayed. The woman found herself laughing. Well, you did stay, Robin, he asked. Am I like my father? Helen looked gravely at her son trying to see the half-forgotten features of young Reynolds in the boy's face. No, Robin did not look like Colin Reynolds, nor like Helen herself. She picked up his hand in hers. Despite his robust health, Robin never tanned. His skin was pearly pale, so that in the green sunlight it blended into the forest almost invisibly. His hand lay in Helen's palm like a shadow. She said at last, No, nothing like him, but under this sun that's to be expected. Robin said confidently, I am like the other people. The ones on the ship, they... No, Robin interrupted. You always said when I was older you'd tell me about the other people. I mean the other people here. The ones in the woods. The ones you can't see. 
Helen stared at the boy in blank disbelief. What do you mean? There are no other people, just us. Then she recalled that every imaginative child invents playmates. Alone, she thought. Robin's always alone, no other children. No wonder he's a little strange, she said quietly. You dreamed it, Robin. The boy only stared at her in bleak, blank alienation. You mean, he said, you can't hear them either? He got up and walked out of the hut. Helen called, but he didn't turn back. She ran after him, catching at his arm, stopping him almost by force. She whispered, Robin, Robin, tell me what you mean. There isn't anyone here. Once or twice, I had thought I had seen something by moonlight. Only it was a dream. Please, Robin, please. If it's only a dream, why are you frightened? Robin asked, through a curious constriction of his throat. If they've never hurt you. No, they had never hurt her. Even if in her long-ago dream, one of them had come to her, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And a scrap of memory from a vanished life on another world sang in Helen's thoughts. She looked up at the pale and patient face of her son and swallowed hard. Her voice was husky when she spoke. Did I ever tell you about rationalization? When you want something to be true so much that you can make it sound right to yourself? Couldn't that also happen to something you wanted not to be true? Robin retorted with a mutinous curl of his mouth. Helen would not let go his arm. She begged. Robin, no, you'll only waste your life and break your heart looking for something that doesn't exist. The boy looked down at her shaken face. And suddenly a new emotion welled up in him and he dropped to his knees beside her and buried his face against her breast. He whispered, Helen, I'll never leave you. I'll never do anything you don't want me to do. I don't want anyone but you. And for the first time in many years, Helen broke into a wild and uncontrollable crying without knowing why she wept. Robin did not speak again of his quest in the forest. For many months he was quiet and subdued, staying near the clearing, hovering near Helen for days at a time, then disappearing into the forest at dusk. He heard the winds numbly, deaf to their promise and their call. Helen, too, was quiet and withdrawn. Feeling Robin's alienation through his submissive mood, she found herself speaking to him sharply for being always underfoot. Yet, on the rare days when he vanished into the forest and did not return until after sunset, she felt a restless unease that set her wandering the paths herself, not following him, but simply uneasy unless she knew he was within call. Once in the shadows, just before sunset, she thought she saw a man moving through the trees, and for an instant he turned toward her. She saw that he was naked. She had seen him only for a second or two, and after he slipped between the shadows again, common sense told her it was Robin. She was vaguely shocked and annoyed. She firmly intended to speak to him, perhaps to scold him for running about naked and slipping away like that. Then... In some sort of remote embarrassment, she forbore to mention it, but after that she kept out of the forest. Robin had been vaguely aware of her surveillance, and knew when it ceased. But he did not give up his own pointless rambles, although even to himself he no longer spoke of searching, or of any dreamlike inhabitants of the woods. At times it still seemed that some shadow concealed a half-seen form, and the distant murmur grew into a voice that mocked him, a white arm, the shadow of a face, until he lifted his head and stared straight at it. One evening, toward twilight, he saw a sudden shimmer in the trees, and he stood, fixedly, as the stray glint resolved itself first into a white face with shadowy eyes, and then a translucent flicker of bare arms, and then into the form of a woman, arrested for an instant with her hands on the bole of a tree, in the shadowy spot, filled only with the last ray of cloudy sunset. She was very clear, not cloudy or unreal, but so distinct that he could see even a small smudge of bramble or scratch on her shoulder, and a fallen leaf tangled in her colorless hair. Robin, paralyzed, watched her pause and turn and smile, and then she melted into the shadows. He stood with his heart pounding for a second after she had gone, then whirled, bursting with excitement of his discovery, and ran down the path toward home. Suddenly he stopped short, the world tilting and reeling, and fell on his face in a bed of dry leaves. He was still ignorant of the nature of the emotion in him, and only felt intolerable misery in the conviction that he must never, never speak to Helen of what he had seen or felt. He lay there, 
his burning face pressed into the leaves, unaware of the rising wind, the flurry of blown leaves, the growing darkness and the distant thunder. At last, an icy spatter of rain aroused him, and cold, numbed, he made his way slowly homeward. Over his head the boughs creaked woodenly, and Robin, under the driving whips of the rain, felt their clatter, only echoed his own voiceless agony. He was drenched by the time he pushed the door of the shack open and stumbled blindly toward the fire, only hoping that Helen would be sleeping. But she stared up from beside the hearth they had built together last summer. Robin? Deathly weary, the boy snapped. Who else would it be? Helen didn't answer. She came to him, a small, swift-moving figure in the firelight, and drew him into the warmth. She said almost humbly, I was afraid. Storm. Robin, you're all wet. Come to the fire and dry out. Robin yielded, his twitching nerves partly soothed by her voice. How tiny Helen is, he thought, and I can remember that she used to carry me around on one arm. Now she hardly comes to my shoulder. She brought in food, and he ate wolfishly. Listening to the steady pouring rain, uncomfortable under Helen's watchful eyes. Before his own eyes there was the clear memory of the woman in the wood, and so vivid was Robin's imagination, heightened by loneliness and undiluted by any random impressions, that it seemed to him Helen must see her too, and when she came to stand beside him, the picture grew so keen in his thoughts that he actually pulled himself free of her. The next day dawned, gray and still, beaten with long needles of rain. They stayed indoors by the smoldering fire. Robin, half sick and feverish from his drenching, sprawled by the hearth, too indolent to move, watching Helen's coming and going about the room, not realizing why the sight of her slight, quick form against the gray light filled him with such pain and melancholy. The storm lasted four days. Helen exhausted her household tasks and sat restlessly thumbing through the few books she knew by heart. They allowed her to remove all of her personal possessions, all the things she had chosen on a forgotten and faraway earth for a ten-year cruise. For the first time in years, Helen was thinking again of the life, the civilization she had thrown away for Robin, who had been a pink scrap in the circle of her arm, and now lay sullen on the hearth, not speaking, aimlessly whittling a stick with the knife, found discarded in a heap of rubbish from the star home, which was his dearest possession. Helen felt slow horror closing in on her. What world, what heritage did I give him, in my madness? This world has driven us both insane. Robin and I are both a little mad by Earth's standards. And when I die, and I will die first, what then? At that moment, Helen would have given her life to believe in his old dream of strange people in the wood. She flung her book restlessly away, and Robin, as if waiting for that signal, sat upright and said almost eagerly, Helen, grateful that he had broken the silence of days, she gave him an encouraging smile. I've been reading your books, he began, diffidently, and I read about the sun you came from. It's different from this one. Suppose, suppose if there were actually a kind of people here, and something in this light, or in your eyes, made them invisible to you. Helen said, Have you been seeing them again? He flinched at her ironical tone. And she asked, somewhat more gently, It's a theory, Robin, but it wouldn't explain, then, why you see them. Maybe I'm more used to this light, he said, gropingly. In any way, you said you thought you'd seen them and thought it was only a dream. Halfway between exasperation and a deep pity, Helen found herself arguing. If these other people of yours really exist, why haven't they made themselves known in sixteen years? The eagerness with which he answered was almost frightening. I think they only come out at night. They're what your book calls a primitive civilization. He spoke the words he had read, but never heard, with an odd hesitation. They're not really a civilization at all, I think. They're like part of the woods. A forest people, Helen mused, impressed in spite of herself. And nocturnal. It's always moonlight or dusky when you see them. Then you do believe me. Oh, Helen, Robin cried, and suddenly found himself pouring out the story of what he had seen in incoherent words, concluding, And by daylight I can hear them, but I can't see them. Helen, Helen, you have to believe it now. You'll have to let me try and find them and learn to talk to them. Helen listened with a sinking heart. She knew they should not discuss it now. When five days of enforced housebound proximity had set their nerves and tempers on edge, but some unknown tension, 
hurled her sharp words at Robin. You saw a woman, and I a man. These things are only dreams. Do I have to explain more to you? Robin flung his knife sullenly aside. You're so blind, so stubborn. I think you're feverish again. Helen rose to go. He said wrathfully, You treat me like a child, because you act like one, with your fairy tales of women in the wind. Suddenly Robin's agony overflowed, and he caught at her, holding her around the knees, clinging to her as he had not done since he was a small child, his words stumbling and running over one another. Helen! Helen, darling, don't be angry with me. He begged and caught her in a blind embrace that pulled her off her feet. She had never guessed how strong he was, but he seemed very like a little boy, and she hugged him quickly as he began to cover her face with childish kisses. Don't cry, Robin. My baby, it's all right, she murmured, kneeling close to him. Gradually the wildness of his passionate crying abated. She touched his forehead with her cheek to see if he were heated with fever, and he reached up and held her there. Helen let him lie against her shoulder feeling that perhaps, after the violence of his outburst, he would fall asleep. And she was half asleep herself, when a sudden shock of realization darted through her. Quickly, she tried to free herself from Robin's entangling arms. Robin, let me go! He clung to her, not understanding. Don't let go of me, Helen. Darling, stay here beside me. He begged and pressed a kiss to her throat. Helen, her blood icing over, realized that unless she freed herself very quickly now, She would be fighting against a strong, aroused young man, not clearly aware of what he was doing. She took refuge in the sharp, maternal note of ten years ago, almost vanished in the closer, more equal companionship of the time between. No! Robin, stop it at once! Do you hear? Automatically he let her go, and she rolled quickly away out of his reach and got to her feet. Robin, too intelligent to be unaware of her anger and too naive to know its cause, suddenly dropped his head and wept wholly unstrung. Why are you angry? He blurted out. I was only loving you. And at the phrase of this five-year-old child, Helen felt her throat would burst with ache. She managed to choke out. I'm not angry, Robin. We'll talk about this later, I promise. And then, her own control vanishing, turned and fled precipitatively into the pouring rain. She plunged through the familiar woods for a long time, in a daze of unthinking misery. She did not even fully realize that she was sobbing and muttering aloud. No, 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 no. She must have wandered for several hours. The rain had stopped, and the darkness was lifting before she began to grow calmer and think more clearly. She had been blind, not to foresee this day when Robin was a child. Only if her child had been a daughter could have this been avoided. Or she was shocked at the historical sound of her own laughter. If Colin had stayed, and they'd raised a family, like Adam and Eve. But what now? Robin was sixteen. She was not yet forty. Helen caught at vanishing memories of society taboos so deeply rooted that for Helen they were instinctual and impregnable. Yet for Robin nothing existed except this little patch of forest and Helen herself, the only person in his world, more specifically at the moment, the only woman in his world. So much, she thought bitterly, for instinct. But have I the right to begin this all over again? Worse. Have I the right to deny its existence, and when I die, leave Robin alone? She had stumbled and paused for breath, realizing that she had wandered in circles, and that she was at a familiar point on the river bank, which she had avoided for sixteen years. On the heels of this realization, she became aware, for only the second time in memory, the winds were wholly stilled. Her eyes swollen with crying, ached as she tried to pierce the gloom of the mist, lilac-tinted, with approaching sunrise which hung around the water. Through the dispersing mist she made out dimly the form of a man. He was tall, and his pale skin shone with misty white colors. Helen sat frozen, her mouth open, and for the space of several seconds he looked down at her without moving. His eyes, dark splashes in the pale face, had an air of infinite sadness and compassion, and she thought his lips moved in speech, but she heard only the thin, familiar rustle of wind. Behind him mere flickers, she seemed to make out the ghosts of other faces, tips of fingers, of invisible hands, eyes, the outline of a woman's breast, the curve of a child's foot. For a minute, in Helen's weary, numbed state, all of her defenses went down and she thought, Then I'm not mad, and it wasn't a dream, and Robin isn't Reynolds' son at all? His father was this, one of thee, and they've been watching me and Robin. Robin has seen them. He doesn't know he's one of them. But they know. They know. 
and I've kept Robin from him all these sixteen years. The man took two steps toward her, the translucent body shifting to a dozen colors before her blurred eyes. His face was curiously familiar. Familiar. And in a sudden spasm of terror, Helen thought, I'm going mad. It's Robin. It's Robin. His hand was actually outstretched to touch her, when her scream cut icy lashes through the forest, stirring wild echoes in the wind voices. And she whirled and ran blindly toward the treacherous, crumbling bank. Behind her came steps, a voice, a cry. Robin, the strange triad man, she could not guess. The horrors of incest, the son of the father, the lover suddenly melting into one, overwhelmed her reeling brain, and she fled insanely to the brink. She felt a masculine hand actually gripping her shoulders. She might have been pulled back even then, but she twisted free blindly, shrieking, No, Robin, no, no, and flung herself down the steep bank to slip and hurl downward and whirl around in the raging current to the spinning oblivion and death. Many years later, Mary Hugh, grown old in the space service, falsified a log entry to send his ship for a little while into the orbit of the tiny green planet he had named Robin's World. The old buildings had fallen into rotten timbers, and Mary Hugh courted the little world for two months, from pole to pole, but found nothing. Nothing but shadows and whispers and unending voices of the wind. Finally, he lifted his ship and went away. End of The Wind People by Marion Zimmer Bradley Recording by James Jenkins Grim Green World by John Starr This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Grim Green World by John Starr Why had five spaceships, each tested again and again, right down to its tiniest rivet, started for the moon and ended up in hell? I lit the last cigarette I would ever smoke and took my air suit out of the compartment under the control board. The two-man cubicle was cough and cold, even under the blast of sunlight pouring through the forward port, and the air smelled of stale tobacco and machine oil. Beside me, Charlie Costa's voice droned into the communicator, winging back 230,000 miles to the listening millions of Earth. "'Our air is nearly gone,' Charlie said. "'We have about twelve minutes left for deceleration, but we'll never make landing.' The Luna 5 is riddled like a sieve, spewing out heavy water fuel along with her air. It's a miracle that a chunk hasn't crashed through our fuel pile or the communicator or through us. That's what blew up the first four ships, we now know. If men ever reach the moon, they'll first have to develop some sort of armor that will turn this barrage of meteoric dust. I got my feet into the plastoid suit and pulled it on letting the transparent headpiece dangle over one shoulder like a parka hood. Charlie watched me with his tight grin, wading through the three-second lag of time for Earth's answer. Some high-ranking general down there had pushed aside the Moon Foundation scientists to make himself heard. His voice came over the hiss of static with a tinny, frantic ring. Meteoric dust couldn't possibly pierce that alloy hull. It was tested over and over. We waited him out, knowing that his frenzy was not for us, nor for the success of space flights. He was concerned, like all the military, only with the establishing of a moon base to overlook Earth, an all-commanding launching site that would control a world. Once that base was established, the ferment of war would come to a bitter end. One nation would own the planet. "'But you didn't test the hull out here,' Charlie said patiently when the general had finished." You can't imagine the speed of these particles. We've no protecting atmosphere to vaporize them, as Earth has, and they streak through the ship so fast that they seem to strike both sides of the hull at once. I'm cutting you over to Leonard Nugent now. Ready, Len? It was what I was waiting for. I had looked forward to this moment every day of the nine years I had spent being groomed for the flight, and for half a lifetime of drilling before that. The waiting was almost over. I'm ready, I said, and took the microphone. But there's not much point in reporting further, is there? With her fuel leaks, the Luna 5 will go like an A-bomb the instant we try to use the landing jets. 
just as the first four lunas did. The air is getting thinner, so thin that I'll have to put on my pressure suit soon. Are there any questions? My only answer was the grind and roar of static. I could guess why. They were bickering and quarreling among themselves down there, the military men snarling at the scientists, and the scientists snarling back, each blaming the other for this new failure. The loss of the first four ships had been a mystery until they sent the Luna Five out with co-pilots, equipped for full two-way communication. Charlie and I had reported from the beginning of the flight in alternate thirty-minute relays, keeping the Foundation posted so that if anything threatened us, they would know the nature of the danger. Now they were getting what they had asked for, and the problem would keep them busy for another ten or fifteen years while the conquest of space marked time. But they couldn't accept even temporary defeat calmly, of course. They had to quarrel among themselves— just as men have quarreled since they first climbed down out of their trees and set about organizing the business of killing each other. "'We're going to try for a landing anyway,' I said into the microphone. "'We're going to cut in the decelerator jets as soon as we pass out of the sun glare and into the moon's penumbra, where we can see.' We flashed suddenly into darkness, lost instantly in the vast conical shadow of the moon. The night half of the pocked globe loomed below— faint and ghostly in the blue earth shine, craggy and desolate, cold as space and as old as time. Earth hung above and behind us, and I couldn't help thinking of the astronomers who had followed our flight patiently every inch of the way. They couldn't see us now. The daylight crescent of the moon lay between the Luna Five and the sun, burying us deep in the utter darkness of space." Charlie took the microphone, speaking this time not to the Foundation, but to the millions who sat gaping at their radios. Some of them would be muttering maudlin prayers for our safety. Some would be gleefully collecting the bets they had made on our chances of getting across. All of them would be thrilled to the core by the vicarious imminence of danger and death. "'We don't want warning and demonstrations,' Charlie said." If you people listening to me would like to honor our memory and the memory of the men lost before us, then forget space travel for a while, and try to work out a lasting peace down there on Earth, because it's inevitable that you'll conquer space some day, and if you aren't ready for it when it comes... He clicked off the communicator, and we turned to the port together to watch the little metal sphere that hurtled up out of the darkness past the Luna Five. From behind and above us, there came a great white flash of atomic fire that must have blinded, for the moment, every watching eye on Earth. "'Right on schedule,' Charlie said, and swung the Luna Five over the dark side rim and across the mysterious other side of the moon, the hidden hemisphere that no man has ever seen. The ship was waiting for us there, a sleek, familiar cylinder with airlock standing open. We went inside and closed the lock, and stripped off our cumbersome air suits, and Charlie flexed his arms and grinned at me. Lord, I'm glad to get that over with. It's been like nine years of prison. It was worth it, I said. I was remembering the grim, green world we had left, shivering a little when I considered the brawling simian hordes who battered their way up the scale towards a culture that might, unchecked, some day rule the universe. It gives us a few more years before they come swarming down on us with their atomic bombs and politics and their gaping tourists, I said, still using the speech patterns that had been drilled into me for half my life. We've marked time long enough hoping for the best. We'll need every minute we've gained to get ready for them. We went forward then to watch the purple-skinned pilot, hairy and many-limbed and beautifully wrinkled, engaged the magnetic drive that would send us flashing toward the planet that was home. Later, in our natural bodies, we would speak the name of that world with reverence. But our clumsy synthetic earth tongues could not master its lovely sonic extensions, and so we used another term. For the time being, we called it Mars. End of the Grim Green World by John Starr Resurrection by Robert Joseph Shea This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P.J. Vanderkoy. Resurrection by Robert Joseph Shea. You're a fascinating person, the girl said. I've never met anyone like you before. Tell me your story again. The man was short and stocky, with Asiatic features and a long, stringy mustache. The whole story? he asked. It would take a lifetime to tell you. He stared out the window at the yellow sun and the red sun. He still hadn't gotten used to seeing two suns. But that was minor, really, when there were so many other things he had to get used to. A robot waiter, with long, thin metal tubes for arms and legs, glided over. When he'd first seen one of these, he thought it was a demon. He tried to smash it. They'd had trouble with him at first. They had trouble with me at first, he said. I can imagine, said the girl. How did they explain it to you? It was hard. They had to give me the whole history of medicine. It was years before I got over the notion that I was up in the everlasting blue sky, or under the earth, or something. He grinned at the girl. She was the first person he'd met since they got him a job and gave him a home in a world uncountable light-years from the one he'd been born on. When did you begin to understand? They simply taught all of history to me including the part about myself. Then I began to get the picture. Funny, I wound up teaching them a lot of history. I bet you know a lot. I do, the man with the Asiatic features said modestly. Anyway, they finally got across to me that in the 22nd century, they had explained the calendar to me, too. I used a different one in my day. They had learned how to grow new limbs on people who had lost arms and legs. That was the first real step, said the girl. It was a long time till they got to the second step, he said. They learned how to stimulate life and new growth in people who had already died. The next part is the thing I don't understand, the girl said. Well, said the man, as I get it, they found that any piece of matter that has been part of an organism retains a physical memory of the entire structure of the organism of which it was a part, and that they could reconstruct that structure from a part of a person, if that was all that was left of them. From there, it was just a matter of pushing the process back through time. They had to teach me a whole new language to explain that one. Isn't it wonderful that intergalactic travel gives us room to expand? said the girl. I mean, now that every human being that ever lived has been brought back to life and will live forever? Same problem I had, me and my people, said the man. We were cramped for space. This age has solved it a lot better than I did, but they had to give me a whole psychological overhauling before I understood that. Tell me about your past life, said the girl, staring dreamily at him. Well, six thousand years ago, I was born in the Gobi Desert, on Earth, said Genghis Khan. Sipping his drink. End of Resurrection The Marrying Man by Joseph Farrell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins the Marrying Man by Joseph Farrell Pete never heard of that old adage about What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. It wasn't that Pete Cooper didn't love his wives, or that he wanted to see them hurry on into the next world. He always felt real grief when he found himself a widower. But a man must be practical. They were all healthy young women, or at least middle-aged when he married them. Good insurance risks and no insurance agent was turning down the business when Pete asked for a policy that big, especially when Pete was putting up the cash on the line to pay up the policy when he bought it. 
That was the most sensible way for a man in the interstellar service to invest his money, Pete said. When he was out in space, traveling at near light speed, and time slowed almost to a stop for him, the few months he spent on an expedition meant that nine years passed for a wife on Earth, for a century trip, and Cyrus meant fifteen, and all tear twenty-five. So a man only saw his wife two or three times between trips, and maybe the last time he saw her, he had to take her to the old lady's home. And the next time he pulled into Earth, the insurance company was waiting for him with a check. Safer than stocks? And there was always the possibility that the loving wife might come to an accidental inn, which would sadden him. But it meant a double indemnity payment. That sort of satisfied a man's natural desire to have a little speculation attached to his investment. Sally was the seventh. Pete sat fingering the check, feeling genuine sadness at his bereavement. Lovely girl, he told the insurance agent. It makes a man feel empty to come home from the stars and find that his wife has gone to her reward. The insurance man disguised a cynical smirk behind his sympathetic mask. Yes, a wonderful woman, but it must happen to all of us. He patted Pete's shoulder gently. Pete rose, folded the check carelessly, and put it into a pocket. He shook the insurance agent's hand. You've been very kind. I'll take your card. In case I ever need another policy. Pete expected to need another policy before he had left on his next trip. He felt unhappy about Sally's being gone. But a man mustn't give in to morbid self-pity. And hadn't he heard somebody say a man without a wife was like a spaceship without a motor? He strolled about the city, unimpressed by the changes since his last visit. An interstellar man, with as much service as Pete, was beyond showing surprise at superficial differences. He was a little annoyed to find that the moving sidewalks were old-fashioned and had been torn out. People now wore little repulsor units on their belts. Walking was tiresome. He stopped at a corner and watched the pedestrians as they whizzed by a few inches off the ground. At least they were clothed. The nudity of the previous century had been somewhat unnerving, even to the blasé eyes of a time man. And he was glad to see the women were wearing long, well-groomed hair. That period, when fashion had called for smoothly shaven heads, hadn't suited his taste at all. In fact, none of it seemed to appeal to him very much anymore. That was sophistication, the price that must be paid by a man in the interstellar service, watching the centuries go by without belonging to any of them. He watched a group of young people flit laughingly by, felt an unreasoning irritation. They'd be gone and forgotten when he'd made a few more trips. One of the young girls noticed him. She broke from the group and approached. You're an interstellar, aren't you? I hope you'll join me. I'm Nancy. Pete straightened up and looked her over. A little young, maybe nineteen, but that meant a lower premium. Nice, blonde hair. Big waves of it that stayed in place even when she was moving fast. And even when she was standing still, she seemed to be moving. She was really alive, smiling and laughing, and talking easily, and in a pleasant low voice. Really healthy. That slender but nicely rounded body was good for a hundred years. But then money isn't everything. A lovely name, he told her. I like girls with old-fashioned names. Nancy, it seemed, wanted to interview a time man in connection with a thesis. And in this particular age, there was no taboo against a young girl. Introducing herself to a strange man? Pete didn't mind at all being interviewed, and having dinner with her, and seeing the town with her. And even when he had given her enough material for a dozen theses, she didn't seem in any hurry to break off their friendship. Pete was spending half his waking hours with Nancy and the other half in the men's beauty parlor. Not that he was old, a little prematurely gray, and somewhat wrinkled from the hard sun of space and the unkind atmosphere of alien planets, and he had had his contact lenses changed. Paper was scarce in this era, and they were using finer print to stretch the supply, but he was still young. He studied the full-length mirror and decided he'd pass for 35. His actual age? That would be hard to guess. Someday he'd look into the company records and figure it out, but mentally he told himself, I'm a young man, even though I walked through this city 500 years ago. A young man in love. They knew, in this era, how to make it nice for young people in love. If you could afford one of the better places. Pete sat across the table from Nancy at a tiny table on a roof far above the city. The room was crowded, but some trick of design made it seem that they were alone together. There was real music played by real people. Some of the melodies were old ones that brought a mood of nostalgia to the time man with memories of past loves. But then he looked across at Nancy, with her innocent, laughing eyes, and the beauty of her brought a lump to his throat that drove out all the small loves of the past. This was it. This time he really was in love. Pete, she said, don't you ever get tired of it, of jumping through the ages, coming back to find your old friends gone, 
being a stranger in a strange world. For instance, how about me? You'll be back from Cyrus or Altair someday, a year or two older, and I'll be an old woman. How does it feel, really? Pete took her hands and stared earnestly into her eyes. She was more serious than he'd ever seen her as she gazed back at him. It's not the right way to live, Nancy. A man doesn't really live in the real meaning of life. A man needs a woman, a wife he can come home to. He squeezed her hands gently. Nancy, will you marry me? Her hands trembled in his grasp. I will, Pete. Oh, Pete, I've been so hoping and so afraid. But, Pete, your job. He smiled reassuringly. I'm signed up for a trip, but it's only a short one. That planet of Proxima Centauri they just discovered is on the list for a complete survey. But I'll be back in seven, eight years. Then we can really settle down. She bent over the table and kissed him. I'll wait, Pete. No, Nancy, now. We'll be married first. I'll still be here a couple of months. Why waste them? I don't want to take any chances of losing you. I wanted to hear that, Pete. Her eyes were shining with happiness. About getting married now, I mean. There's no chance of you losing me. Pete was serious about settling down after the short trip to Proxima. At least he was serious about it now. But after that trip was over, he didn't think about that sort of thing anymore. He had tried to puzzle it out a few times. How he could tell a girl he was making one more trip and mean it, and then one more, and then one more, until a happy young girl was suddenly a delusioned, embittered old woman. There was a paradox of conscience here that he had given up trying to resolve. When he said he was making one more trip, he meant it. But at the same time, he knew that when he came back, he'd sign up for another. If he meant what he said when he said it, even though he knew he'd be changing his mind later, his conscience was clear. And of course a man must be practical. His earnings must be invested, and the future provided for. The honeymoon was still new when the insurance agent responded to Pete's call. I've always believed in insurance, he told Nancy. Of course, no amount of money could console me if I came back and found that something had happened to you. But people must prepare for the unpleasant things in life. Of course, said Nancy, who had never disagreed with her husband. We have to be sensible about things. I might have an accident, and so might you. We have to face things like that. The insurance man was a little dazed. He'd never sold a policy near as big as the amount Pete had named. Nobody's had an accident on an interstellar ship in a hundred years, he assured Nancy. The rate for your husband will be negligible. We expect him to be around for a really long time. Now, sir, he told Pete, your best buy is our family special, the full value to be paid to the survivor. As I said, the cost for you is trivial. And for your wife? He thumbed his rate book nervously. Pete wrote a check to pay the policy in full, and the insurance man walked out in a trance, spending his commission. And Nancy hadn't noticed that Pete's signature had gone on a guarantee that he wouldn't resign from the interstellar service for at least 200 years objective Earth time. Pete felt a little sad when his leave began to run out. They sat around the evening adoring each other. Not too late, because Pete was a man who needed plenty of sleep or he felt irritable the next day. Nancy never took his bad days seriously. The laughing happiness of youth was still in her eyes. But there was a firmness behind it now. The maturity of a girl who knows how to become a woman. He went down to the spaceport a few times to look over the ship he was signed up for and took the routine physical. Doctors went over his mind and his body probing with needles and tubes and questions that were pointless. What do you think of the popular songs of today, Mr. Cooper? What do you remember of your mother, Mr. Cooper? Are you interested in girls, Mr. Cooper? Do you have a close friendship with any of the other men in the crew, Mr. Cooper? The routine this time seemed worse than ever. Actually, he had worse ones, when the medical fashions of the time called for it. But somehow it seemed more annoying this time. Five hundred years, he told the doctor. Five hundred years I've been living this life and I know more about it than you ever will. Captain Drago told me on the trip to Altair, no, Cyrus it was, that I was the most devoted man in the service. Petey said, when you're aboard, I never worry about the engines. I'd rather have you sitting on them than anybody else. That's the way he talked. Sitting on the engines, he called it. The doctor watched Pete thoughtfully and made notes on the paper before him. And the next day, the mail brought the message that Peter Cooper... Master Engine Man, first class, was retired from the service. There was a personal letter of congratulations from an undersecretary, and a notice that his pension would start the first of the following month. It's a mistake, Pete told his wife angrily. Something's wrong. They didn't talk to Captain Drago, like I told them to, and 
Nancy's eyes were indignant. She sent him steaming back with fire in his eyes. But he couldn't change the decision. He did get as far as the office doctor, who had asked him all the fool questions. He saw a paper he wasn't meant to see. It stunned him into temporary silence. But it wasn't true. Positively not. Definite signs of senility. The notes read, irritable reaction to questioning. Mind wanders. Fixes on irrelevancies. Preoccupation with casual remarks of associates. And more. He didn't tell Nancy this. Nor did he show her the reply he received to his protest. While a search of our records indicate a subjective chronological age of approximately 48.6 years, the physiological analysis puts the condition of your body at a much higher figure. It would be guesswork to try and name a figure. However, recent studies indicate that interstellar personnel with long terms of service tend to age at an increasingly rapid rate, due probably to physiological factors stemming from the knowledge of separation from their natural culture. We are sorry. He kept his hair dark and the wrinkles smoothed out and forced the tiredness from his bones. Other things were harder to fake. But Nancy wasn't a demanding wife. She thought he was about 35, and she thought the blow of being dropped from the service had taken the life from him. She took his part firmly. It's nothing to be ashamed of, Pete. Not one person in a thousand could pass the examination for interstellar service. They're really tough, and we're together. What will we live on, Pete demanded, knowing he was being too irritable, but unable to control it. He waved the pension check. Can we live on that? A fine payment for my years of service. Nancy looked dubiously at the check. I thought it was a lot. But don't worry, Pete. You have a wife to stand by you. When Pete found out how his wife had gone about standing by him, he was almost shocked speechless. Almost. You signed up as my replacement on the Proxima expedition? But you can't. It's no job for a woman. And you're leaving me alone. For seven or eight years, they won't take you. They already did. She smiled bravely at him. As the wife of a retired serviceman, I had preference. We need the extra money, Pete, and it won't be for long. When I come back, we'll still be young enough to enjoy life, darling, and they pay well. A few years of sacrifice now will make so much difference in our future. Pete closed his eyes and thought of how many times he had said the same words to starry-eyed young women. It won't be long. We'll still be young. Good pay. Her loving lips tenderly brushed his dark hair. On nice days, Pete sits in a rocking chair on the porch with the other old men. He doesn't bother to dye his hair anymore, and he reads now with a thick glass, complaining about the small type they use nowadays. The attendants laugh off his irritability, and some of the visitors who come to see the other old men don't mind listening to his stories about interstellar service. When it gets towards dusk, he looks into the sky, sometimes as the stars appear. Centurius isn't really there, not here in the northern hemisphere. But he looks anyway, out there in space. His wife is doing a man's job. Wonderful woman, Elsie. Not Elsie. Nancy. How could he have made that mistake? Nancy, a laughing young girl, who had grown swiftly into a strong, mature woman, defending her man and her marriage vows. He leans back and rocks faster then, a smile on his face. Sometimes the visitors see him and shake their heads, sympathetically, and sometimes he sees them doing it, but it doesn't matter. They don't know. They don't know about his nest egg. That insurance policy he's going to collect someday now, because he's going to straighten them out down at the Interstellar Bureau. Captain Drago will straighten them out. Then he's going back into space and support his wife as a man should. And sometimes the smile fades and a tear rolls down his cheek when he thinks of Nancy growing old and passing away, and the insurance man gives him a check and a few words of sympathy. But a man has to be practical about such things. End of The Marrying Man by Joseph Farrell Recording by James Jenkins The Breed by Noel Loomis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz The Breed by Noel Loomis Being immortal, the breed was a very wise and resourceful thing. But even so, the problem of saving Dale Stevenson was a dilly. So much had to be done in one-fourth of a second. The breed was awakened with a rude jolt. It didn't even have time for a mental yawn. Something terrible was going on in Dale Stevenson's mind, and the turmoil there made the breed most uncomfortable. 
It shook off the lethargy of its long sleep. It knew instinctively that Dale Stevenson was about to get in trouble and make his mind unsuitable for the breed's occupancy. The breed sighed. These humans were so unstable, so impulsive. The breed took a look around. They, Dale Stevenson and he, were not on Earth. They seemed to be in space somewhere, fifty-one hundred miles from Earth. Well, well, so men finally were breaking the shackles of gravitation. The breed became a little more interested. But Dale Stevenson was reaching for a button that would fire a rocket to position the mirror and burn a path across the biggest city in Europe. Hey, what was going on here, anyway? The breed had about a quarter of a second to do a lot of research. What was Dale Stevenson doing up here? What had he done with himself in the twenty-four years since the breed had curled up in the boy's cozy four-year-old mind and settled down for a long nap? The breed could have stayed Dale's hand for a while, but the breed very much believed in minding its own business. It didn't like to interfere with humans. That was policy. So it decided to get busy. It had a quarter of a second to find out things and decide what, if anything, to do about them. Certainly it couldn't expect to stay comfortably in a mind as upset as Dale Stevenson's. So it got busy. The first thing to do was get oriented. The breed took a quick look around. Dale Stevenson, doctor of physics, was in charge of this sun station, which was a man-made island in space some three miles in diameter. The rim of the island was composed mainly of a steel framework like the rim of a wheel, with little cabins at various intervals to house a power plant, various controls, rocket berths, repair shops, and living quarters for the sun station's crew. The center area of the sun station was a giant mirror, three miles across, made up of thin sheets of metallic sodium fastened to a skeleton of wire nets. The sodium was very light in weight, and being an airless and heatless space was inert. It was also highly reflective. The whole business was kept at a point approximately 5,100 miles from Earth, where Earth's gravitational attraction approached neutrality, and where the entire space station could be maintained in a given position or moved at will with a minimum expenditure of energy. Technically, the station was owned by Night Sun Incorporated, with nearly a hundred others around Earth, and this particular station, number 18, was under contract to furnish illumination at night over Paris, France, by staying out of Earth's shadow and reflecting sunlight on Paris during the night. Management of such a station involved many mathematical factors in distance, triangulation with Paris, velocity and angulation, and control of the curve of the mirror. Normally this was a parabolic curve but it was constantly varied with other factors to produce the desired degree of illumination. Number 18 was under the sole control of Dale Stevenson, who had been psych-tested and certified by the United Nations Licensing Board. That made the breed feel a little better. It looked as if he had made a mistake 24 years ago, but it also looked as if the licensing board had been fooled within the last year, for Dale certainly was getting ready to cause a lot of trouble in Paris. He could actuate the controls to expand or contract the rim of the station, and thus vary the focal length of the sodium lens. And if he should actually concentrate the sun's rays in a small area, he could draw a flaming path of ruin through the center of Paris. Reluctantly, the breed checked again, and found that that was exactly what Dale Stevenson was about to do. The breed wondered why. It groaned. Humans were always up to something. Why couldn't they relax so the breed could rest? The breed had been so happy back in 2250, or, let's see, was it up in 2250? This was 2045. That was when Bob What's-His-Name and that cute girl had landed on Pluto and given him a chance to get away. The long, lonely eons in Pluto's absolute zero had been quite monotonous to the breed, which was nothing but pure energy, but which certainly had its feelings. After almost a third of a billion years marooned on Pluto, it had sometimes wished it had not been so adventurous in its youth and hopped that stray comet as it had swept by its home on Arcturus. For it had tired of the comet and jumped off on Pluto, and then had discovered it didn't have enough range of its own to get from Pluto to another planet. Then it was that Bob and Alice had come along on their round-the-system honeymoon, and the breed hitched a ride to Earth, unknown to them for it was pretty darned lonesome by that time. 
It lived very happily with them until they got old, and then it decided to go back in time to 1950. There it found a nice friendly mind in Joe Talbot, and after it saved Joe from blowing up the lithium mountain and half the earth with it, it had settled down to snooze in Joe's mind and hadn't awakened until Joe died of old age. Then the breed had hunted a nice stable mind and had finally picked Dale Stevenson, who was four years old, and had curled up for another long, quiet snooze. But now it was only twenty-four years later, and Dale was in a bother. The breed went deeper into Dale's mind to see what was going on. Dale was worried about something. In fact, he had worried so much it had upset his normal mental balance. It seemed to have started back about twenty years ago, a few years after the breed had entered Dale's mind. It seemed that Dale's parents had been killed in an atomic blow-up, and Dale, eight years old, had been taken care of by his older sister. "'Don't you worry, Dale,' she had told him stoutly. "'I'll take good care of you, and I'll buy you clothes and your school books and everything. You won't have to go to a home. I won't let them take you.' That's what Dale had been scared of, going to a home. He was happy with Marilyn. She took good care of him, and somehow managed to keep the authorities from finding out that a thirteen-year-old girl was supporting a small boy. Dale had understood all those things later, when he started to the university and they became curious about his background. He realized then what she had done. "'I'll remember all those things,' he told her in the first fullness of young maturity and his sudden realization of her loyalty. "'You've practically devoted your life to me. I appreciate it, you'll see.' he said, embarrassed in this new knowledge, but humbly grateful. He got a chance to show her, for six months after his graduation while he was being trained at Station No. 18. He insisted that she should come to visit his new post. Marilyn never had ridden a rocket because she was afraid of them, but she recognized the honor he was conferring on her, for very few persons but employees had ever set foot on a sun station. She agreed to go. Dale arranged passage. Then she was severely injured in the takeoff. Dale was devastated. He called in specialists, consultants, diagnosticians. Don't worry about it, he said. I'll take care of everything. You'll be all right in no time. But she wasn't. She was badly crippled, paralyzed from the waist down, and she became pitifully thin. Dale spent most of his salary on her. Doctors told him it was useless, nothing could help, that a part of her brain cells had been destroyed and could not be rebuilt, that she might live fifty years, but she would always be helpless. Dale refused to believe it. She's got to get well, he said. It isn't right, after all the things she did for me. When she was just a kid and should have been skating and dancing and going with boys, she was working to keep me from going to a home. She's entitled to some fun now. But she didn't have a chance. Her recovery would have been contrary to all medical experience. Dale's salary grew until he was getting twenty-five hundred a month, but most of it he spent on Marilyn, largely against her wishes. Dale, I wish you wouldn't insist on trying every newfangled cure that comes along. I know what the situation is. I can read. I know I won't get well. I can't. When that brain tissue is destroyed, it's gone forever. You go out and have some fun, please. But Dale, worried but stubborn, said, Do you remember that winter when you sold papers on the street so I could have skates and a sled? Do you think I can forget that? I didn't mean it to become a burden to you, she said softly. He smiled. It isn't a burden. I'm doing these things because I want to, because I want to see you active and pretty again. I'll do it, too. You'll see. Next month you're going to the spa at Carlsbad. She tried to dissuade him, but next month she was bundled up and carried to the train to go to Prague. It was in Prague that Dale met Anne Wundra, last daughter of a long line of Polish nobility. Anne was dark-haired, quick-eyed, and she could laugh in a way that warmed a man's blood. At any rate, she warmed Dale Stevenson's. They went hunting together. They ate dinner together, they rode together, they visited Marilyn together, and after they came away from Marilyn in her wheelchair, Anne said when he stopped the car on the top of a high hill in the moonlight from where they could see her ancestral castle, You're determined that she shall get well, aren't you, Dale? Of course, he said. What will you do if she doesn't? He refused to consider that. 
She will, he said, confidently. By that time, Dale's arms were tightly around her. So, for that matter, were Anne's around Dale. You are quite sure, Anne said cautiously. I suppose, he said in an abrupt humbleness, it's a fixation by now. It's something I recognize as a problem, and the best way to cure it is to cure Marilyn. When I go out on a party or when I am extravagant, it nicks my conscience, because Marilyn made all these things possible for me in the first place. It isn't your fault that she's an invalid, is it? Not directly, no, although she didn't want to take that trip. However, I don't think it's that as much as it is the feeling that if I get too much interested in other things, I might neglect her. That is, I might be somewhere else doing something for fun just at the time when the opportunity would come to get her cured. Do you see what I mean? I think so, she said gently. For instance, he went on, much concerned with making her understand. If I should spend a lot of money on other things, say, for instance, that I should marry you and we'd build a home and all, that would take a lot of money and it would make me unconsciously less eager to find a cure for Marilyn because deep down I'd know I might not be able to pay for it. Anne drew back in her arms. Her black eyes reflected the starlight. Dale, what did you say? Did you say if I should marry you? He looked back at her. Uh-huh. You've never even said you loved me. He kissed her very tenderly on the lips. I do, he said. Then they kissed so fiercely that the breed, listening in solely to get an angle on this whole business, got excited and very nearly got stuck crosswise in the time stream. But two weeks later, Dale went to his post on Sun Station Number 18 and started making Paris days last all night. Six months later, he was back for a visit, and Marilyn said, I'd like to go home, Dale. After all, you've done your part and much more, and this isn't helping me. It's pleasant and all that, but it won't make me walk. I could go to the sanatorium in Florida, and it would be just as pleasant and much less expensive. Then you could pursue a normal course of life. Dale pretended to bristle. What do you mean by that? Marilyn smiled. Anne is in love with you, Dale. She visits me often, and you should see her eyes sparkle when we mention you. Dale, will you see her tonight? Maybe I will, he said, but there won't be any marriage until you are well. You've been apart six months now, Marilyn said softly. Maybe if you see her, you will change your mind. Anne would be a wonderful wife. She was much like Marilyn, dark-haired, quick-moving, dignified but warm, affectionate and loyal. His wife would have to be loyal, of course, like Marilyn. That was essential. He hired a car that afternoon and drove out to the castle to surprise Anne. He reached the grounds just before dark, so he parked the car on the hill where Anne and he had been that last night. Maybe she and he would walk back there later. He started to walk through the grounds, and when he reached the flower garden it was almost dark. He walked along the cinder path by the roses, then cut across the grass. He heard murmuring voices, and a moment later he saw Anne walking in the garden. With her was a man, and his arm was around her. The man stopped to snap off a rose. He turned to Anne with a graceful, almost feminine gesture, and she smiled. Then, with elaborate and intimate motions, he pinned the rose in her hair. Dale was hurt. He went back quietly to the car. Of course, he had not asked her to marry him, but then he had mentioned it. And couldn't she be loyal to this memory? Dale was filled with unexpected jealousy. After a restless night, he had just about rationalized the entire situation. He knew the scene in the garden did not necessarily mean anything. He would phone Anne, mention last night, and of course she would explain. Then he picked up the morning telepaper from London and read in the gossip column that Anne Wondra, the Polish beauty, might soon announce her engagement to Georges Raoul Dumont, son of the French ambassador. Dale was stricken and was still in that state of mind, the breed saw, when a man came to his hotel room that afternoon. You are in charge of Sun Station Number 18 over Paris, I believe. This was very interesting to the breed, because it saw that the man was cleverly masked with a plastiform shell that did not at all appear to be a mask. Yes, said Dale glumly. The man's eyes looked speculative. He glanced at the telepaper on Dale's bed, 
and the breed, figuratively speaking, for of course the breed was nothing but pure energy, opened its eyes, for the breed knew the man's thought, and was astonished to learn that Dale had been closely watched for some time. Following the scene in the flower garden, the item in the telepaper had been especially arranged to produce a certain reaction in Dale Stevenson without Anne Wondra's knowledge. You know, of course, the man said, that France is about to disturb world peace by invading Spain. Dale sat up and frowned. No, I didn't know it. It is true, the man said, watching him intently. Why are you telling me? The man cleared his throat significantly. You might be in a position to save the world from an atomic war. Dale stiffened. You must know, he said coldly, what my position is. I am in the employ of the United Nations, and any attempt to control my actions is coercion, and the penalty is death. The man did not back away. He moved closer, and his eyes became black points of force. The breed saw that the man had mental powers unusual for that period of Earth's history. Look at me, Dale Stevenson. Dale fought against it, but the man's will was powerful. Dale's resistance weakened. The man's eyes never wavered from Dale's. He moved still closer and spoke in a low tone. Our information is that France will drop atomic bombs on Spain's principal cities at 3 a.m. one week from today. Suppose, just suppose, that some other nation, some nation powerful enough to do so, should be in a position to warn France at 2.30 that France would not be permitted to attack. Suppose this warning were backed up with a show of force to prove the warning meant business? Isn't that the job of the UN? The man's face was only inches now from Dale's. The breed shivered in its figurative boots. This man was a master hypnotist. Only they wouldn't call him a hypnotist in these days. They'd call him a psyche man. Psyche control was much more powerful than hypnosis. Psyche control touched the moral inhibitions, which hypnosis had never been able to do. Dale was lost. In the end, he agreed, for a cash-on-delivery fee of $100,000, to concentrate his sodium mirror beam on Paris at 2.30 of the morning designated and thereby, with a smoking path of fire and ruin, helped the other nation to warn France that she must keep hands off Spain. Perhaps Dale's jealousy of Georges Raoul Dumont had a bearing on the agreement. Dale had been so much under the foreign agent's influence that he had not considered the ethics of the idea at all, until time to press the button that would concentrate the sun energy into a consuming column of fire. The time was now and it was only now, with the hypnosis just beginning to wear off at the edges, that he found himself wondering vaguely about angles of the situation that previously had not occurred to him. Who was the man who had talked to him? Whom did he represent? Why hadn't he gone to the UN if he knew so much? But then it was true, as the man had said, if France planned to start dropping atomic bombs at three o'clock, it would be too late to appeal to the UN. Dale didn't like Frenchmen anyway. Altogether, the breed concluded, Dale Stevenson was pretty muddled up in his mind. The man needed a rest, but that could be worked out later. Right now his finger was on the firing button, and the psyche control, though weakened, was pushing him to finish the job. Oh, dear, these humans certainly could muddle things. The breed decided to have a look at Anne Wondra's mind, and there it got somewhat startled for Anne's, which previously had been all warm and cozy as toast, was very low indeed. She was looking at a snapshot of Dale, and it wasn't even a very good picture, but it exhilarated her, and at the same time it depressed her, because she wanted Dale but couldn't have him. Anne was sitting cross-legged on a thick rug, drinking Darjeeling tea and talking to her mother. "'I'm glad Monsieur Dumas has gone back home,' she said." and the breed noted that there wasn't any jump in her blood pressure when she mentioned George's name. Well, not much, anyway. "'He's very handsome,' said her mother, knitting busily. The old lady's blood pressure jumped more than Anne's. "'But he isn't as nice as Dale Stevenson.' "'My sakes, Anne, I hope you don't grow to be an old maid mooning over that tongue-tied... "'Mother!' Anne got to her feet. She was long-legged and clean-limbed, the breed approved of her. It could imagine by now what she had done to Dale's mind. It didn't see how it had slept through it. 
So the breed took a quick transition back to America and had a look at the mind of the doctor who took care of Marilyn Stevenson. The physician was having lunch with a consultation expert. You know, the doctor said, fingering a Manhattan. I don't know what to do about young Dale Stevenson. He's still trying to cure his sister. Maybe there's a reason. Sure there's a reason. He has this feeling of gratitude and loyalty and all. That's all there is to it, but he's butting his head against the infinite inertia. He's spending two thousand a month on that girl. And the worst of it is she doesn't want him to. She knows what the score is, and she's resigned to it. Well, loyalty is a wonderful thing, but I suppose it can go too far and overshadow reason, especially in the young. Is there any chance at all for the girl? No possibility. Progressive degeneration of the brain tissue. He tossed off the Manhattan and the breed shuddered. It preferred martinis itself. The only thing would be a miracle, and you know how scarce they are in the medical world. He smiled. They both smiled. The breed mentally snorted. Who were they to laugh at miracles? They thought they were pretty damn smart, didn't they? The breed decided it had better look in on Marilyn. It found her in a glassed-in porch of the sanatorium, with her reclining chair facing south, and the sun pouring down through the magnolias. The breed liked this. Everything was restful and peaceful and pleasant. But something was wrong as hell in Marilyn's mind. She had a small bottle of something in one hand under the light blanket, and she was lying back running over everything in her mind. Dale loved Anne, and Anne loved Dale. But they couldn't get married because of Dale's exaggerated sense of duty. Marilyn didn't want to keep them apart. She could adjust herself to a very pleasant life in a place like this, but Dale wouldn't let her. As fast as he could save some money, he'd dream up some new scheme to get her cured. Well, Marilyn reasoned, she wasn't of any use to anybody. Why should she stay in Dale's way? The breed was puzzled. What did she think she could do? She had the little bottle under the blanket, she was thinking. A few drops of that, and the breed was positively flabbergasted. The girl was getting ready to kill herself. The breed probed into her mind for an instant and discovered that she wasn't being a martyr and had no complexes. She was just trying to straighten things out for Dale and Anne. Oh, beans, thought the breed, if humans weren't the dumbest beings ever. It watched Marilyn raise the bottle to her lips. It simultaneously took the form of a nurse, standing there at Marilyn's side, and Marilyn gasped and said, Oh, nurse, I didn't know you were there. I am, said the breed, in its best contralto voice. Did you wish something, miss? The hand with the bottle of poison fell back under the blanket. No, I didn't call. May I move your chair out of the sun, miss? It isn't in the sun, Marilyn said. The breed raised its eyebrows. It did some quick work on the wind, and there was the sun, shining steadily through an opening in the magnolia trees. Perhaps it is too bright, said Marilyn, if you'd just move it over there. The breed was delighted. In the process of moving the chair, it got its figurative hands on the bottle and disintegrated it. Then it said, Miss, don't you think you will get well? Marilyn said calmly, resignedly. There's no chance, none whatsoever. When brain tissue is gone, there's nothing medical science can do. They can't build tissue, you know. Oh, said the breed. Only a miracle, said Marilyn, and miracles don't happen in medical science. The breed almost snorted aloud. Oh, they didn't, hey? It... The head nurse came striding up, her leather heels clacking on the tile floor. Miss, she looked puzzled. Who are you, anyway, she demanded. I've never seen you before. These women. Maybe the breed was getting peevish in its old age, but why couldn't people mind their own business for a change? It resolved itself into a doctor, and it was gratified to watch the head nurse's eyes shoot open. Madam, the breed said in its best baritone, were you addressing me? I, the head nurse, swallowed. No, sir, I beg your pardon, sir. She recovered slightly. Have I seen you before, sir? Oh, bother, details, details. Humans wouldn't be happy if they weren't tied up in details all the time. 
The breed dematerialized and went inside the sanatorium by the simple process of flowing through the spaces around the nuclei of the atoms in the wall. Then, on second thought, it went back and erased some memories from the mind of the head nurse. Then it took Marilyn through the wall into the sanatorium. It went into her mind and did some repair work that would have amazed the finest brain surgeons on earth. In a few months, Marilyn's paralysis would be gone, and she would be well and happy. Miracles, did they say? Well, they'd asked for it. The breed was somewhat irked with itself for having interfered, but it had been for the best. It got on a tight beam and went back to Sun Station number 18. Dale Stevenson's finger was just starting to move the button. There was maybe a fiftieth of a second left. The breed carefully implanted the knowledge of Marilyn's cure in a corner of Dale's brain and sat back to await results. But in the next hundredth of a second there was no response. Dale was still about to turn the sun on Paris. So the breed, now thoroughly disgusted, implanted the knowledge of Anne's love in another corner of Dale's mind, and then, to its astonishment, had to jump fast to get out of the way. Did that ever get results? Dale held his finger. He got up and rubbed his forehead a moment. Then he went to the radio phone. Get me the UN police headquarters in London, he said. He stood there, beating his brains to figure out what had gotten into him. So the breed just felt around and erased a few memories, and everything was all right. Then the breed climbed into its favorite cozy spot in Dale's mind. The spot was still warm and snuggly. It began to settle down, but then it remembered something. It got up. It went back to Earth and hunted up the minds of the men who were flying atom bombs over France. The breed knew by now, of course, that France herself never had any atom bombs. The breed went into the minds of the foreign flyers and sent them back to drop the atom bombs on their own cities. After all, they had those bombs, and they apparently were the kind who wouldn't be satisfied until they could drop them. The breed dusted off its hands and headed wearily for Sun Station Number 18. It hoped for many restful years ahead with Dale and Anne. If it didn't get them, the breed thought disgustedly. It had better try to hitch a ride back to Pluto. At least it had rest and quiet there. End of The Breed by Noel Loomis Two-Timer by Frederick Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shobha Anand Two-Timer by Frederick Brown Here is a brace of vignettes by the old vignette master. Short and sharp, like a hypodermic. Experiment The first time machine, gentlemen, Professor Johnson proudly informed his two colleagues. True, it is a small-scale experimental model. It will o operate only on objects weighing less than 3 pounds 5 ounces and for distances into the past and future of 12 minutes or less. But it works. The small scale model looked like a small scale, a postage scale, except for two dials in the part under the platform. Professor Johnson held up a small metal cube. Our experimental object, he said, is a brass cube weighing one pound, 2.3 ounces. First, I shall send it five minutes into the future. He leaned forward and set one of the dials on the time machine. Look at your watches, he said. They looked at their watches. Professor Johnson placed the cube gently on the machine's platform. It vanished. Five minutes later, to the second, it reappeared. Professor Johnson picked it up. Now, five minutes into the past. He set the other dial. Holding the cube in his hand, he looked at his watch. It is six minutes before three o'clock. I shall now activate the mechanism by placing the cube on the platform at exactly three o'clock. Therefore, 
the cube should at 5 minutes before 3 vanish from my hand and appear on the platform 5 minutes before I place it there. How can you place it there then? asked one of the colleagues. It will, as my hand approaches, vanish from the platform and appear in my hand to be placed there. Three o'clock. Notice, please. The cube vanished from his hand. It appeared on the platform of the time machine. See, five minutes before I shall place it there, it is there. His other colleague frowned at the cube. But, he said, what if, now that it has already appeared five minutes before you place it there, you should change your mind about doing so and not place it there at three o'clock? Wouldn't there be a paradox of some sort involved? An interesting idea, Professor Johnson said. I had not thought of it and it will be interesting to try. Very well, I shall not. There was no paradox at all. The cube remained. But the entire rest of the universe, professors and all, vanished. Sentry He was wet and muddy and hungry and cold and he was 50,000 light years from home. A strange blue sun gave light and the gravity, twice what he was used to, made every movement difficult. But in tens of thousands of years, this part of war hadn't changed. The flyboys were fine with their sleek spaceships and their fancy weapons. When the chips are down, though, it was still the foot soldier, the infantry that had to take the ground and hold it, foot by bloody foot. Like this damned planet of a star he had never heard of until they landed him there. And now it was sacred ground because the aliens were there too. The aliens, the only other intelligent race in the galaxy. Cruel, hideous and repulsive monsters. Contact had been made with them near the center of the galaxy. After the slow, difficult colonization of a dozen thousand planets. And it had been war at sight. They had shot without even trying to negotiate or to make peace. Now planet by bitter planet, it was being fought out. He was wet and muddy and hungry and cold. And the day was raw with a high wind that hurt his eyes. But the aliens were trying to infiltrate and every sentry post was vital. He stayed alert, gun ready. 50,000 light years from home, fighting on a strange world and wondering if he'd ever live to see home again. And then he saw one of them crawling toward him. He drew a bead and fired. The alien made that strange, horrible sound they all make, then lay still. He shuddered at the sound and sight of the alien lying there. One ought to be able to get used to them after a while, but he had never been able to. Such repulsive creatures they were, with only two arms and two legs, ghastly white skins and no scales. End of Two Timer by Frederick Brown Recording by Shobha Anand A description of the famous kingdom of Macaria by Gabriel Platz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A description of the famous kingdom of Macaria by Gabriel Platz, showing its excellent government wherein the inhabitants live in great prosperity, health and happiness, the king obeyed, the nobles honoured, and all good men respected, vice punished, and virtue rewarded. An example to other nations. In a dialogue between a scholar and a traveller. 
traveller. Well met, sir. Your habit professes scholarship. Are you a graduate? Scholar. Yes, sir. I am a master of arts. Traveller. But what do you hear in the exchange? I conceive you trade in knowledge, and here is no place to traffic for it. Neither in the book of rates is there any imposition upon such commodities, so that you have no great business either here or at the custom house. Come, let us go into the fields. I am a traveller, and can tell you strange news and much knowledge, and I have brought it over the sea without paying any custom, though it be worth all the merchandise in the kingdom. Scholar we scholars love to hear news and to learn knowledge. I will wait upon you. Go whither you will. Traveller. Well, we will go into more fields, and take a turn or two. There we shall be out of this noise and throng of people. Scholar. Agreed. But as we go, what good news do you hear of the Parliament? Traveller. I hear that they are generally bent to make a good reformation, but that they have some stops and hindrances, so that they cannot make such quick dispatch as they would. And if any experience which I have learned in my long travels may stand them instead, I would willingly impart it for the public good. Scholar, I like that well. I pray you declare some good experience, and I may say that I have gained something by the company of travellers. Traveller, in a kingdom called Macaria, the king and the governors do live in great honour and riches, and the people do live in great plenty, prosperity, health, peace, and happiness, and have not half so much trouble as they have in these European countries. Scholar, that seemeth to me impossible. You travellers must take heed of two things, principally in your relations. First, that you say nothing that is generally deemed impossible. Secondly, that your relation hath no contradiction in it, or else all men will think that you make use of the traveller's privilege, to wit, to lie by authority. Traveller, if I could change all the minds in England as easily as I suppose I shall change yours, this kingdom would be presently like to it. When you hear the manner of their government, you will deem it to be very possible, and withal very easy. Scholar, I pray you, sir, declare the manner of their government, for I think long till I hear it. Traveller, as for brevity in discourse, I shall answer your desire. They have a great council, like to the Parliament in England, but it sitteth once a year for a short space, and they hear no complaints against any but ministers of state, judges, and officers. Those they trounce soundly, if there be cause. Besides, they have five under councils, to wit, a council of husbandry, a council of fishing, a council of trade by land, a council of trade by sea, a council for new plantations. These sit once a year for a very short space, and have power to hear and determine and to punish malefactors severely, and to reward benefactors honourably, and to make new laws, not repugnant to the laws of the great council, for the whole kingdom, like as court leads and corporations have within their own precincts and liberties in England. Scholar I pray you, sir, declare some of the principal laws made by those under councils. Traveller. The council of husbandry hath ordered that the twentieth part of every man's goods that dieth shall be employed about the improving of lands and making of highways fair and bridges over rivers, by which means the whole kingdom is become like to a fruitful garden, the highways are paved and are as fair as the streets of a city. And as for bridges over rivers, they are so high that none are ever drowned in their travels. Also they have established a law that if any man holdeth more land than he is able to improve to the utmost, he shall be admonished, first of the great hindrance which it doth to the commonwealth, secondly of the prejudice to himself. And if he do not amend his husbandry within a year's space, there is a penalty set upon him which is yearly doubled till his lands be forfeited, and he banished out of the kingdom as an enemy to the commonwealth. 
In the Council of Fishing, there are laws established whereby immense riches are yearly drawn out of the ocean. In the Council of Trade by Land, there are established laws so that there are not too many tradesmen, nor too few, by enjoying longer or shorter times of apprenticeships. In the Council of Trade by Sea, there is established a law that all traffic is lawful which may enrich the kingdom. In the Council for New Plantations, there is established a law that every year a certain number shall be sent out, strongly fortified, and provided for at the public charge, till such times as they may subsist by their own endeavours, and this number is set down by the said Council, wherein they take diligent notice of the surplusage of people that may be spared. Scholar But you spoke of peace to be permanent in that kingdom. How can that be? Traveller, very easily, for they have a law that if any prince shall attempt any invasion, his kingdom shall be lawful prize, and the inhabitants of this happy country are so numerous, strong, and rich, that they have destroyed some without any considerable resistance, and the rest take warning. Scholar, but you spoke of health. How can that be procured by a better way than we have here in England? Traveller, Yes, very easily, for they have a house, or college, of experience, where they deliver out yearly such medicines as they find out by experience, and all such as shall be able to demonstrate any experiment for the health or wealth of men are honourably rewarded at the public charge, by which their skill in husbandry, physic, and surgery is most excellent. Scholar, but this is against physicians. Traveller, in Macaria, the parson of every parish is a good physician, and doth execute both functions, to wit, cura animarum and cura corporum, and they think it as absurd for a divine to be without the skill of physic, as it is to put new wine into old bottles, and the physicians, being true naturalists, may as well become good divines, as the divines do become good physicians. Scholar, but you spoke of great facility that these men have in their functions. How can that be? Traveller, very easily, for the divines, by reason that the society of experimenters is liable to an action, if they shall deliver out any false receipt, are not troubled to try conclusions or experiments, but only to consider of the diversity of natures, complexions, and constitutions which they are to know for the cure of souls, as well as of bodies. Scholar, I know diverse divines in England that are physicians, and therefore I hold well with his report, and I would that all were such, for they have great estimation with the people, and can rule them at their pleasure. But how cometh the facility of becoming good divines? Traveller, they are all of approved ability in humane learning, before they take in hand that function, and then they have such rules that they need no considerable study to accomplish all knowledge fit for divines, by reason that there are no diversity of opinions amongst them. Scholar, how can that be? Traveller, very easily, for they have a law that if any divine shall publish a new opinion to the common people, he shall be accounted a disturber of the public peace, and shall suffer death for it. Scholar. But that is the way to keep them in error perpetually, if they be once in it. Traveller. You are deceived, for if any one hath conceived a new opinion, he is allowed every year freely to dispute it before the great council. If he overcome his adversaries, or such as are appointed to be opponents, then it is generally received for truth. If he be overcome, then it is declared to be false. Scholar, it seemeth that they are Christians by a relation of the parochial ministers, but whether are they Protestants or Papists? Traveller, their religion consists not in taking notice of several opinions and sects, but is made up of infallible tenets, which may be proved by invincible arguments, and such as will abide the grand test of extreme dispute, by which means none have power to stir up schisms and heresies, neither are any of their opinions ridiculous to those who are of contrary minds. Scholar, 
But you spoke of great honor which the governors have in the kingdom of Macaria, traveler. They must needs receive great honor of the people by reason that there is no injustice done, or very seldom, perhaps once in an age. Scholar. But how come they by their great riches which you speak of? Traveler. It is holden a principal policy in state to allow to the ministers of state, judges, and chief officers great revenues, for that in case they do not their duty in looking to the kingdom's safety, for conscience' sake, yet they may do it for fear of losing their own great estates. Scholar. But how can the king of Macaria be so rich as you speak of? Traveller. He taketh a strict cause that all his crown lands be improved to the utmost as forests, parks, chases, etc., by which means his revenues are so great that he seldom needeth to put impositions upon his subjects, by reason he hath seldom any wars, and, if there be cause, the subjects are as ready to give as he to demand, for they hold it to be a principal policy in state to keep the king's coffers full, and so full that it is an astonishment to all invaders. Scholar, but how cometh the king's great honour which you speak of? Traveller, who can but love and honour such a prince, which in his tender and parental care of the public good of his loving subjects, useth no pretences for realities, like to some princes in their acts of state, edicts and proclamations? Scholar, but you travellers must take heed of contradictions in your relations. You have affirmed that the governors in Macaria have not half so much trouble as they have in these European kingdoms, and yet, by your report, they have a great council, like to our parliament in England, which sit once a year. Besides that, they have five under councils, which sit once a year. Then how cometh this facility in government? Traveller. The great council heareth no complaints, but against ministers of state, judges, and chief officers. These, being sure to be trounced once a year, do never, or very seldom, offend, so that their meeting is rather a festivity than a trouble. And as for the judges and chief officers, there is no hope that any man can prevail in his suit by bribery, favour, or corrupt dealing, so that they have few causes to be troubled withal. Scholar I have read over Sir Thomas More's Utopia and my Lord Bacon's New Atlantis, which he called so in imitation of Plato's old one, but none of them giveth me satisfaction, how the kingdom of England may be happy, so much as this discourse, which is brief and pithy and easy to be effected, if all men be willing. Traveller. You divines have the sway of men's minds. You may as easily persuade them to good as to bad, to truth as well as to falsehood. Scholar. Well, in my next sermon I will make it manifest that those that are against this honourable design are first enemies to God and goodness, secondly enemies to the commonwealth, thirdly enemies to themselves and their posterity. Traveller. And you may put in that they are enemies to the king and to his posterity, and so, consequently, traitors. For he that would not have the king's honour and riches to be advanced, and his kingdom to be permanent to him and to his heirs, is a traitor, or else I know not what treason meaneth. Scholar. Well, I see that the cause is not in God, but in man's fooleries that the people live in misery in this world when they may so easily be relieved. I will join my forces with you, and we will try a conclusion to make ourselves and posterity to be happy. Traveller. Well, what will you do towards the work? Scholar. I have told you before, I will publish it in my next sermon, and I will use means that in all visitations and meetings of divines, they may be exhorted to do the like. Traveller. This would do the feat, but that the divines in England, having not the skill of physic, are not so highly esteemed, nor bear so great a sway, as they do in Macaria. Scholar. Well, what will you do toward the work? Traveller. I will propound a book of husbandry to the High Court of Parliament, whereby the kingdom may maintain double the number of people which it doth now, and in more plenty and prosperity than now they enjoy. Scholar. 
That is excellent. I cannot conceive but that if a kingdom may be improved to maintain twice as many people as it did before, it is as good as the conquest of another kingdom, as great, if not better. Traveller. Nay, it is certainly better, for when the towns are thin and far distant, and the people scarce and poor, the king cannot raise men and money upon any sudden occasion without great difficulty. Scholar. Have you a copy of that book of husbandry about you, which is to be propounded to the Parliament? Traveller. Yes, here is a copy. Peruse it, whilst I go about a little business, and I will presently return to you. Well, have you perused my book? Scholar. Yes, sir, and find that you show the transmutation of sublunary bodies in such manner that any man may be rich that will be industrious. You show also how great cities, which formerly devour the fatness of the kingdom, may yearly make a considerable retribution without any man's prejudice, and your demonstrations are infallible. This book will certainly be highly accepted by the High Court of Parliament. Traveller. Yes, I doubt it not, for I have showed it to diverse Parliament men, who have all promised me fair, so soon as a seasonable time cometh for such occasions. Scholar. Were I a Parliament man, I would labour to have this book to be dispatched. The next thing that is done, for with all my seven liberal arts I cannot discover how any business can be of more weight than this, wherein the public good is so greatly furthered, which to further we are all bound by the law of God and nature. Traveller. If this conference be seriously considered of, it is no laughing matter. For you hear of the combustions in France, Spain, Germany, and other Christian countries. You know that a house divided against itself cannot stand. This may give the Turk an advantage, so that England may fear to have him a nearer neighbor than they desire. Why should not all the inhabitants of England join with one consent to make this country to be like to Macaria, that is, numerous in people, rich in treasure and munition? that so they may be invincible. Scholar, none but fools or mad men will be against it. You have changed my mind according to your former prediction, and I will change as many minds as I can by the ways formerly mentioned, and I pray you that for a further means this conference may be printed. Traveller, well, it shall be done forthwith. Scholar, but one thing troubleth me, that many divines are of opinion that no such reformation as we would have shall come before the day of judgment. Traveller, indeed, there are many divines of that opinion, but I can show a hundred texts of scripture which do plainly prove that such a reformation shall come before the day of judgment. Scholar, Yea, I have read many plain texts of scripture to that purpose, but when I search the expositors... I found that they did generally expound them mystically. Traveller, that is true, but were this sent here on, considering that those places of scripture would not bear an allegorical exposition, said thus, Possumus sicut e multi ali omnia hoec, spiritualiter exponere sed verior, ne hujus modi expositionem prudentes lectores ne quaquam recipient. Scholar, I am of St. Jerome's mind, and therefore, with alacrity, let us pursue our good intentions, and be good instruments in this work of reformation. Traveller, there be natural causes also to further it, for the art of printing will so spread knowledge that the common people, knowing their own rights and liberties, will not be governed by way of oppression. And so, by little and little, all kingdoms will be like to Macaria. Scholar, that will be a good change, when as well superiors as inferiors shall be more happy. Well, I am in paradise in my mind in thinking that England may be made happy with such expedition and facility. Traveller, well, do you know any man that hath any secrets or good experiments? I will give him gold for them, or others as good in exchange. That is all the trade I have driven a long time. Those riches are free from customs and impositions, and I have travelled through many kingdoms. 
and paid neither freight nor custom for my wares, though I valued them above all the riches in the kingdom. Scholar, I know a gentleman that is greatly addicted to try experiments, but how he hath prospered I am not certain. I will bring you acquainted with him, perhaps you may do one another good. Traveller, well, I have appointed a meeting at two of the clock this day. I love to discourse with scholars, yet we must part. If you meet me here the next Monday at the exchange, I will declare to you some more of the laws, customs, and manners of the inhabitants of Macaria. Scholar, I will not fail to meet you for any worldly respect, and if I should be sick, I would come in a sedan. I never received such satisfaction and contentment by any discourse in my life. I doubt not, but we shall obtain our desires to make England to be like to Macaria, for which our posterity, which are yet unborn, will fare the better. And though our neighbor countries are pleased to call the English a dull nation, yet the major part are sensible of their own good and the good of their posterity, and those will sway the rest. So we and our posterity shall be all happy. End of a description of the famous kingdom of Macaria by Gabriel Platz. The Man Who Killed the World by Ray Cummings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Killed the World by Ray Cummings In his little tower, perched at the very peak of the great terraced pile of buildings, which was his home and his citadel, Peter Groff sat brooding with hatred. The city, its factories, its vast ploughed fields, lay stretched below him. Millions of humans at play in little games. How he hated them, and they hated him, hated and feared him. It made him chuckle. For all his life he had worked and schemed and fought to make himself a power. The richest, most powerful man in the world, he had attained it. They had called him cruel in his youth with his ruthless business methods. He had laughed. Then they had no longer dared call him anything which would anger him, and he had laughed at that while he had bought their governments and their armies with his money. He was laughing now as he thought of it. In seventy years he had made the name Peter Groff a thing at which to tremble. Over all the earth, from the heads of his groveling puppet governments, down to the lowliest child driving a plough in the fields, there was no one who did not secretly fear Groff, the power of his money, the sound of anger in his voice. Here in his citadel his servants trembled and hated him. It was funny, because by their methods they had gotten nothing, and he had gotten everything. Alone in his little tower, he sat and brooded. There was little else to do now, and he enjoyed it, this contemplation of himself and his achievements. The mirror beside which he sat reflected his image. He stared at himself, his trusted companion. His face, thin-lipped, was grim with its power. His eyes gleamed with it, eyes at which everyone shivered with fear. The banked rows of his television-tuning knobs were within reach of his hand, and he decided that it would be amusing to look and to listen from some of the newscasters' vantage points at what was transpiring down in the city streets. He chose one in the factory district, over by the river. They were the people who had leased. The little cathode mirror presently was glowing with the scene he had selected. It was a tube-lit city arcade, far down by the lowest level of the interurban railway. Subterranean shops were along its sides, places where people with the tiniest fraction of money might spend it for something which wasn't worth having. And as he stared, from one of the shops a young couple came, a dark-haired, slender young man, and a girl who was pretty and who was laughing. They were poorly dressed, they had nothing, but they were laughing. 
and suddenly they were struggling as the young man fastened upon the girl's dress the bauble he had bought, and then was trying to kiss her for his payment. The scuffle was over in a moment, and Groff heard from his microphone the girl's gasping, murmured words. "'Oh, Jack, I'm so happy!' Groff stiffened. His thin, lined face was grim as he reached and cut off the image and the murmuring voice. Something happened to Peter Groff that summer night. He wasn't conscious of it. He only knew that he was enraged, as though an attack had been made upon him. Atrocious things which menaced him needed crushing. He pondered it, grim with his planning. Near dawn, some of his servants knew that something had happened. They heard him, with his wild laughter coming in an eerie muffled blur from his little tower. Then young Peller dared go up to see what might be the matter. "'Is there anything you need of me, master?' he asked. Groff was stirring from his great armchair. "'Not now, Peller, but I've just discovered how to solve the situation very quickly. "'The master has just made up his mind, Peller.' It was gratifying to see the terror and confusion on Peller's face. Groff's gesture drove the servant away, so that he would go down into the corridors of the citadel and whisper with all the other servants as they trembled, thinking the master might be displeased with them. The thing took Groff more than a year. The thousands of men whom he sent secretly throughout the world did as he commanded, and did not know why they were doing it. Poor fools! The great scientist, who for so many years had been in Groff's employ, gave him the technical knowledge he sought. Fools! All fools! They could not guess what he was really after. The lies he told them, which awakened their cupidity, were so easy for them to believe. No servant could know what any other servant was doing. No one could piece it together. There was only the masterful Groff in his tower, weaving the poisonous threads of his gigantic enterprise into a pattern which only himself could see. Then at last he was ready. He had tracked down the identity of the dark-haired, slender young worker whom the laughing girl had called Jack. And there came the momentous night when he sent for the young man and the girl, and white-faced, frightened, they stood before him in his little tower. Groff lolled back in his big chair as he quietly regarded them. "'Quite an honor for you, isn't it?' he said, seeing me in person. "'What do you want of us?' the young man murmured. It was pleasing to Groff to see his terror. "'I wanted to thank you,' Groff said ironically. "'It happened that I saw you two one night about a year ago. You made me realize what I must do.' So I thought I would tell you about it. They could only stand wordless, frightened. Groff sucked in his breath with anticipatory pleasure. In a moment now they would be more than frightened. They would be utterly terrified, and their terror would spread like a wave around the world. Groff was lashing himself into grim anger. You are going to die, he said. At the girl's sudden little whimpering gasp, he raised his hand. That sort of thing won't help you any, you and everyone on earth. This is your last night of health. Tomorrow at dawn, you will all start swiftly to sicken. In a week, a month, you will be dead. How well they knew that his threats were never empty. They were huddled together now, with trembling arms around each other as they stared at him. He lashed himself further into anger as he told them that he realized how millions of people were conspiring to the end that Groff might suffer misfortune, a menace which he could no longer tolerate. How those millions would squirm as they saw death coming upon them. The supreme power of Groff at last demonstrated to its ultimate— Queer that he had never thought of this logical climax to his great career, not until that little incident a year ago, when this young couple had caused him to envisage it. He was telling them now what he had done, the little depots all over the earth compressed with caged bacteria. 
little time bombs all to explode within thirty minutes of this present instant. The women, the children, the aged would die first. But the polluted air, the contagion, spreading everywhere, in a week, a month, the swift and deadly bacteria would leave no one alive. You are going to do this to us? Young Jack murmured at last. Why not? It is my destiny. Never had Groff felt so quiet and comfortable a thrill as now, and this was only the beginning. Others before me have tried their little conquests, he said with his grim smile. Men who wanted power and got it, just in a small way and for a little while. There was one, I recall reading about him, one who was so foolish to disclose all his plans by writing them in a book years before he had a chance to accomplish them. I am not like him. I tell you now, when there is a scant thirty minutes before your inevitable annihilation begins. You hate your fellow men so much, Jack murmured impulsively. You would kill yourself just for the pleasure of killing the rest of us? To die. It sent so strangely a queer little shiver over Groff. He had always felt it, but no one could ever know it save himself. How many times his vaunted reckless bravery had awed his fellow man. He sat very straight now, and his eyes flashed. I have never been one to fear death, he said. But as always before, he knew now that he was safe enough. His armed citadel here was wholly safe from outside attack, even if the stricken multitudes should find brief strength to try and assail him. His retainers, thinking they were safe, would remain at their posts, poor fools. At the last, even they would be stricken, and Groff would retreat up here, impregnable, here in the tower and its neighbor little rooms. He could maintain his unpolluted air, and eat the food and drink the water which he had stored here in such abundance. Perhaps even nature would let him live the longer for his isolation. Master of the earth, the man who owned everything. Pride swelled him again as he thought of that poor little fool who had only wanted to make himself the titular leader of the earth, and in his own fatuous conceit had written it all down in his little book. You have good reason to fear me, Groff said. You realize it now? The young couple were white-faced and trembling as they clung to each other, and suddenly the girl murmured, I, I pity you. Groff caught at it with his sudden wild rage flooding him. You lie, he rasped. You are frightened. You are terrified of me and my revenge. Revenge? Young Jack muttered. I wonder what we have done to you, except that we live and breathe and try to be happy. His arm held the trembling girl closer, and he turned and gazed into her face, her moist red lips quivering, her eyes like misted stars as she regarded him. If we are both to die, he murmured, still, we will have each other, Menya. Yes, she whispered. Then it seemed that the youth was not quite so afraid as he straightened and fronted Groff. Your revenge, when you kill us both, is not quite complete, he said with a twisted smile. They turned at Groff's gesture of dismissal. At the head of the great staircase, which went down from the tower, dominant with his power, Groff stood with his heavy ornamented robe, tossed over one shoulder, and all his emblazoned insignia dangling on his chest. The young couple were still clinging to each other as they descended. Then they were a little blob, dwarfed by distance, dwindling into total insignificance. It was only a trick of lighting of the great staircase, of course, but suddenly, just before they vanished, it seemed that the light had magnified them into something gigantic. The thing was over at last. It was a week, two weeks... Three weeks, Groff had kept no track of the time. Exhausted with exulting, he lay back in his chair with his instruments around him. How wonderful it had been! The ultimate conquest, the power of Groff and Groff alone. 
So many times it had made him think of those other conquerors, those little men of history who had been thrilled by their trips of triumph into some petty land their armies had devastated. That little man in his air car, gazing in triumph, swelling himself with his pride as he gazed at the death and destruction he had brought to just one petty nation in three weeks. Groff's triumph was over now. He had seen much of it. With his telescopes ranging the city and on his television mirrors before the television went blank. It had been queer how people, stricken so that they knew they had only a few days to live, had rushed around bringing their families together. Queer that then they had not really seemed afraid. Queer how the churches had been crowded with doomed people who clung together and had a strange look on their faces as though they were not afraid to die. Then it was over. From the immense height and safety of his little tower, Groff sat surveying his conquered world, the man who had everything, the ultimate of personal power. And what would he do with it now? Queer thought. It was so queer, so whimsical a thought, that he chuckled, and then was laughing at it, laughing for so long that it left him breathless. There was nobody here to hate. That was another queer thought. Was it days or weeks or years that now he sat alone in his little tower, surveying his empty world? There was nothing to do but gloat with pride at the greatness of himself, and to laugh at the whimsicality of his hungry need to be angry at his enemies, who now did not exist. He had tired of that. Then there were times when he thought it would be satisfying if he killed himself, like the man who had written the book and who could not live when he realized that the time had come when no one feared him. But Groff found that he had not the courage to do that. It tired him to laugh so much, so that often now he sat just anguished with emptiness. It was queer how that vision of the young couple going down his staircase seemed always here to haunt and to puzzle him. What had been about them that was so gigantic? The thought enraged him, because he knew now that it was something he might have wanted, something he had failed to get. End of The Man Who Killed the World by Ray Cummings Zero Hour by Ray Bradbury this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Zero Hour by Ray Bradbury. Oh, it was to be so jolly. What a game. Such excitement they hadn't known in years. The children catapulted this way and that across the green lawns, shouting at each other, holding hands, flying in circles, climbing trees, laughing. Overhead, the rockets flew and beetle cars whispered by on the streets, but the children played on. Such fun, such tremulous joy, such tumbling and hearty screaming. Mink ran into the house all dirt and sweat. For her seven years, she was loud and strong and definite. Her mother, Mrs. Morris, hardly saw her as she yanked out drawers and rattled pans and tools into a large sack. Heavens, Mink, what's going on? The most exciting game ever, gasped Mink, pink-faced. Stop and get your breath, said the mother. No, I'm all right, gasped Mink. Okay, I take these things, Mom? But don't dent them, said Mrs. Morris. Thank you, thank you, cried Mink, and boom, she was gone like a rocket. Mrs. Morris surveyed the fleeing tot. What's the name of the game? Invasion, said Mink. The door slammed. In every yard on the street, the children brought out knives and forks and pokers and old stovepipes and can openers. It was an interesting fact that this fury and bustle occurred only among the younger children. The older ones, those ten years and more, disdained the affair and marched scornfully off on hikes or played a more dignified version of hide-and-seek on their own. Meanwhile, parents came and went in chromium beetles. Repairmen came to repair the vacuum elevators and houses, to fix fluttering television sets, or hammer upon stubborn food delivery tubes. The adult civilization passed and repassed the busy youngsters, 
jealous of the fierce energy of the wild tots, tolerantly amused at their flourishings, longing to join in themselves. This and this and this, said Mink, instructing the others with their assorted spoons and wrenches. Do that and bring that over here. No, here, Ninny. Right. Now, get back while I fix this. Tongue in teeth, face wrinkled in thought. Like that. See? Yay! shouted the kids. Twelve-year-old Joseph Connors ran up. Go away, said Mink, straight at him. I want to play, said Joseph. Can't, said Mink. Why not? You just make fun of us. Honest, I wouldn't. No, we know you. Go away or we'll kick you. Another twelve-year-old word by on little motor skates. Hey, Joe, come on, let them sissies play. Joseph showed reluctance and a certain wistfulness. I want to play, he said. You're old, said Mink firmly. Not that old, said Joe sensibly. You'd only laugh and spoil the invasion. The boy on the motor skates made a rude lip noise. Come on, Joe, them and their fairies, nuts. Joseph walked off slowly. He kept looking back all down the block. Mink was already busy again. She made a kind of apparatus with her gathered equipment. She had appointed another little girl with a pad and pencil to take down notes in painful, slow scribbles. Their voices rose and fell in the warm sunlight. All around them, the city hummed. The streets were lined with good, green, and peaceful trees. Only the wind made a conflict across the city, across the country, across the continent. In a thousand other cities, there were trees and children and avenues, businessmen in their quiet offices taping their voices or watching televisors. Rockets hovered like darning needles in the blue sky. There was the universal quiet conceit and easiness of men accustomed to peace, quite certain there would never be trouble again. Arm in arm, men all over earth were a united front. The perfect weapons were held in equal trust by all nations. A situation of incredibly beautiful balance had been brought about. There were no traitors among men, no unhappy ones, no disgruntled ones. Therefore, the world was based upon a stable ground. Sunlight illumined half the world, and the trees drowsed in a tide of warm air. Mink's mother, from her upstairs window, gazed down. The children. She looked upon them and shook her head. Well, they'd eat well, sleep well, and be in school on Monday. Bless their vigorous little bodies. She listened. Mink talked earnestly to someone near the rose bush, though there was no one there. These odd children. And the little girl, what was her name? Anna? Anna took notes on a pad. First, Mink asked the rose bush a question, then called the answer to Anna. Triangle, said Mink. What's a try? said Anna with difficulty. Angle? Never mind, said Mink. How do you spell it? asked Anna. T-R-I, spelled Mink, slowly, then snapped, Oh, spell it yourself. She went on to other words. Beam, she said. I haven't got try, said Anna. Angle, down yet. Well, hurry, hurry, cried Mink. Mink's mother leaned out the upstairs window. A-N-G-L-E, she spelled down at Anna. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Morris, said Anna. Certainly, said Mink's mother, and withdrew laughing to dust the hall with an electro-duster magnet. The voices wavered in the shimmery air. Beam, said Anna, fading. Four, nine, seven, A and B and X, said Mink, far away, seriously. And a fork and a string and a hex hexagon hexagonal. At lunch, Mink gulped milk at one toss and was at the door. Her mother slapped the table. You sit right back down, commended Mrs. Morris. Hot soup in a minute. She poked a red button on the kitchen butler, and ten seconds later something landed with a bump in the rubber receiver. Mrs. Morris opened it, took out a can with a pair of aluminum holders, unsealed it with a flick, and poured hot soup into a bowl. During all this, Mink fidgeted. Hurry, Mom, this is a matter of life and death. Aw. I was the same at your age, always life and death, I know. Mink banged away at the soup. Slow down, said Mom. Can't, said Mink. Drill's waiting for me. Who's Drill? What a peculiar name, said Mom. You don't know him, said Mink. A new boy in the neighborhood, asked Mom. He's new, all right, said Mink. She started on her second bowl. 
Which one is Drill? asked Mom. He's around, said Mink, evasively. You'll make fun. Everybody pokes fun. Gee, darn. Is Drill shy? Yes. No. In a way. Gosh, Mom, I got to run if we want to have the invasion. Who's invading what? Martians invading Earth. Well, not exactly Martians. They're, I don't know, from up. She pointed with her spoon. And inside, said Mom, touching Mink's feverish brow. Mink rebelled. You're laughing. You'll kill Drill and everybody. I, I didn't mean to, said Mom. Drill's a Martian? No, he's, well, maybe from Jupiter or Saturn or Venus. Anyway, he's had a hard time. I imagine. Mrs. Morris hid her mouth behind her hand. They couldn't figure a way to attack the Earth. We're impregnable, said Mom in mock seriousness. That's the word Drill used. Impreg That's the word, Mom. My, my, Drill's a brilliant little boy. Two-bit words. Well, they couldn't figure out a way to attack, Mom. Drill says, he says, in order to make a good fight, you got to have a new way of surprising people. That way you win. And he says also, you got to have help from your enemy. A fifth column, said Mom. Yeah, that's what Drill said. And they couldn't figure out a way to surprise Earth or get help. No wonder, we're pretty darn strong, laughed Mom, cleaning up. Mink sat there, staring at the table, seeing what she was talking about. Until one day, whispered Mink melodramatically, they thought of children. Well, said Mrs. Morris brightly, and they thought of how grown-ups are so busy they never look under rose bushes or on lawns. Only for snails and fungus. And then there's something about dim dims dim dims dim dimen dimensions dimensions four of them and there's something about kids under nine and imagination it's real funny to hear drill talk mrs morris was tired well it must be funny you're keeping drill waiting now it's getting late in the day and if you want to have your invasion before your supper bath you better jump do i have to take a bath growled mink you do why is it children hate water? No matter what age you live in, children hate water behind the ears. Drill says I won't have to take baths, said Mink. Oh, he does, does he? He told all the kids that. No more baths, and we can stay up till ten o'clock and go to two televisor shows on Saturday instead of one. Well, Mr. Drill better mind his P's and Q's. I'll call up his mother and... Mink went to the door. We're having trouble with guys like Pete Britz and Del Jarek. They're growing up. They make fun. They're worse than parents. They just won't believe in drill. They're so snooty because they're growing up. You think they'd know better. They were little only a couple of years ago. I hate them worst. We'll kill them first. <laughs> your father and I last. Drill says you're dangerous. Know why? Because you don't believe in Martians. They're going to let us run the world. Well, not just us, but the kids over in the next block, too. I might be queen. She opened the door. Mom? Yes? What's logic? Logic? Why, dear, logic is knowing what things are true and not true. He mentioned that, said Mink. And what's him impressionable? It took her a minute to say it. Why, it means... Her mother looked at the floor, laughing gently. It means to be a child, dear. Thanks for lunch. Mink ran out, then stuck her head back in. Mom, I'll be sure you won't be hurt much, really. Well, thanks, said Mom. Slam went the door. At four o'clock, the audio visor buzzed. Mrs. Morris flipped the tab. Hello, Helen, she said, and welcome. Hello, Mary. How are things in New York? Fine. How are things in Scranton? You look tired. So do you. The children underfoot, said Helen. Mrs. Morris sighed. My mink, too. The super invasion. Helen laughed. Are your kids playing that game, too? Lord, yes. Tomorrow it'll be a geometrical jacks and motorized hopscotch. Were we this bad when we were kids in 48? Worse. Japs and Nazis. Don't know how my parents put up with me. Tomboy. Parents learn to shut their ears. A silence. What's wrong, Mary? asked Helen. Mrs. Morris's eyes were half-closed. Her tongue slid slowly, thoughtfully over her lower lip. Eh? She jerked. 
Oh, nothing. Just thought about that. Shutting ears and such. Never mind. Where were we? My boy Tim's got a crush on some guy named Drill, I think it was. Must be a new password. Mink likes him, too. Didn't know it got as far as New York. Word of mouth, I imagine. Looks like a scrap drive. I talked to Josephine, and she said her kids, that's in Boston, are wild on this new game. It's sweeping the country. At this moment, Mink trotted into the kitchen to gulp a glass of water. Mrs. Morris turned. How are things going? Almost finished, said Mink. Swell, said Mrs. Morris. What's that? A yo-yo, said Mink. Watch. She flung the yo-yo down its string. Reaching the end, it, it vanished. See, said Mink. Oh, dibbling her finger, she made the yo-yo reappear and zip up the string. Do that again, said her mother. Can't. Zero hours, five o'clock. Bye. Mink exited, zipping her yo-yo. On the audio visor, Helen laughed. Tim brought one of those yo-yos in this morning, but when I got curious, he said he wouldn't show it to me. And when I tried to work it, finally, it wouldn't work. You're not impressionable, said Mrs. Morris. What? Never mind. Something I thought of. Can I help you, Helen? I wanted to get that black and white cake recipe. The hour drowsed by. The day waned. The sun lowered in the peaceful blue sky. Shadows lengthened on the green lawns. The laughter and excitement continued. One little girl ran away crying. Mrs. Morris came out the front door. Mink, was that Peggy Ann crying? Mink was bent over in the yard near the rose bush. Yeah, she's a scare baby. We won't let her play now. She's getting too old to play. I guess she grew up all of a sudden. Is that why she cried? Nonsense. Give me a civil answer, young lady. You're inside you come. Mink whirled in consternation, mixed with irritation. I can't quit now. It's almost time. I'll be good. I'm sorry. Did you hit Peggy Ann? No, honest. You ask her. It was something... Well, she's just a scaredy pants. The ring of children drew in around Mink, where she scowled at her work with spoons and a kind of a square-shaped arrangement of hammers and pipes. There and there, murmured Mink. What's wrong? said Mrs. Morris. Drill's stuck halfway. If we could only get him all the way through, it'll be easier. Then all the others could come through after him. Can I help? No, ma'am. Thanks. I'll fix it. All right. I'll call you for your bath in half an hour. I'm tired of watching you. She went in and sat in the electric relaxing chair, sipping a little beer from a half-empty glass. The chair massaged her back. Children, children. Children and love and hate, side by side. Sometimes children loved you, hated you, all in half a second. Strange children. Did they ever forget or forgive the whippings and the harsh, strict words of command? She wondered. How can you ever forget or forgive those over and above you, those tall and silly dictators? Time passed. A curious, waiting silence came upon the street, deepening. Five o'clock. A clock sang softly somewhere in the house, in a quiet, musical voice. Five o'clock, five o'clock, time's a-wasting, five o'clock, and purred away into silence. Zero hour. Mrs. Morris chuckled in her throat. Zero hour. A beetle car hummed into the driveway. Mr. Morris. Mrs. Morris smiled. Mr. Morris got out of the beetle, locked it, and called hello to Mink at her work. Mink ignored him. He laughed and stood for a moment, watching the children in their business. Then he walked up the front steps. Hello, darling. Hello, Henry. She strained forward on the edge of the chair, listening. The children were silent, too silent. He emptied his pipe, refilled it. Swell day. Makes you glad to be alive. Buzz. What's that? asked Henry. I don't know. She got up, suddenly, her eyes widening. She was going to say something. She stopped it. Ridiculous. Her nerves jumped. Those children haven't anything dangerous out there, have they? She said. Nothing but pipes and hammers. Why? Nothing electrical? Heck no, said Henry. I looked. She walked to the kitchen. The buzzing continued. Just the same, you'd better tell them to quit. It's after five. Tell them... Her eyes widened and narrowed. Tell them to put off their invasion till tomorrow. She laughed nervously. The buzzing grew louder. What are they up to? I'd better go look, all right. The explosion. The house shook with dull sound. 
There were other explosions in other yards on other streets. Involuntarily, Mrs. Morris screamed. Up this way, she cried senselessly, knowing no sense, no reason. Perhaps she saw something from the corners of her eyes. Perhaps she smelled a new odor or heard a new noise. There was no time to argue with Henry to convince him. Let him think her insane. Yes, insane. Shrieking, she ran upstairs. He ran after her to see what she was up to. In the attic, she screamed. That's where it is. It was only a poor excuse to get him in the attic in time. Oh, God, in time. Another explosion outside. The children screamed with delight, as if at a great fireworks display. It's not in the attic, cried Henry. It's outside. No, no. Wheezing, gasping, she fumbled at the attic door. I'll show you. Hurry, I'll show you. They tumbled into the attic. She slammed the door, locked it, took the key, threw it into a far, cluttered corner. She was babbling wild stuff now. It came out of her, all the subconscious suspicion and fear that had gathered secretly all afternoon and fermented like a wine in her. All the little revelations and knowledges and sense that had bothered her all day and which she had logically and carefully and sensibly rejected and censored. Now it exploded in her and shook her to bits. There, there, she said, sobbing against the door. We're safe until tonight. Maybe we can sneak out. Maybe we can escape. Henry blew up, too, but for another reason. Are you crazy? Why did you throw that key away? Damn it, honey. Yes, yes, I'm crazy, if it helps, but stay here with me. I don't know how in the hell I can get out. Quiet, they'll hear us. Oh, God, they'll find us soon enough. Below them, Mink's voice. The husband stopped. There was a great universal humming and sizzling, a screaming and giggling. Downstairs, the audio televisor buzzed and buzzed insistently, alarmingly, violently. Is that Helen calling? thought Mrs. Morris. And is she calling about what I think she's calling about? Footsteps came into the house, heavy footsteps. Who's coming in my house? demanded Henry angrily. Who's tramping around down there? Heavy feet, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty of them. Fifty persons crowding into the house. The humming the giggling of the children. This way, cried Mink below. Who's downstairs, roared Henry. Who's there? Hush, oh, no, 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 said his wife, weakly, holding him. Please be quiet. They might go away. Mom, called Mink. Dad? A pause. Where are you? Heavy footsteps, heavy, heavy, very heavy footsteps came up the stairs. Mink leading them. Mom? A hesitation. Dad? A waiting. A silence. Humming. Footsteps. Toward the attic. Minks first. They trembled together in silence in the attic, Mr. and Mrs. Morris. For some reason, the electric humming, the queer cold light suddenly visible under the door crack, the strange odor, and the alien sound of eagerness in Mink's voice finally got through to Henry Morris, too. He stood shivering in the dark silence, his wife beside him. Mom! Dad! Footsteps. A little humming sound. The attic lock melted. The door opened. Mink peered inside, tall blue shadows behind her. Peekaboo, said Mink. End of Zero Hour by Ray Bradbury. Recording by Colleen McMahon. No Strings Attached by Lester Del Rey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mike Manalakis No Strings Attached by Lester Del Rey Committing a perfect murder is a simple matter. Drive out some night to a lonely road... Find a single person walking along out of sight of anyone else. Offer him a ride, knife him, and go home. In such a crime, there is no reason to connect killer and victim. No motive, no clue, no suspect. To achieve the perfect murder of a man's own wife, however, is a different matter. For obvious reasons, husbands are always high on the suspect list. Who has a better reason for such a crime? 
Henry Ainsworth had been pondering the problem with more than academic interest for some time. It wasn't that he hated his wife. He simply couldn't stand the sight or sound of her. Even thinking about her made his flesh crawl. If she had been willing to give him a divorce, he'd have been content to wish her all the happiness she was capable of discovering. But Emma, unfortunately, was fond of being his wife. Perhaps she was even fond of him. Worse, she was too rigidly bound to trite morality to give him grounds to sue. There was no hope of her straying. What had been good enough for her mother was good enough for her, and saved all need of thinking. A woman needed a husband. Her place was in the home. Marriage was forever. And what would the neighbors think? Anyhow, she'd have had difficulty being unfaithful, even if she tried. She'd been gaining some ten pounds every year for the eleven years they had been married, and she long since stopped worrying about taking care of her appearance. He looked up at her now, letting the book drop to his lap. She sat watching the television screen with a vacant look on her face, while some comic went through a tired routine. If she enjoyed it, there was no sign, though she spent half her life in front of the screen. Then the comic went off, and dancers came on. She went back to darning a pair of his socks, as seriously as if she didn't know that he had always refused to wear the lumpy results. Her stockings had runs, and she still wore the faded apron in which she'd cooked supper. He contrasted her with Shirley unconsciously, and shuddered. In the years since Shirley Bates had come to work in his rare bookstore, he'd done a lot of such shuddering, and never because of the slim, blonde warmth of his assistant. Since that hot day in August, when they'd closed the shop early and he'd suggested a ride in the country to cool off, he and Shirley... He was interrupted in his more pleasant thoughts by the crash of scissors onto the floor, and his eyes focused on the deepening folds of fat as Emma bent to retrieve them. "'Company coming,' she said, before he could think of anything to prevent the mistaken cliché. Then she became aware that he was staring at her. "'Did you take the garbage out, Henry?' "'Yes, dear,' he answered woodenly. Then, because he knew it was coming anyhow, he filled in the inevitable. "'Cleanliness is next to godliness.' She nodded solemnly and began putting aside her darning. "'That's finished. Mama always said a stitch in time saves nine. If you'd cut your toenails, Henry—' He could feel his skin begin to tingle with irritation. But there was no escape. If he went upstairs to his bedroom— She'd be up at once, puttering about. If he went to the basement, she'd find the canned food needed checking. A woman's place was with her husband, as she'd repeatedly told him. Probably she couldn't stand her own company, either. Then he remembered something he'd stored away. "'There's a new picture at the Metro,' he said as quietly as he could. "'Taylor's starred, I think. I was going to take you before this extra work came up.' He could see her take the bait and nibble at it. She had some vague crush left for Taylor. She stared at the television set, shifted her bulk, and then shook her head reluctantly. It'd be nice, Henry, but going at night costs so much, and, well, a penny saved is a penny earned. Exactly. That's what I meant to say. He even relaxed enough to overlook the platitude, now that there was some hope. I saved the price of lunch today. The nut who wanted king and yellow was so tickled to get the copy finally, he insisted on treating. You can even take a cab home afterwards. That's nice. It'll probably rain the way my bunion's been aching. She considered it a second more before cutting off the television. He watched as she drew off the apron and went for her coat and hat, making a pretense of dabbing on makeup. She might as well have worn the apron, he decided, as she came over to kiss him a damp goodbye. He considered calling Shirley, but her mother was visiting her, and the conversation would have to be too guarded at her end. If he could find some way of getting rid of Emma. It wouldn't even be murder, really. More like destroying a vegetable. Certainly no worse than ending the life of a dumb cow to make man's life more worth living. It wasn't as if she had anything to live for or to contribute. It would almost be a kindness, since she had lived in a perpetual state of vague discontent and unhappiness as if somehow aware that she had lost herself. But, unfortunately, the law wouldn't look at it in such a light. 
He'd only been thinking actively of getting her out of the way since August, however, and somehow with time there must be some foolproof scheme. There was that alcohol injection system, but it required someone who would drink pretty freely first, and Emma was a teetotaler. Maybe, though, if he could get her to taking some of those tonics for women. He dropped it for the moment and turned back to the book. It was an odd old volume he'd received with a shipment for appraisal. There was no title or date, but the strange leather binding showed it was old. Apparently it had been hand-set and printed on some tiny press by the writer, whose name was omitted. It seemed to be a mixture of instructions on how to work spells, conjure demons, and practice witchcraft, along with bitter tirades against the group who had driven the writer out and forced him, as he put it, to enter a compact with the devil for to be a wizard, which is like to a male witch. Henry had been reading it idly, slowly deciding the book was authentic enough, however crazy the writer was. The book had no particular value as a collector's item, but he could probably get a fine price from some of the local cultists, particularly since there were constant promises in it that the writer was going to give a surefire, positive, and simple recipe for conjuring up a demon without need of virgin blood, graveyard earth, or unicorn horn. He skimmed through it, looking for the formula. It turned up on the fifth page from the end, and was everything the writer had claimed. A five-sided figure drawn on the floor with ordinary candle wax, a pinch of sugar inside, a bit of something bitter outside, two odd but simple finger gestures, and a string of words in bad Latin and worse Greek. There was a warning that it would work without the pentagram, sugar, and bitters, but at parlous risk to the conjurer without such protection. He frowned. Too simple for the cultists, he realized, unless he could somehow persuade them that the trick lay in some exact phrasing or gesturing pattern which took experiment. They liked things made difficult, so they'd have a good alibi for their faith when the tricks failed. If he could show them in advance that it didn't work, but hint that a good occultist might figure out the right rhythm or whatever. He read it through again, trying to memorize the whole thing. The gestures were... So, and the words, um, there was no flash of fire, no smell of sulfur, and no clap of thunder. There was simply a tall creature with yellowish skin and flashing yellow eyes standing in front of the television set. His head was completely hairless, and he was so tall that he had to duck slightly to keep from crashing into the ceiling. His features were too sharp for any human face. There were no scales, however. His gold cape and black tights were spangled and he wore green shoes with turned-up toes. But generally, he wasn't bad-looking. "'Mind if I sit down?' the creature asked. He took Henry's assent for granted and dropped into Emma's chair, folding his cape over one arm and reaching for an apple on the side table. "'Glad to see you're not superstitious enough to keep me locked up in one of those damned pentagrams. Drat it, I thought the last copy of that book was burned and I was free. Your signal caught me in the middle of dinner.' Henry swallowed thickly, feeling the sweat trickle down his nose. The book had warned against summoning the demon without the protective devices. But the thing seemed peaceful enough for the moment. He cleared his voice. You mean... you mean magic works? Magic schmagic, the creature snorted. He jerked his thumb toward the television. To old Ephraim, the crackpot who wrote the book before he went completely crazy... That set would have been more magic than I am. I thought this age knew about dimensions, planes of vibrations, and simultaneous universes. You humans always were a backward race, but you seem to be learning the basic facts. Hell, I suppose that means you'll lay a geas on me, after I was hoping it was just an experimental summons. Henry puzzled it over, with some of the fright leaving him. The scientific-sounding terms somehow took some of the magic off the appearance of the thing. You mean those passes and words set up some sort of vibrational pattern? The hairless fellow snorted again and began attacking grapes. Bunk, Henry. Oh, my name's Alfear, by the way. I mean, I was a fool. I should have gone to my psychiatrist and taken a fifty-year course, as he advised. But I thought the books were all burned and nobody knew the summons. So here I am, stuck with the habit. Because that's all it is, a conditioned reflex. 
pure compulsory behavior. I'm sensitized to receive the summons, and when it comes, I teleport into your plane just the way you pull your hand off a hot stove. You read the whole book, I suppose. Yeah, just my luck. Then you know I'm stuck with any job you give me. Practically your slave. I can't even get back without dismissal or finishing your task. That's what comes of saving money by not going to my psychiatrist. He muttered unhappily, reaching for more grapes, while Henry began to decide nothing was going to happen to him, at least physically. Souls were things he wasn't quite sure of, but he couldn't see how just talking to Alfear could endanger his. Still, the creature said thoughtfully, it could be worse. No pentagram. I never did get mixed up with some of the foul odors and messes some of my friends had to take, and I've developed quite a taste for sugar. Tobacco, too. He reached out and plucked a cigarette out of Henry's pack, then a book of matches. He lighted it, inhaled, and rubbed the flame out on his other palm. Kind of weak tobacco, but not bad. Any more questions while I smoke this? There's no free oxygen where I come from, so I can't smoke there. But if you demons answer such, such summons, why don't people know about it now? Henry asked. I think more and more people would be going in for this sort of thing. If the wizards were right all along. They weren't, and we're not demons. It didn't get started until your middle ages. And if it hadn't been for old Apollon, Alfear lighted another cigarette off the butt, which he proceeded to extinguish on the tip of his sharp tongue. He scratched his head thoughtfully, and then went on. Apollon was studying your worship. You see, we've been studying your race the way you study white rats, using lower races to explain our own behavior. Anyhow, he got curious and figured out a way to mentalize himself into your plane. He was sort of a practical joker, you might say. So he picked a time when some half-crazy witch was trying to call up the being you worship as Satan to make some kind of a deal. Just as she finished, he popped up in front of her, spitting out a bunch of phosphorus to make a nice smoke and fire effect, and agreed with all her mumbo-jumbo about having to do what she wanted. She wanted her heart fixed up then, so he showed her how to use belladonna and went back, figuring it was a fine joke. Only he made a mistake. There's something about moving between planes that lowers the resistance to conditioning. Some of our people can take five or six trips, but Apollon was one of those who was so conditioning-prone that he had to have it fixed after the first trip. The next time she did the rigmarole, back he popped. He had to dig up gold for her, hypnotize a local baron into marrying her, and generally keep on the constant kivive, until she got sloppy and forgot the pentagram she thought protected her and which he was conditioned to. But after he disintegrated her, he found she'd passed on the word to a couple of other witches, and he knew somebody at the Institute was bound to find what a fool he'd made of himself. So he began taking members aside and telling them about the trick of getting into your world. Excellent chance for study. Have to humor the humans by sticking to their superstitions, of course. One by one, they went over on little trips. It wasn't hard to find some superstitious dolt trying to summon something, since word had got around in your world. One of us would pop up, and that spread the word further. Anyhow, when Apollon was sure each member had made enough trips to be conditioned, he'd tell them the sad truth, and swear him to secrecy on penalty of being laughed out of the Institute. The old blackguard wound up with all of us conditioned. There was quite a flurry of witchcraft here, until we finally found a psychiatrist who could break the habit for us. Even then, it was tough going. We'd never have made it without the inquisitions and witch burnings one of our experimental sociologists managed to stir up. Alfear put out the third cigarette butt and stood up slowly. Look, I don't mind a chat now and then, but my wives are waiting dinner. How about dismissing me? Um... Henry had been thinking while he listened. It had sounded like a reasonable explanation on the whole, except for the bit about Apollon's disintegrating the witch. Apparently, as long as a man wasn't too unreasonable, there was a certain usefulness to having such friends on call. What about the price for your help? I mean, well, about souls? Alfear twitched his ears disgustedly. What the deuce would I do with your soul, Henry? Eat it? Wear it? <laughs> Don't be a schnook. Well, then, well, I've heard about wishes that were granted, but they all had a trick attached. 
If I asked for immortality, you'd give it, say, but then I'd get some horrible disease and beg and plead for death. Or ask for money and then find the money was recorded as being paid to a kidnapper or something. In the first place, I couldn't give you immortality, Alfeyer said, as patiently as he apparently could. Your metabolism's not like ours. In the second place, why should I look for tainted money? It's enough nuisance doing what you ask without looking for tricks to pull. Anyhow, I told you I half enjoy visiting here. As long as you're reasonable about it, I don't mind keeping my end of the compulsion going. If you've got something to ask, ask away. There are no strings attached. The creature seemed to be quite sincere. Henry considered it briefly, staring at a large tinted picture of Emma, and took the plunge. Suppose I asked you to kill my wife for me, say by what looked like a stroke, so nobody would blame me. That seems reasonable enough, Alfayer agreed easily. I could break a few blood vessels inside her skull. Sure, why not? Only the picture in your mind is so distorted, I wouldn't know her. If she's like that, why'd you ever marry her? Because she seemed different from other women, I guess, Henry admitted. When I tipped the canoe over and figured she'd be mad because her dress was ruined, all she said was something about not being sugar so she wouldn't melt. He shuddered, remembering all the times she'd said it since. You won't have any trouble. Look, can you really read my mind? Naturally, but it's all disorganized. Mm, well, it gave him a queasy feeling to think of anyone seeing his secret thoughts. But this fellow apparently didn't work by human attitudes anyhow. He groped about and then smiled grimly. All right, then. You can tell I think of her as my wife. And just to make sure, she'll be sure to say something about early to bed and early to rise. She says that every single damn night, Alfear. She never misses. Alfear grunted. Sounds more reasonable every minute, Henry. All right, when your wife says that, I pop out and give her a stroke that will kill her. How about dismissing me now? No strings? Henry asked. He watched carefully as Alfayer nodded assent, and he could see no sign of cunning or trickery. He caught his breath, nodded, and closed his eyes. Seeing something vanish was nothing he wanted. Uh, dismissed. The fruit was still gone when he opened his eyes, but there was no other sign of the thing. He found some fruit still in the refrigerator and restocked the bowl. Then he closed the strange book and put it away. He'd have to buy it himself and burn it to make sure no one else found the trick, of course. For a moment, uneasiness pricked at him. Yet he was sure Alfear hadn't been lying, and the story the creature had told made more sense than the older superstitions. Henry adjusted his mind to having a well-conditioned demon on tap and then began the harder job of bracing himself for Emma's incoherent but detailed account of the movie when she came back. Unfortunately, it was a more complicated plot than usual, and she went on and on from the moment she entered the door. He tried to close his ears, but he'd never succeeded in that. He yawned, and she yawned back, but went on until the last final morsel was covered for the second or third time. He was wonderful, she finally concluded. Just wonderful. Only I wished you'd come with me. You'd have liked it, Henry. Did you take the garbage out? Yes, dear, he answered, hours ago. He yawned elaborately again. She mumbled something about having to keep the kitchen clean because cleanliness was next to godliness, but her automatic yawn muffled the words. Then she glanced at the clock. Heavens, it's almost one. And early to bed and early to rise. Henry jerked his eyes away, just as he caught the first glimpse of Alfear popping into existence beside her. He heard the beginning of a shriek change to a horrible gargling and then become a dying moan. Something soft and heavy hit the floor with a dull thud. Henry turned around slowly. Dead, Alfear said calmly, rubbing one of his fingers. This business of getting just one finger through the planes into her head cuts off the circulation. There, that's better. Satisfied? Henry dropped beside the corpse. She was dead, according to the mirror test, and there wasn't a mark on her. He stared at the puffy, relaxed features. He'd expected an expression of horror, but she seemed simply asleep. His initial feeling of pity and contrition vanished. After all, it had been quick and nearly painless. Now he was free. Thanks, Alfair, he said. 
It's fine. Fine. Do I dismiss you now? No need this time. I'm free as soon as the job's done. Unless you'd like to talk a while. Henry shook his head quickly. He had to telephone doctor. Then he could call Shirley. Her mother would be gone by now. Not now. Maybe I'll summon you sometime for a smoke or something, but not now. Okay, Alfayer said and vanished. Surprisingly, seeing him disappear wasn't unpleasant after all. He just wasn't there. Waiting for the doctor was the worst part of it. All the legends Henry knew ran through his mind. Alfayer could have given her a stroke and then added some violent poison that would show up in an autopsy. He could be sitting wherever he was, chuckling because Henry hadn't restricted his wish enough to be safe. Or any of a hundred things could happen. There was the first witch, who had thought she had Apollon under control, only to be turned to dust. But the doctor took it calmly enough. Stroke all right, he decided. I warned her last year as she was putting on too much weight and getting high blood pressure. Uh, too bad, Mr. Amesworth, but there was nothing you could do. I'll turn in a certificate. Want me to contact a mortician for you? Henry nodded, trying to appear properly grief-stricken. I, I'd appreciate it. Too late now, the doctor said, but I'll be glad to send Mr. Glazier around in the morning. He pulled the sheet up over Emma's body, leaving it on the back room couch to which they had carried it. You'd better go to a hotel for the night, and I'll give you something that'll make you sleep. I'd rather not. Henry said quickly. I mean, I'd feel better here, you know. Certainly, certainly. The doctor nodded sympathetically, but as if it were an old story to him. He left the pills with instructions, said the proper things again, and finally went out. Shirley's voice was sleepy and cross when she answered, but it grew alert as soon as he told her about Emma's stroke. He was almost beginning to believe the simple version of the story himself. Poor Henry! she murmured. Her voice sharpened again. It was a stroke? The doctor was sure? Positive, he assured her, cursing himself for having let her guess some of the thoughts that had been on his mind. The doctor said she'd had hypertension and such before. She considered it a second, then a faint laugh sounded. Then I guess there's no use crying over spilled milk, is there, Henry? If it had to happen, it just had to. And I mean, it's like fate, almost. It is fate, he agreed happily. Then he dropped his voice. And now I'm all alone here, baby lamb. And I had to call you up. She caught on at once, as she always did. You can't stay there now. It's so morbid, Henry. You come right over here. Demons, Henry thought, as he drove the car through the quiet residential streets toward her apartment, had their uses. They were a much maligned breed. Probably the people who had summoned them before had been ignorant, stupid people. They'd messed up their chances and brought trouble on themselves by not finding out the facts and putting it all down to superstitious magic. The fellows were almost people, maybe even a little superior to humans. If a man would just try to understand them, they could help him, and with no danger at all. No strings attached, he said to himself and then chuckled softly. It fitted perfectly. Now there were no strings attached to him. Emma was at peace, and he was free. He'd have to wait a few months to marry Shirley legally, of course, but already she was as good as his wife. And if he played up the shock angle just enough, this could be a wonderful evening again. Shirley was unusually lovely when she met him at the door. Her soft golden hair made a halo for her face, a face that said she'd already anticipated his ideas and had decided he was a man who needed sympathy and understanding for what had happened. There was even time for the idea that he was free to be brought up, tentatively at first and then eventually as a matter of course. And the plans expanded as he considered them. There was no need to worry about things now. The quiet marriage became a trip around the world as he confessed to having money that no one knew about. They could close the shop, he could leave town almost at once, and she could follow later. Nobody would know, and they wouldn't have to wait to avoid any scandal. They could be married in two weeks. Henry was just realizing the values of a friendly demon. With proper handling, a lot of purely friendly summoning, and a reasonable attitude, 
There was no reason why Alfayer couldn't provide him with every worldly comfort to share with Shirley. He caught her to him again. My own little wife! That's what you are, Lambkins! What's a mere piece of paper? I already think of you as my wife. I feel you are my wife. That's what counts, isn't it? That's all that counts, she agreed with a warmth that set fire to his blood. Then she gasped. Henry, darling, it's getting light already. You'll have to get back. What will the neighbors say if they see you coming from here now? He tore away reluctantly, swearing at the neighbors. But she was right, of course. He had to go back and take the sleeping medicine to be ready for the arrival of the mortician in the morning. It's still early, he protested, automatically trying to squeeze out a few more minutes. Nobody's up yet. I'll heat up the coffee, and then you have to go, Shirley said firmly, heading for the kitchen. Plenty of people get up early around here. And besides, you need some sleep. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and... From the kitchen came the beginning of a shriek. It changed to a horrible gasp and died away in a failing moan. There was the sound of a body hitting the floor. Alfear stood over Shirley's body, rubbing one finger tenderly. His ears twitched uncertainly as he studied Henry's horror-frozen face. "'I told you,' he said. "'I warned you some of us get conditioned to a habit the first time. "'And you thought of her as your wife, and she said—' "'Abruptly he vanished. "'Henry's screams were the only sound in the apartment.'" End of No Strings Attached by Lester Del Rey Sound of Terror by Don Barry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Benjamin Fuentes The day was still no more than a ragged streak of red in the east. The pre-dawn air was sharply cold, making Johnny Youngbear's face feel slightly brittle as he dressed quietly in the gray bedroom. He sat down in the bed, pulling on his boots, and felt his wife stir sleepily beneath the covers. Suddenly she stiffened, sat upright in the bed, startled into wakefulness. Johnny put one dark, bony hand on her white shoulder, gently reassuring. After a moment, finding herself, she turned away and lit a cigarette. Johnny finished pulling on his boots and stood his hawk-like face unreadable in the cold gray light streaming through the huge picture window. "'Johnny?' said his wife hesitantly. He murmured in acknowledgment, watching the bright flare of color as she drew on the cigarette. Her soft, dark hair was coiled loosely around her shoulders, very black against the pale skin. Her eyes were not invisible in shadow, and Jotty could not read her expression. He turned away, knowing she was watching him. "'Be careful,' she said simply. Try, he said, and then he shrugged. Not my day, anyway. I know, she said, but be careful. He left the house and walked out into the chill desert dawn. He turned his face to the brightness in the east, trying to catch a little warmth, but could not. He warmed up the jeep, listening to the engine grumble protest until it settled to a flat, banging roar. He swerved out of the driveway with a screaming of tires. Reaching the long ribbon of concrete that led out into the desert, he settled down onto the accelerator indifferent to the whining complaint of the jeep's motor. It was eight miles from his sprawling house to the Meza Dry Lake launching site, due east into the sun. He pulled to the top of Six Mile Hill and stopped in the middle of the highway. Two miles ahead was launching base one, throwing long, sharp shadows at him in a rosy dawn light. A cluster of squat gray blockhouses, a long runway tapering into the distance with an Air Force B-52 motionless at the near end. That was all. Except the ship. The ship towered high, dominating the desert like a pinnacle of bright silver. Even silhouetted against the eastern sky, it sparkled and glistened. Impassive it stood, graceful, seeming to strain into the sky, anxious to be off and gone. The loading gantry was a dark, spidery framework beside the ship, leaning against it, drawing strength from its sleek beauty. Johnny watched it in silence for a moment, then turned his eyes up to the sky. Somewhere up there, there was a tiny satellite spun wildly about the earth a little silver ball in some celestial roulette wheel. Gradually it would spiral closer and closer, caught by the planet's implacable grasp, until it flared brightly like a cigarette into the heavens before, dissolving into drops of molten metal. But it would have served its purpose. 
In its short life, it would have given man knowledge, knowledge of space, knowledge enough that he can go himself, knowing what he would find in the emptiness between the earth and the moon, or knowing nearly. What's it like out there? The satellite answered partly. The ship would answer more. Johnny slammed the jeep into gear, hurtled down the other side of Six Mile Hill. Through his mind ran the insistent repetition of an old song he knew, and he hummed it tunelessly through closed teeth. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. The jeep skidded to a halt beside Control. Mitch Campbell's green station wagon was already there, creaking and settling as the motor cooled. Control was full of people. Air Force brass, technicians, observers, enlisted men of indiscernible purpose. The moon hummed with the muted buzz of low, serious conversation. Mitch Campbell sat in one corner, apparently forgotten in the confusion. He had nothing to do. Not yet. He was already in flight dress, holding the massive helmet in his hands morosely, turning it over and over, staring at it as though he thought he might find his head inside if he looked carefully enough. "'Morning, Colonel,' said Johnny, forcing his voice to be casual and cheerful. "'You're up early this morning.' "'Morning, Colonel, yourself,' said Mitch, looking up. "'Big date today?' "'Well, yeah, you might say so,' Mitch said, smiling faintly with obvious effort. "'Thought I might go once around lightly,' he said, hooking his thumb upwards, upwards through the concrete ceiling into the air, through the air up where there was no air for a man to breathe. Once around lightly, around the world lightly. "'Tell you what, Mitch.' "'Okay, tell me what,' he said. "'You like the movies?' Johnny asked. Like to get a little adventure in your soul? Like a little vicarious thrill now and then? Yeah, I like that. Tell you what. We'll go. No, don't thank me. We'll go. Tonight. Eight o'clock. You come by. Wives and everybody? Mitch asked. Why not? Johnny said. They're cooped up in the house all day. They both knew their wives would be in the control in an hour listening to the radio chatter, waiting, eyes wide, shoulders stiff and tight. Fine, said Mitch. Fine. A crew chief came up and touched Johnny's shoulder. Colonel Youngbear, he said. Observation is going up. Johnny stood and looked out the tiny window at the red-painted B-52. See you tonight, Mitch. Eight o'clock. Don't forget. Westerns. See you, said Mitch. He looked back down at the helmet, was turning it over and over again when Johnny left. The observation B-52 climbed, screaming. Johnny lit a cigarette and watched out the port of the contrails rolling straight and white through the jets. He sat by the radio man, a sergeant, ignoring the rest of the officers in a converted bomb bay. "'Hope he makes it, Colonel,' said the sergeant. "'He'll make it,' Johnny said flatly, irritated. Relenting, he added in a gentler tone, the pilot's section breaks away. If he gets in serious trouble, he can dump it and ride the nose down. Like a bird, he'll make it. There was a raucous buzz, and a squawk box said, On my mark, it'll be zero minus four minutes. Mark. The voice of control, 35,000 feet below. The B-52 swing ponderously into the base leg of its circle, and there was a creaking of stretching metal inside. Minus two minutes. Not my day anyway, Johnny thought. He lit another cigarette. Control, said a new voice. This is Red Leader. Red Leader, Red Flight is in position. Rod, Red Leader, Control acknowledged. The observation flight of jet fighters is waiting too. Minus five, four, three, two, one. Mark. Silence. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. There was another rattle of the speaker, and Mitch's voice came through, grunting, heavy as if the acceleration of the ship laid a heavy hand on his chest. Acceleration? 8G. Controls? Respond. Silence. There he is, someone said. A wavering trail of smoke was barely visible below, a thread of white coming up fast, blown erratically by winds into a distorted tiny snake. Altitude! said Mitch's voice. Forty thousand. Acceleration dropping. The white snake wriggled up to their level, rose above them. Johnny could not see the silver head. 
Altitude, 65,000. I have a loud, very high buzz in my headphones. I'm going to... There, it's gone now. Went out of my range. His voice sounded wrong to Johnny, but he couldn't pin it down. Altitude, 105,000. Beginning orbital correction. Beginning... Beginning... I can't. I'm... I'm... The voice became unintelligible. It was pitched very high like a woman's, and it sounded as if his teeth were chattering. Mitch, Johnny pleaded softly. Mitch, baby. Dump it, boy. Come on home now. Dump it. There was no more from the speaker. A confused babble broke out in the bomb bay. The sergeant fiddled with the dials frantically, spinning across wavelengths trying to find a word. The confusion ceased when the speaker rattled again, seeming hours later. Uh, hello? Control? This is Red 3. Do you read me? One of the fighter flight. Rog, Red 3. Go ahead. Can't control his voice from below. Uh, Control? I have a flash and smoke cloud on a bearing of 37 degrees. Red 3. What altitude? What altitude? None, said the fighter pilot. On the deck. After a moment, Johnny climbed unsteadily to his feet in the midst of a booming silence. He made his way back along the catwalk to the head, where he retched violently until the tears came to his eyes. Three weeks later, Johnny sat in Dr. Lambert's office. He watched the lean, graying psychologist turn off the tape recorder, watched him methodically tamp tobacco into his pipe. That's all she wrote, Johnny, said Lambert finally. That recording of Mitch's voice is just about all we have. The ship was under full power when it hit. There wasn't much left. Johnny looked absently out the window at the gleaming needle of Ship 2 beside the flimsy-looking gantry. Full power was a lot of power. The psychologist followed Johnny's eyes. Beautiful, he said, and the word brought to Johnny's mind the wide-eyed, pale face of Mitch's wife, staring at him. That ship is the best we can make her, Lambert said. Engineering is as certain as they can be that there was no structural failure on Ship 1. So, Johnny said, still staring at the ship. Even at this distance, he could almost believe he could see his own lean face reflected in the shining metal. So we look somewhere else for the cause of failure, said Lambert. Where, said Johnny. He turned back, saw that the psychologist was putting a new reel on the tape recorder. The weak link in the control system, Lambert said. There weren't any. One. What? Mitch Campbell. Johnny stood, angry. Mitch was good. Damn good. The psychologist looked up and his eyes were tired. I know it, he said calmly. Listen to this. He started the machine, playing the new tape. Johnny listened to it through. The voice that came out was high and wavering. It shook. It chattered. Words were indistinguishable. It was thin with tension, and it rang in Johnny's ears with unwanted familiarity. What's it sound like to you? Lambert asked when he had finished. Like Mitch's voice, Johnny admitted reluctantly. It did to me, too. What do you think it is? Don't know, said Johnny shortly. Might be a pilot whose plane is shaking apart. No. I don't know. Lambert sat back down behind his desk and sucked on his pipe stem. He regarded John Lean passively, seeming to consider some problem remote from the room. Abruptly, he stood again and went to the window, watching the ant-like activity around the base of Ship 2. That was a madman's voice, he said. I made the recording while I was interning at a state institution. So? Mad with fear, Lambert said. Pure, simple, unadulterated. That was the sound of terror you heard, Johnny. Terror such as few humans have ever known. That man knew such fear he could not remain sane and live with it. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. You think Mitch... You said yourself the voices were alike, Lambert pointed out. I don't believe it. Don't have to, said Lambert, turning from the window. But I'll tell you something, Johnny. That ship? He hooked his thumb out the window. It's a very big toy. Maybe too big. Meaning? Meaning it's possible we've reached beyond man's limitations. Meaning it's possible we've built something too big for a man to handle and stay sane. Maybe we've finally gone too far. Maybe. 
I don't insist it's true, said the psychologist. It's an idea. Fear. Fear of the unknown, maybe. Too much fear to hold. You think I'll crack? asked Johnny. The psychologist didn't answer directly. It's an idea, as I said. I just wanted you to think it over. I will, said Johnny. He stood again, his jaw held tight. Is that all? Yes, Colonel, that's all, said Lambert. When Johnny left, the psychologist sat in brooding silence, staring morosely at a trail of blue smoke rising from his pipe bowl. He sat there until the afternoon light faded from the desert base. Then he stood in the darkened office, sighed, lit his pipe, and went home. He was very tired. Six weeks later, Johnny Young Bear walked out of the control blockhouse into the cold desert morning, carrying his helmet under his arm. He ran his eyes swiftly up the length of the ship, too, trying to forget those other eyes staring at his back from the blockhouse. The ship rippled and gleamed, alive, eager, the thundering power in her belly waiting to be born. Oh, you bitch. You beautiful bitch, Johnny thought. Pregnant with power like a goddess with a god's child. Bitch, bitch, bitch. I love you. I hate you. You kill me. The crew chief walked by his side. Nice morning, Colonel, he said. Very, said Johnny. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. For you, you beautiful bitch. Say something, Colonel, asked the crew chief. No, song running through my head, he explained. Yeah, the other man chuckled. I know how it is. They strapped him into the padded control chair. The controls arranged around him in a neat semicircle, easy to reach. This is my day. They left him, alone, once around lightly. The loneliness was in his belly, aching like a tumor. Read me? Control's voice in his earphones. Loud and clear, he said absently. Minus two minutes. Mark. A different voice. So many different voices. They knew him, they talked to him, but he was alone with his bitch. I had a true wife, but minus one minute. Mark. This is my day. I had a true wife. Three, two, one, mark. There was the sound of the world dying in his mind. The sound of thunder. The sound of the sun splitting. The sound of a goddess giving birth with pain and agony and loneliness. A giant's fist came from out of the nothingness and smashed into his body. His chest was compressed. His face was flattened. He could not get enough air to breathe. The heavy sledge of acceleration crushed him back into the padded chair. Inexorable implacable, relentless, heavy. His vision clouded in red and he thought he would die. Instead, he spoke into the lit mic, resenting it bitterly. Acceleration! 9G! He looked at the gauge that shimmered readily before him, disbelieving. Altitude! 20,000! He blacked out, sinking helplessly into the black, plush night of unawareness. I had a true... I had... I had... Awakening to pain, he glanced at the gauges. He had been gone only a split second. Altitude, 28,000. Acceleration, pressure, dropping. His face began to resume its normal shape as the acceleration dropped. 6G, he said, and breathing was easier. The giant reluctantly began to withdraw his massive fist from Johnny's face. He tipped the lever, watched the artificial horizon tilt slightly. Air control surfaces respond, he said but soon there would be no air for the surfaces to move against, and then he would control by flickering the power that rumbled behind him. Altitude 40,000, 85,000, 100,000. The sky was glistening black. He was passing from the Earth's envelope of the air into the nothingness that was space. Now. Now. Now it was time to change angle. Flatten the ship out, bring it into position to run around the Earth once around lightly. There was a high-pitched scream in his earphones. He remembered it had been there for long and wondered if he had told control. He flicked the switch that ignited the powerful steering rockets and the whine grew louder, unbearably loud. It sang to him, his bitch sang, I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. He began to feel a light tingle over his body, tiny needles delicately jabbing every inch. His face became wooden, felt prickly. He tried to lick his lips and he could feel no sensation there. His vision fogged again, and he knew it was not from acceleration this time. It was something else. Something else. What's it like out there? His belly told him. 
Fear. He reached out his hand to touch the control panel, and his arm did not respond. It was shaking uncontrollably and moved off to the right of where he wanted it to go. When he tried to correct, it swung too far to the left, waving as if it were alive. It hung there before him as in a dream, oscillating back and forth. He could not control his body, and the realization nurtured a tiny seed of panic that lay heavily in his belly. Dump it. What did that mean, dump it? Go home now, baby. I had a true decision. There was a decision he had to make, but he was too frightened to know what it was. He had been born in fear and lived in fear, and his whole body was full of it, quivering to the lover's touch of fear. Falling, darkness, the fear of dying, the unknown, the unimaginable, always lurking just out of the corner of his eye. He wanted to scream, and the fear choked it off. His hands were at his sides, limply, useless, dangling at the seat. He had to hang on to something. His hand found a projection at the side of the seat. He clutched it desperately. He knew he would fall, down, spiraling, weightless off the cliff as if in a dream, off the ladder, the tree. He was a child and his toes were tingling as he stood too near to the edge of the cliff, knowing he might fall. He clutched tightly, putting every ounce of his strength into holding on to the lever, the single solid reality in a world of shifting unreality. He was going to fall. He was falling. I love you. I hate you. I had a true wife. There was a softness beneath his back, and he moved his hands, feeling the crispness of sheets. There was a low murmur of voices. He raised his hands to his eyes, and his voices stopped. There were heavy bandages on his eyes. Colonel? came a questing voice, and Johnny realized it was Dr. Lambert. Awake? I can't see. Why can't I see? You'll be all right. It's all right. What happened? How much do you remember? asked the voice. The blast off? Yes. Yes, I, I remember that. The orbit? The landing? No, he said, not that. You did it, said the voice. You made it. This is my day. Once around lightly. Johnny, said the voice. I don't know just how to say this. We know what was wrong with Ship One and why it killed Mitch. We know. Hell. We don't even begin to realize what we have at our fingertips now. It's so big, it's impossible to evaluate. What? I, I don't... Sound, Johnny. Sound. Or rather, vibration. It's something we're just beginning to learn about. We know a few things. We know you can boil water with sound if the frequency is high enough. And you can drill metal with it, and it does things to the human body. There are frequencies of sound which can act directly on human nerves, directly on the human brain. It means that if we know the right frequency, we'll be able to produce any state we want in a man, any emotion, fear, anguish, anything. When the steering rockets were cut in, the ship began to vibrate. It generated frequencies so high that ordinary human senses couldn't detect them and when your nerves were exposed to those vibrations, it produced fear. Pure and absolute fear. Motor control went, rational processes went, all the nervous functions of your body went out of control. Your body became a giant tuning fork, and the frequency to which it vibrated was fear. I can't remember. Sanity went too, Johnny, said the man softly. You could not stand that fear and remain sane. So something cut off. That was what happened to Mitch. How did I get it back? We don't know. The films show your face suddenly going blank, then you flew. That's all. We hoped you could tell us. No, no, I, I don't remember. There was something in you so strong it overrode everything else. Even the fear. We'd like to know what it is. We'll find out, Johnny. And it will mean a lot to the human race when we do. This is my day. Is my wife here? There was a cool hand on his forehead. Yes, Johnny. Well, he said helplessly. Well, how are you? I'm fine, Johnny, she whispered. And there was a sound of tears in her voice. I'm just fine. He felt the warm softness of her lips on his. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. And then he came home again.
End of Sound of Terror by Don Barry. Recorded by Benjamin Fuentes. Time Enough at Last by Lynn Venable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Time Enough at Last by Lynn Venable The atomic bomb meant, to most people, the end. To Henry Bemis, it meant something far different. A thing to appreciate and enjoy. For a long time, Henry Bemis had an ambition to read a book, not just the title or the preface or a page somewhere in the middle. He wanted to read the whole thing, all the way through from beginning to end. A simple ambition, perhaps, but in the cluttered life of Henry Bemis, an impossibility. Henry had no time of his own. There was his wife, Agnes, who owned that part of it that his employer, Mr. Carsville, did not buy. Henry was allowed enough to get to and from work, that in itself being quite a concession on Agnes's part. Also, nature had conspired against Henry by handing him, with a pair of hopelessly myopic eyes, poor Henry literally couldn't see his hand in front of his face. For a while, when he was very young, his parents had thought him an idiot. When they realized it was his eyes, they got glasses for him. He was never quite able to catch up. There was never enough time. It looked as though Henry's ambition would never be realized. Then something happened which changed all that. Henry was down in the vault of the East Side Bank and Trust when it happened. He had stolen a few moments from the duties of his teller's cage to try to read a few pages of the magazine he had bought that morning. He made an excuse to Mr. Carsville about needing bills in large denominations for a certain customer, and then, safe inside, the dim recesses of the vault he had pulled from inside his coat, the pocket-sized magazine. He had just started a picture article cheerfully, entitled, the new weapons, and what they'll do to you. When all the noise in the world crashed in upon his eardrums, it seemed to be inside of him and outside of him all at once. Then the concrete floor was rising up at him, and the ceiling came slanting down toward him. And for a fleeting second, Henry thought of a story he had started to read once called The Pit and the Pendulum. He regretted in that insane moment that he had never had time to finish that story to see how it came out. Then all was darkness and quiet and unconsciousness. When Henry came to, he knew that something was desperately wrong with the Eastside Bank and Trust. The heavy steel door of the vault was buckled and twisted, and the floor tilted up at a dizzy angle, while the ceiling dipped crazily toward it. Henry gingerly got to his feet, moving arms and legs experimentally. Assured that nothing was broken, he tenderly raised a hand to his eyes. His precious glasses were intact, thank God. He would never have been able to find his way out of the shattered vault without them. He made a mental note to write Dr. Torrance to have a spare pair made and mailed to him. Blasted nuisance, not having his prescription on file locally, but Henry trusted no one but Dr. Torrance to grind those thick lenses into his own complicated prescription. Henry removed the heavy glasses from his face. Instantly, the room dissolved into a neutral blur. Henry saw a pink splash that he knew was his hand, and a white blob come up to meet the pink as he withdrew his pocket handkerchief and carefully dusted the lenses. As he replaced the glasses, they slipped down on the bridge of his nose a little. He had been meaning to have them tightened for some time. He suddenly realized, without the realization actually entering his conscious thoughts, that something momentous had happened. Something worse than the boiler blowing up. Something worse than a gas main exploding. Something worse than anything that had ever happened before. He felt that way because it was so quiet. 
There was no whine of sirens, no shouting, no running, just an ominous and all-pervading silence. Henry walked across the slanting floor, slipping and stumbling on the uneven surface. He made his way to the elevator. The car lay crumpled at the foot of the shaft like a discarded accordion. There was something inside of it that Henry could not look at. Something that had once been a person, or perhaps several people. It was impossible to tell now. Feeling sick, Henry staggered toward the stairway. The steps were still there, but so jumbled and piled back upon one another that it was more like climbing the side of a mountain than mounting a stairway. It was quiet in the huge chamber that had been the lobby of the bank. It looked strangely cheerful, with the sunlight shining through the girders. Where the ceiling had fallen, the dappled sunlight glinted across the silent lobby and everywhere there were huddled lumps of unpleasantness that made Henry sick as he tried not to look at them. Mr. Carsville, he called. It was very quiet. Something had to be done, of course. This was terrible, right in the middle of a Monday, too. Mr. Carsville would know what to do. He called again, more loudly, and his voice cracked hoarsely. Mr. Carsville. And then he saw an arm and shoulder extending out from under a huge fallen block of marble ceiling. In the buttonhole was the white carnation Mr. Carsville had worn to work that morning, and on the third finger of that hand was a massive signet ring, also belonging to Mr. Carsville. Numbly, Henry realized that the rest of Mr. Carsville was under that block of marble. Henry felt a pang of real sorrow. Mr. Carsville was gone, and so was the rest of the staff, Mr. Wilkinson, Mr. Emery, and Mr. Prithard, and the same with Pete and Ralph and Jenkins and Hunter and Pat the guard and Willie the doorman. There was no one to say what was to be done about Eastside Bank and Trust, except Henry Bemis. And Henry wasn't worried about the bank. There was something he wanted to do. He climbed carefully over piles of fallen masonry. Once he stepped down into something that crunched and squashed beneath his feet, and he set his teeth on edge to keep from retching. The street was not much different from the inside. Bright sunlight and so much concrete to crawl over, but the unpleasantness was much, much worse. Everywhere there were strange, motionless lumps that Henry could not look at, Suddenly, he remembered Agnes. He should be trying to get to Agnes, shouldn't he? He remembered a poster he had seen that said, In event of emergency, do not use the telephone. Your loved ones are as safe as you. He wondered about Agnes. He looked at their smashed automobiles, some with their four wheels pointing skyward like the stiffened legs of dead animals. He couldn't get to Agnes now anyway. If she was safe, then she was safe. Otherwise, of course Henry knew Agnes wasn't safe. He had a feeling that there wasn't anyone safe for a long, long way. Maybe not in the whole state, or the whole country, or the whole world. No, that was a thought Henry didn't want to think. He forced it from his mind and turned his thoughts back to Agnes. She had been a pretty good wife, now that it was all said and done, it wasn't exactly her fault if people didn't have time to read nowadays. It was just that there was the house and the bank and the yard. There were the Joneses for Bridge and the Graysons, for Canasta and Charades with the Bryants, and the television. The television Agnes loved to watch, but would never watch alone. He never had time to read even a newspaper. He started thinking about last night. That business about the newspaper. Henry had settled into his chair quietly, afraid that a creaking spring might call to Agnes' attention, the fact that he was momentarily unoccupied. He had unfolded a newspaper slowly and carefully. The sharp crackle of the paper would have been a clarion call to Agnes. He had glanced at the headlines of the first page, Collapse of Conference Imminent, 
He didn't have time to read the article. He turned to the second page. Salon predicts war only days away. He flipped through the pages faster, reading brief snatches here and there, afraid to spend too much time on any one item. On a back page was a brief article entitled "Prehistoric Artifacts Unearthed in Yucatan." Henry smiled to himself and carefully folded the sheet of paper into fourths. That would be interesting. He would read all of it. Then it came, Agnes's voice, Henry, and then she was upon him. She lightly flicked the paper out of his hands and into the fireplace. He saw the flames lick up and curl possessively around the unread article. Agnes continued, Henry, tonight is the Jones's Bridge night. They'll be here in thirty minutes, and I'm not dressed yet. And here you are reading. She had emphasized the last word as though it were an unclean act. Hurry and shave. You know how smooth Jasper Jones' chin always looks. And then straighten up this room. She glanced regretfully toward the fireplace. Oh dear, that paper, the television schedule. Oh well, after the Jones leave, there won't be time for anything but the late night movie. Don't just sit there, Henry. Hurry. Henry was hurrying now. But hurrying too much, he cut his leg on a twisted piece of metal that had once been an automobile fender. He thought about things like lockjaw and gangrene, and his hand trembled as he tied his pocket handkerchief around the wound. In his mind, he saw the fire again, looking across the face of last night's newspaper. He thought that now he would have time to read all the newspapers he wanted to. Only now there wouldn't be any more. That heap of rubble across the street had been the Gazette building. It was terrible to think that there would never be another up-to-date newspaper. Agnes would have been very upset. No television schedule, but then of course no television. He wanted to laugh, but he didn't. That would have been fitting. Not at all. He could see the building he was looking for now, but the silhouette was strangely changed. The great circular dome was now a ragged semicircle. Half of it gone, and one of the great wings of the building had fallen in upon itself. A sudden panic gripped Henry Bemis. What if they were all ruined, destroyed, every one of them? What if there wasn't a single one left? Tears of helplessness welled in his eyes as he painfully fought his way over and through the twisted fragments of the city. He thought of the building. When it had been whole, he remembered many nights he had paused outside his wide and welcoming doors. He thought of the warm nights and the doors had been thrown open, and he could see the people inside, see them sitting at the plain wooden tables with the stacks of books beside them. He used to think, then, what a wonderful thing a public library was—a place where anybody, anybody at all, could go in and read. He had been tempted to enter many times. He had watched the people through the open doors, the man in the greasy work clothes who sat near the door, night after night, laboriously studying, a technical journal perhaps, difficult for him, but promising a brighter future. There had been an aged, scholarly gentleman who sat on the other side of the door, leisurely paging, moving his lips a little as he did. So, a man having little time left, but rich in time because he could do with it as he chose. Henry had never gone in. He had started up the steps once, got almost to the door, but then he remembered Agnes, her questions and shouting, and he had turned away. He was going in now, though, almost crawling, his breath coming in stabbing gasps, his hands torn and bleeding. His trouser leg was sticky red where the wound in his leg had soaked through the handkerchief. It was throbbing badly, but Henry didn't care. He had reached his destination. Part of the inscription was still there, over the now doorless entrance. Public Libra. The rest had been torn away. The place was in shambles. The shelves were overturned, broken, smashed. Tilted, 
their precious contents spilled in disorder upon the floor. A lot of the books, Henry noted, gleefully, were still intact, still whole, still readable. He was literally knee-deep in them. He wallowed in books. He picked one up. The title was Collected Works of William Shakespeare. Yes, he must read that sometime. He laid it aside carefully. He picked up another, Spinoza. He tossed it away, seized another, and another, and still another. Which to read first? There were so many. He had been conducting himself a little like a starving man and a delicatessen, grabbing a little of this and a little of that, and a frenzy of enjoyment. But now he steadied away from the pile about him. He selected one volume, sat comfortably down on an overturned shelf, and opened the book. Henry Bemis smiled. There was the rumble of complaining stone, minute in comparison, which the epic complaints following the fall of the bomb. This one occurred under one corner of the shelf upon which Henry sat. The shelf moved, threw him off balance. The glasses slipped from his nose and fell with a tinkle. He bent down, clawing blindly, and found, finally, their smashed remains. A minor indirect destruction, stemming from the sudden, wholesale smashing of a city, but the only one that greatly interested Henry Bemis. He stared down at the blurred page before him. He began to cry. The End End of Time Enough at Last by Lynn Venable The Star by H. G. Wells This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sam Bartle The Star by H. G. Wells It was on the first day of the new year that the announcement was made, almost simultaneously from three observatories, that the motion of the planet Neptune, the outermost of all the planets that wheel about the sun, had become very erratic. Ogilvy had already called attention to a suspected retardation in its velocity in December. Such a piece of news was scarcely calculated to interest a world the greater portion of whose inhabitants were unaware of the existence of the planet Neptune, nor outside the astronomical profession did the subsequent discovery of a faint remote speck of light in the region of the perturbed planet cause any very great excitement. Scientific people, however found the intelligence remarkable enough, even before it became known that the new body was rapidly growing larger and brighter, that its motion was quite different from the orderly progress of the planets, and that the deflection of Neptune and its satellite was becoming now of an unprecedented kind. Few people without a training in science can realise the huge isolation of the solar system. The sun, with its specks of planets, its dust of planetoids, and its impalpable comets, swims in a vacant immensity that almost defeats the imagination. Beyond the orbit of Neptune there is space, vacant so far as human observation has penetrated, without warmth or light or sound, blank emptiness, for twenty million times a million miles. That is the smallest estimate of the distance to be traversed before the very nearest of the stars is attained. And, saving a few comets more unsubstantial than the thinnest flame, no matter had ever to human knowledge crossed this gulf of space, until early in the twentieth century this strange wanderer appeared. A vast mass of matter, it was bulky, heavy, rushing without warning, out of the black mystery of the sky, into the radiance of the sun. By the second day it was clearly visible to any decent instrument, 
as a speck with a barely sensible diameter in the constellation Leo near Regulus. In a little while, an opera glass could attain it. On the third day of the new year, the newspaper readers of two hemispheres were made aware for the first time of the real importance of this unusual apparition in the heavens. A planetary collision, one London paper headed the news, and proclaimed Duchenne's opinion that this strange new planet would probably collide with Neptune. The leader writers enlarged upon the topic, so that in most of the capitals of the world, on January the 3rd, there was an expectation however vague, of some imminent phenomenon in the sky. And as the night followed the sunset round the globe, thousands of men turned their eyes skyward to see the old familiar stars, just as they had always been. Until it was dawn in London and Pollock's setting, and the stars overhead grown pale. The winter's dawn it was, a sickly filtering accumulation of daylight, and the light of gas and candles shone yellow in the windows to show where people were astir. But the yawning policemen saw the thing. The busy crowds in the markets stopped to gape. Workmen going to their work, betimes. Milkmen, the drivers of news carts. Dissipation going home jaded and pale. Homeless wanderers, sentinels on their beats. And in the country, labourers, trudging afield. Poachers slinking home. All over the dusky, quickening country it could be seen, and out at sea by seamen watching for the day. A great white star comes suddenly into the westward sky. Brighter it was than any star in our skies, brighter than the evening star at its brightest. It still glowed, out white and large, no mere twinkling spot of light, but a small, round, clear, shining disk. An hour after the day had come, and where science has not reached, men stared and feared, telling one another of the wars and pestilences that are foreshadowed by these fiery signs in the heavens. Sturdy boars, dusky hottentots, Gold Coast Negroes, Frenchmen, Spaniards, Portuguese, stood in the warmth of the sunrise, watching the setting of this strange new star. And in a hundred observatories there had been suppressed excitement, rising almost to shouting pitch, as the two remote bodies had rushed together, and a hurrying to and fro to gather photographic apparatus and spectroscope, and this appliance and that, to record this novel astonishing sight, the destruction of a world. For it was a world, a sister planet of our Earth, far greater than our Earth indeed that had so suddenly flashed into flaming death. Neptune, it was, had been struck, fairly and squarely, by the strange planet from outer space, and the heat of the concussion had incontinently turned two solid globes into one vast mass of incandescence. Round the world that day, two hours before the dawn, went the pallid great white star, fading only as it sank westward and the sun mounted above it. Everywhere men marvelled at it, but of all those who saw it, none could have marvelled more than those sailors, habitual watchers of the stars, who far away at sea had heard nothing of its advent, and saw it now rise like a pygmy moon, and climb zenithward, and hang overhead, and sink westward with the passing of the night. And when next it rose over Europe, everywhere were crowds of watchers on hilly slopes, on house roofs, in open spaces, staring eastward for the rising of the great new star. It rose with a white glow in front of it, like the glare of a white fire, and those who had seen it come into existence the night before cried out at the sight of it. It is larger, they cried. It is brighter. And, indeed, the moon, a quarter full and sinking in the west, was in its apparent size beyond comparison but scarcely in all its breadth had it as much brightness now as the little circle of the strange new star. "'It is brighter!' cried the people clustering in the streets. But in the dim observatories the watchers held their breath and peered at one another. "'It is nearer,' they said. "'Nearer!' And voice after voice repeated. "'It is nearer!' 
and the clicking telegraph that took up, and it trembled along telephone wires, and in a thousand cities grimy compositors fingered the type. It is nearer. Men writing in offices, struck with a strange realisation, flung down their pens. Men talking in a thousand places suddenly came upon a grotesque possibility in those words. It is nearer. It hurried along, wakening streets. It was shouted down the frost-stilled ways of quiet villages. Men who had read these things, from the throbbing tape, stood in yellow-lit doorways, shouting the news to the passers-by. It is nearer. Pretty women, flushed and glittering, heard the news, told jestingly between the dances, and feigned an intelligent interest they did not feel. Nearer! Indeed! How curious! How very, very clever people must be to find out things like that! Lonely tramps faring through the wintry night murmured those words to comfort themselves, looking skyward. It has need to be nearer, for the night's as cold as charity. Don't see much warmth from it if it is nearer, all the same. What is a new star to me? cried the weeping woman, kneeling beside her dead. The schoolboy, rising early for his examination work, puzzled it out for himself, with the great white star shining broad and bright through the frost flowers of his window. Centrifugal, centripetal, he said, with his chin on his fist. Stop a planet in its flight, rob it of its centrifugal force, what then? Centripetal has it, and down it falls into the sun. And this, do we come in the way, I wonder? The light of that day went the way of its brethren, and with the later watches of the frosty darkness rose the strange star again. And it was now so bright that the waxing moon seemed but a pale yellow ghost of itself, hanging huge in the sunset. In a South African city a great man had married, and the streets were alight to welcome his return with his bride. Even the skies have illuminated, said the flatterer. Under Capricorn, two negro lovers, daring the wild beasts and evil spirits for love of one another, crouched together in a cane brake, where the fireflies hovered. That is our star, they whispered, and felt strangely comforted by the sweet brilliance of its light. The master mathematician sat in his private room and pushed the papers from him. His calculations were already finished. In a small white file, there still remained a little of the drug that had kept him awake and active for four long nights. Each day, serene, explicit, patient as ever, he had given his lecture to his students, and then had come back at once to this momentous calculation. His face was grave, a little drawn and hectic from his drugged activity. For some time he seemed lost in thought. Then he went to the window, and the blind went up with a click. Halfway up the sky, over the clustering roofs, chimneys and steeples of the city, hung the star. He looked at it as one might look into the eyes of a brave enemy. You may kill me, he said after a silence, but I can hold you, and all the universe for that matter, in the grip of this little brain. I would not change, even now. He looked at the little file. There will be no need of sleep again, he said. The next day at noon, punctual to the minute, he entered his lecture theatre, put his hat on the end of the table as his habit was, and carefully selected a large piece of chalk. It was a joke among his students that he could not lecture without that piece of chalk to fumble in his fingers, and once he had been stricken to impotence by their hiding his supply. He came and looked under his grey eyebrows at the rising tears of young fresh faces, and spoke with his accustomed studied commonness of phrasing. Circumstances have arisen. Circumstances beyond my control, he said, and paused, which will debar me from completing the course I had designed. 
It would seem, gentlemen, if I may put the thing clearly and briefly, that man has lived in vain. The students glanced at one another. Had they heard aright? Mad? Raised eyebrows and grinning lips there were, but one or two faces remained intent upon his calm, grey, fringed face. It will be interesting, he was saying, to devote this morning to an exposition, so far as I can make it clear to you, of the calculations that have led me to this conclusion. Let us assume... He turned towards the blackboard, meditating a diagram in the way that was usual to him. What was that about? Lived in vain, whispered one student to another. Listen, said the other, nodding towards the lecturer. And presently they began to understand. That night the star rose later, for its proper eastward motion had carried it some way across Leo towards Virgo, and its brightness was so great that the sky became a luminous blue as it rose, and every star was hidden in its turn, save only Jupiter near the zenith, Capella, Aldebaran, Sirius and the pointers of the bear. It was very white and beautiful. In many parts of the world, that night, a pallid halo encircled it about. It was perceptibly larger. In the clear, refractive sky of the tropics, it seemed as if it were nearly a quarter the size of the moon. The frost was still on the ground in England, but the world was as brightly lit as if it were midsummer moonlight. One could see to read quite ordinary print by that cold, clear light, and in the cities the lamps burnt yellow and wan. And everywhere the world was awake that night, and throughout Christendom a sombre murmur hung in the keen air over the countryside, like the belling of bees in the heather, and this murmurous tumult grew to a clangour in the cities. It was the tolling of the bells, in a million belfry towers and steeples, summoning the people to sleep no more, to sin no more, but to gather in their churches and pray. And overhead, growing larger and brighter as the earth rolled on its way, and the night passed, rose the dazzling star. And the streets and houses were alight in all the cities, the shipyards glared, and whatever roads led to high country were lit and crowded all night long. And in all the seas about the civilised lands, ships with throbbing engines and ships with bellying sails, crowded with men and living creatures, were standing out to ocean and the north, for already the warning of the master mathematician had been telegraphed all over the world, and translated into a hundred tongues. The new planet and Neptune, locked in a fiery embrace, were whirling headlong, ever faster and faster, towards the sun. Already every second this blazing mass flew a hundred miles, and every second its terrific velocity increased. As it flew now, indeed, it must pass a hundred million of miles wide of the earth and scarcely affect it. But near its destined path, as yet only slightly perturbed, spun the mighty planet Jupiter, and his moons sweeping splendid around the sun. Every moment now the attraction between the fiery star and the greatest of the planets grew stronger. And the result of that attraction... Inevitably, Jupiter would be deflected from its orbit into an elliptical path, and the burning star swung by his attraction wide of its sunward rush would describe a curved path, and perhaps collide with, and certainly pass very close to, our Earth. Earthquakes, volcanic outbreaks, cyclones, sea waves, floods, and a steady rise in temperature to I know not what limit, so prophesied the master mathematician. And overhead, to carry out his words, lonely and cold and livid, blazed the star of the coming doom. To many who stared at it that night until their eyes ached, it seemed that it was visibly approaching. And that night too, the weather changed, and the frost that had gripped all central Europe and France and England softened towards the thaw. 
But you must not imagine, because I have spoken of people praying through the night, and people going aboard ships, and people fleeing towards mountainous country, that the whole world was already in a terror, because of the star. As a matter of fact, use and want still ruled the world, and save for the talk of idle moments and the splendour of the night, nine human beings out of ten were still busy at their common occupations. In all the cities, the shops, save one here and there, opened and closed at their proper hours. The doctor and the undertaker plied their trades. The workers gathered in the factories. Soldiers drilled. Scholars studied. Lovers sought one another. Thieves lurked and fled. Politicians planned their schemes. The presses of the newspapers roared through the night, and many a priest of this church and that would not open his holy building to further what he considered a foolish panic. The newspapers insisted on the lesson of the year 1000, for then, too, people had anticipated the end. The star was no star, mere gas, a comet, and were it a star it could not possibly strike the earth. There was no precedent for such a thing. Common sense was sturdy everywhere, scornful jesting, a little inclined to persecute the obdurate fearful. That night, at 7.15 by Greenwich time, the star would be at its nearest to Jupiter. Then the world would see the turn things would take. The master mathematician's grim warnings were treated by many as so much mere elaborate self-advertisement. Common sense at last, a little heated by argument, signified its unalterable convictions by going to bed. So, too, barbarism and savagery, already tired of the novelty, went about their nightly business, and save for a howling dog here and there, the beast world left the star unheeded. And yet, when at last the watchers in European states saw the star rise, an hour later, it is true, but no larger than it had been the night before, there was still plenty awake to laugh at the master mathematician, to take the danger as if it had passed. But hereafter, the laughter ceased. The star grew. It grew with a terrible steadiness, hour after hour. A little larger each hour. A little nearer the midnight zenith. And brighter and brighter, until it had turned night into a second day. Had it come straight to the earth instead of in a curved path, had it lost no velocity to Jupiter, it must have leapt the intervening gulf in a day. But as it was, it took five days altogether to come by our planet. The next night it had become a third the size of the moon before it set to English eyes, and the thaw was assured. It rose over America near the size of the moon, but blinding white to look at. And hot! And a breath of hot wind blew now with its rising and gathering strength. And in Virginia, and Brazil, and down the St. Lawrence Valley, it shone intermittently through a driving reek of thunderclouds, flickering violet lightning, and hail unprecedented. In Manitoba was a thaw and devastating floods, and upon all the mountains of the earth the snow and ice began to melt that night, and all the rivers coming out of high country flowed thick and turbid, and soon, in their upper reaches, with swirling trees and the bodies of beasts and men, they rose steadily, steadily in the ghostly brilliance, and came trickling over their banks at last, behind the flying population of their valleys. And along the coast of Argentina, and up the South Atlantic, the tides were higher than had ever been in the memory of man, and the storms drove the waters in many cases, scores of miles inland, drowning whole cities. And so great grew the heat during the night, that the rising of the sun was like the coming of a shadow. The earthquakes began and grew until all down America, from the Arctic Circle to Cape Horn, hillsides were sliding, fissures were opening, and houses and walls crumbling to destruction. The whole side of Cotopaxi slipped out in one vast convulsion, and a tumult of lava poured out so high and broad and swift and liquid that in one day it reached the sea. So the star, 
with the one moon in its wake, marched across the Pacific, trailed the thunderstorms like the hem of a robe, and the growing tidal wave that toiled behind it, frothing and eager, poured over island and island, and swept them clear of men. Until that wave came at last, in a blinding light and with the breath of a furnace, swift and terrible it came, a wall of water, fifty feet high, roaring hungrily upon the long coasts of Asia, and swept inland across the plains of China. For a space the star, hotter now and larger and brighter than the sun in its strength, showed with pitiless brilliance the wide and populous country, towns and villages with their pagodas and trees, roads, wide cultivated fields, millions of sleepless people staring in helpless terror at the incandescent sky. And then, low and growing, came the murmur of the flood. And thus it was with millions of men that night, a flight now wither, with limbs heavy with heat and breath fierce and scant, and the flood like a wall swift and white behind. And then death. China was lit glowing white, but over Japan and Java and all the islands of Eastern Asia, the great star was a ball of dull red fire, because of the steam and smoke and ashes the volcanoes were spouting forth to salute its coming. Above was the lava, hot gases and ash, and below the seething floods, and the whole earth swayed and rumbled with the earthquake shocks. Soon the immemorial snows of Tibet and the Himalaya were melting and pouring down by ten million deepening converging channels upon the plains of Burma and the Hindustan. The tangled summits of the Indian jungles were aflame in a thousand places, and below the hurrying waters around the stems were dark objects that still struggled feebly and reflected the blood-red tongues of fire, and in a rudderless confusion a multitude of men and women fled down the broad riverways to that one last hope of men, the open sea. Larger grew the star, and larger, hotter and brighter with a terrible swiftness now. The tropical ocean had lost its phosphorence, and the whirling steam rose in ghostly wreaths from the black waves that plunged incessantly, speckled with storm-tossed ships. And then came a wonder. It seemed to those who in Europe watched for the rising of the star that the world must have ceased in its rotation. In a thousand open spaces of down and upland, the people who had fled thither from the floods and the falling houses and sliding slopes of hill watched for that rising in vain. Hour followed hour through a terrible suspense, and the star rose not. Once again men set their eyes upon the old constellations they had counted lost to them forever. In England it was hot and clear overhead, though the ground quivered perpetually. But in the tropics, Sirius and Capella and Aldebaran showed through a veil of steam. And when at last the great star rose near ten hours late, the sun rose close upon it, and in the centre of its white heart was a disk of black. Over Asia it was the star had begun to fall, behind the movement of the sky. And then suddenly, as it hung over India, its light had been veiled. All the plain of India, from the mouth of the Indus to the mouths of the Ganges, was a shallow waste of shining water that night, out of which rose temples and palaces, mounds and hills, black with people. Every minaret was a clustering mass of people who fell one by one into the turbid waters, as heat and terror overcame them. The whole land seemed a wailing, and suddenly there swept a shadow across that furnace of despair, and a breath of cold wind, and a gathering of clouds, out of the cooling air. Men looking up, near blinded, at the star, saw that a black disk was creeping across the light. It was the moon, coming between the star and the earth. And even as men cried to God at this respite, out of the east with a strange, inexplicable swiftness, sprang the sun. And then star, sun and moon rushed together across the heavens. So it was that presently to the European watchers, star and sun rose close upon each other, drove headlong for a space and then slower, 
and at last came to rest, star and sun merged into one glare of flame at the zenith of the sky. The moon no longer eclipsed the star, but was lost to sight in the brilliance of the sky. And though those who were still alive regarded it for the most part with that dull stupidity that hunger, fatigue, heat and despair engender, there were still men who could perceive the meaning of these signs. Star and earth had been at their nearest, had swung about one another, and the star had passed. Already it was receding, swifter and swifter, in the last stage of its headlong journey, downward into the sun. And then the clouds gathered, blotting out the vision of the sky. The thunder and lightning wove a garment around the world. All over the earth was such a downpour of rain, as men had never before seen, and where the volcanoes flared red against the cloud canopy, there descended torrents of mud. Everywhere the waters were pouring off the land, leaving mud-silted ruins and the earth littered like a storm-worn beach, with all that had floated, and the dead bodies of the men and brutes, its children. For days the water streamed off the land, sweeping away soil and trees and houses in the way, and piling huge dikes and scooping out titanic gullies over the countryside. Those were the days of darkness that followed the star and the heat. All through them, and for many weeks and months, the earthquakes continued. But the star had passed, and men, hunger-driven and gathering courage, only slowly, might creep back to their ruined cities, buried granaries and sodden fields. Such few ships as had escaped the storms of that time came stunned and shattered and sounding their way cautiously through the new marks and shoals of once familiar ports. And as the storms subsided, men perceived that everywhere the days were hotter than of yore, and the sun larger, and the moon shrunk to a third of its former size, took now fourscore days between its new and new. But of the new brotherhood that grew presently among men, of the saving of laws and books and machines, of the strange change that had come over Iceland and Greenland, and the shores of Baffin's Bay, so that the sailors coming there presently found them green and gracious, and could scarce believe their eyes. This story does not tell. Nor of the movement of mankind, now that the earth was hotter, northward and southward, toward the poles of the earth. It concerns itself only with the coming and the passing of the star. The Martian astronomers, for there are astronomers on Mars, although they are very different beings from men, were naturally profoundly interested by these things. They saw them from their own standpoint, of course. Considering the mass and temperature of the missile that was flung through our solar system into the sun, one wrote, it is astonishing what a little damage the earth, which it missed so narrowly, has sustained. All the familiar continental markings and the masses of the seas remain intact, and indeed the only difference seems to be a shrinkage of the white discoloration, supposed to be frozen water, round either pole, which only shows how small the vastest of human catastrophes may seem at a distance of a few million miles. End of the Star by H. G. Wells We Gone Square Roots by Russell Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Week on Square Roots by Russell Burton. Does your wife call you Pumpkinhead? Well, maybe it's not an insult. It might be a pet name, but whose pet name? As his coach sped through dusk-darkened Jersey meadows, Ronald Lovegear, 14 years with Allied Electronics, embraced his burden with both arms, silently cursing the engineer who was deliberately rocking the train. In his thin chest, he nursed the conviction that someday there would be an intelligent robot at the throttle of the 510 to Philadelphia. He carefully moved one hand and took a notebook from his pocket, 
That would be a good thing to mention at the office next Monday. Again, he congratulated himself for having induced his superiors to let him take home the company's most highly developed mechanism to date. He had already forgiven himself for the little white lie that morning. Pascal, he had told them, is a little weak on square roots. That had done it. Old Hardwick would never permit an allied computer to hit the market that was not the absolute master of square roots. If Love Gear wanted to work on Pascal on his own time, it was fine with the boss. Ronald Lovegear consulted his watch. He wondered if his wife would be on time. He had told Corinne twice over the phone to bring the station wagon to meet him. But she had been so forgetful lately, it was probably the new house. Six rooms to keep up without a maid was quite a chore. His pale eyes blinked. He had a few ideas along that line, too. He smiled and gave the crate a gentle pat. Corinne was at the station, and she had brought the station wagon. Lovegear managed to get the crate to the stairs of the coach, where he consented to the assistance of a porter. It's not really heavy, he told Corinne, as he and the porter waddled through the crowd. Actually, only 57 pounds, four ounces. Aluminum casing, you know. No, I didn't, began Corinne. But it's delicate, he continued. If I should drop this, he shuddered. After the crate had been placed lengthwise in the rear of the station wagon, Corinne watched Ronald tuck a blanket around it. It's not very cold, Ronald. I don't want it to get bounced around, he said. Now, please, Corinne, do drive carefully. Not until she had driven half a block did he kiss her on the cheek. Then he glanced anxiously over his shoulder at the rear seat. Once he thought Corinne hit a rut, that could have been avoided. Long after Corinne had retired that night, she heard Ronald pounding with a brass hammer down in his den. At first she had insisted he take the crate out to his workshop. He looked at her with scientific aloofness and asked if she had the slightest conception of what this is worth. She hadn't, and she went to bed. It was only another one of his gestures, which was responsible for these weird dreams. That night, she dreamed Ronald brought home a giant octopus, which insisted on doing the dishes for her. In the morning, she woke up feeling unwanted. Downstairs, Ronald had already put on the coffee. He was wearing his robe, and the pinched grayness of his face told Corinne he had been up half the night. He poured coffee for her, smiling, wanely. If I have any commitments today, Corinne, will you please see that they are taken care of? But you were supposed to get the wallpaper for the guest room. I know, I know, dear, but time is so short. They might want Pascal back any day. For the next week or two, I shall want to devote most of my time. Pascal? Yes, the machine, the computer. He smiled at her ignorance. We usually name the expensive jobs, you see... A computer of this nature is really the heart and soul of the mechanical man we will construct. Corinne didn't see. But in a few minutes, she strolled toward the den, balancing her coffee in both hands. With one elbow, she eased the door open. There it was, an innocent polished cabinet reaching up to her shoulders. Ronald had removed one of the plates from its side, and she peeped into the section where the heart and soul might be located. She saw only an anatomical array of vacuum tubes and electrical relays. She felt Ronald at her back. It looks like the inside of a jukebox, she said. He beamed. The same relay systems used in the simple jukebox are incorporated in a computer. He placed one hand lovingly on top of the cabinet. But, Ronald, it doesn't even resemble a mechanical man. That's because it doesn't have any appendages as yet, you know, arms and legs. That's a relatively simple adjustment. He winked at Corinne with a great air of complicity. And I have some excellent ideas along that line. Now run along, because I'll be busy most of the day. Corinne ran along. She spent most of the day shopping for weekend necessities. On an irrational last-minute impulse perhaps an unconscious surrender to the machine age. She dug in the grocery deep freeze and brought out a couple of purple steaks. That evening, she had to call three times for dinner. 
and when he came out of the den, she noticed that he had closed the door the way one does upon a small child. He chattered about inconsequential matters all through dinner. Corinne knew that his work was going smoothly. A few minutes later, she was to know how smoothly. It started when she began to put on her apron to do the dishes. Let that go for now, dear, Ronald said, taking the apron from her. He went into the den, returning with a small black box covered with push buttons. Now observe carefully, he said. His voice pitched high. He pushed one of the buttons, waited a second with his ear cocked toward the den, then pushed another. Corinne heard the turning of metal against metal, and she slowly turned her head. Oh, she suppressed a shriek, clutching Ronald's arm so tightly he almost dropped the control box. Pascal was walking under his own effort, considerably taller now with the round aluminum legs Ronald had given him. Two metal arms also hung at the sides of the cabinet. One of these rose stiffly, as though for balance. Corinne's mouth opened as she watched the creature jerk awkwardly across the living room. Oh, Ronald, the fishbowl. Ronald stabbed knowingly at several buttons. Pascal pivoted toward them, but not before his right arm swung out and almost contemptuously brushed the fishbowl to the floor. Corinne closed her eyes at the crash. Then she scooped up several little golden bodies and rushed for the kitchen. When she returned, Ronald was picking up pieces of glass and dabbing at the pool of water with one of her bathroom towels. Pascal, magnificently aloof, was standing in the center of the mess. I'm sorry. Ronald looked up. It was my fault. I got confused on the buttons. But Corinne's glances toward the rigid Pascal held no indictment. She was only mystified. There was something wrong here. But Ronald, he's so ugly without a head. I thought that all robots... Oh no, he explained. We put heads on them for display purposes only. Admittedly, that captures the imagination of the public. That little adapter shaft at the top should be the neck, of course. He waved Corinne aside and continued his experiments with the homemade robot. Pascal moved in controlled spasms around the living room. Once he walked just a little too close to the floor-length window, and Corinne stood up nervously, but Ronald apparently had mastered this little black box. With complete confidence, Corinne went into the kitchen to do the dishes, not until she was elbow-deep in suds did she recall her dreams about the octopus. She looked over her shoulder, and the curious, unwanted feeling came again. The following afternoon, after Ronald had canceled their Sunday drive into the country, Pascal, with constant exorations by Ronald at the black box, succeeded in vacuum-cleaning the entire living room. Ronald was ecstatic. Now do you understand? He asked Corinne. A mechanical servant. Think of it. Of course, mass production may be years away, but... Everyone will have Thursday nights off, said Corinne. But Ronald was already jabbing at buttons as Pascal dragged the vacuum cleaner back to its niche in the closet. Later, Corinne persuaded Ronald to take her to a movie, but not until the last moment was she certain that Pascal wasn't going to drag along. Every afternoon of the following week, Ronald Lovegear called from the laboratory in New York to ask how Pascal was getting along. Just fine, Corinne told him on Thursday afternoon. But he certainly ruined some of the tomato plants in the garden. He just doesn't seem to hoe in a straight line. Are you certain it's the green button I push? It's probably one of the pressure regulators, interrupted Ronald. I'll check it when I get home. Corinne suspected by his lowered voice that Mr. Hardwick had walked into the lab. That night, Pascal successfully washed and dried the dishes, cracking only one cup in the process. Corinne spent the rest of the evening sitting in the far corner of the living room, thumbing the pages of a magazine. On the following afternoon, prompted perhaps by that perverse female trait which demands completion of all projects once started, Corinne lingered for several minutes in the vegetable department at the grocery. She finally picked out a fresh, round, and blushing pumpkin. Later in her kitchen, humming a little tune under her breath, 
Karen deftly maneuvered a paring knife to transform the pumpkin into a very reasonable facsimile of a man's head. She placed the pumpkin over the tiny shaft between Pascal's box-shaped shoulders and stepped back. She smiled at the moon-faced idiot grinning back at her. He was complete and not bad-looking, but just before she touched the red button once and the blue button twice, which sent Pascal stumbling out to the backyard to finish weeding, the circle of pansies before dinner. She wondered about the gash that was his mouth. She distinctly remembered carving it so that the ends curved upward into a frozen and quite harmless smile. But one end of the toothless grin seemed to sag a little, like the cynical smile of one who knows his powers have been underestimated. Corinne would not have had to worry about her husband's reaction to the new vegetable top Pascal. Ronald accepted the transformation good-naturedly, thinking that a little levity once in a while was a good thing. And after all, said Corinne later that evening, I'm the one who has to spend all day in this house with, she lowered her voice, with Pascal. But Ronald wasn't listening. He retired to his den to finish the plans for the mass production of the competent mechanical men, one for every home in America. He fell asleep with the thought. Corinne and Pascal spent the next two weeks going through pretty much the same routine. He methodically jotting through the household chores, she walking aimlessly from room to room, smoking too many cigarettes. She began to think of Pascal as a boarder, strange. At first he had been responsible for the unwanted feeling, but now his helpfulness around the house had lightened her burden, and he was so cheerful all the time after living with Ronald's preoccupied frown for seven years. After luncheon one day, when Pascal neglected to shut off the garden hose, she caught herself scolding him as if he were a human. Was that a shadow from the curtain waving in the breeze, or did she see a hurt look flit across the mouth of the pumpkin? Corinne put out her hand and patted Pascal's cylindrical wrist. It was warm, flesh warm. She hurried upstairs and stood breathing heavily, with her back to the door. A little later, she thought she heard someone, someone with a heavy step, moving around downstairs. I left the control box down there, she thought. Of course. It's absurd. At four o'clock, she went slowly down the stairs to start Ronald's dinner. Pascal was standing by the refrigerator, exactly where she had left him. Not until she had started to peel the potatoes, did she notice the little bouquet of pansies in the center of the table? Corinne felt she needed a strong cup of tea. She put the water on and placed a cup on the kitchen table. Not until she was going to sit down did she decide that perhaps Pascal should be in the other room. She pressed the red button, the one which should turn him around, and the blue button which made him walk into the living room. She heard the little buzz of mechanical life as Pascal began to move, but he did not go into the other room. He was holding a chair for her, and she sat down rather heavily. A sudden rush of pleasure reddened her cheeks, not since sorority days. Before Pascal's arms moved away, she touched his wrist again, softly. Only this time her hand lingered, and his wrist was warm. When do they want Pascal back at the lab? She asked Ronald at dinner that evening, trying to keep her voice casual. Ronald smiled. I think I might have him indefinitely, dear. I've got Hardwick convinced I'm working on something revolutionary. He stopped. Oh, Corinne, you spilled coffee all over yourself. The following night, Ronald was late in getting home from work. It was raining outside the Newark station, and the cabs deliberately evaded him. He finally caught a bus, which deposited him one block from his house. He cut through the back alley, hurrying through the rain. Just before he started up the stairs, he glanced through the lighted kitchen window. He stopped, gripping the railing for support. In the living room were Pascal and Corinne. Pascal was reclining leisurely in the fireside chair. Corinne was standing in front of him. It was the expression on her face which stopped Ronald Lovegear. The look was a compound of restraint and compulsion, the reflection of some deep struggle in Corinne's soul. Then she suddenly leaned forward and pressed her lips to Pascal's full, fleshy pumpkin mouth. Slowly, 
one of Pascal's aluminum arms moved up and encircled her waist. Mr. Lovegear stepped back into the rain. He stood there for several minutes. The rain curled around the brim of his hat, dropped to his face, and rolled down his cheeks with the slow agitation of tears. When finally he walked around to the front and stamped heavily up the stairs, Corinne greeted him with a flush in her cheeks. Ronald told her that he didn't feel quite up to dinner. Just coffee, please. When it was ready, he sipped slowly. Watching Corinne's figure as she moved around the room, she avoided looking at the aluminum figure in the chair. Ronald put his coffee down, walked over to Pascal, and gripping him behind the shoulders, dragged him into the den. Corinne stood looking at the closed door and listened to the furious pounding. Ten minutes later, Ronald came out and went straight to the phone. Yes, immediately, he told the man at the freight office. While he sat there, waiting, Corinne walked upstairs. Ronald did not offer to help the freight men drag the box outside. When they had gone, he went into the den and came back with the pumpkin. He opened the back door and hurled it out into the rain. It cleared the back fence and rolled down the alley, stopping in a small puddle in cinders. After a while, the water level reached the mouth, and there was a soft choking sound. The boy who found it the next morning looked at the mouth and wondered why anyone would carve such a sad jack-o'-lantern. The End End of Week on Square Roots by Russell Burton A Matter of Taste by Joseph Wesley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins A Matter of Taste by Joseph Wesley When a planet turns in an insurance claim, it could run to more than real money. Case RL 472 XYA 386 Oral Report of Claims Adjuster Mark Atkinson Number 384762 Transcribed by Telepath Operator Number 842 765J Tullis First and Final Report Case Closing Symbol A A A I arrived on the fourth planet of Sunder's Pride, stark naked, and stood comfortably in the snow, listening to the wind howl by, while waiting for the expedition manager to approach from the edge of the small clearing and welcome me. The manager's name is Obadiah Jones. Like the rest of the expedition, he's from one of the minor vegan colonies, Kinson Three, but he's undifferentiated earth stock. He bustled forward, wearing a full protective suit and helmet, the temperature is 30 degrees below zero centigrade at noon, and the atmosphere is poisonous. But I could see the expression of relief on his face through his faceplate. You're from Interstellar Insurance? He panted under the one and a half G of Sunder's pride. I assented with a dignified nod. He looked me up and down. My skin wasn't even showing goose pimples. Of course, then shrugged his shoulders. The insurance company sent a first-class mental control operator, I see. But it was a waste of talent. Maybe they didn't believe our reports. We had our own operators here, good ones too, and they haven't been able to find any solution. The aliens are much better at all sorts of mind control than even our most talented men. I know, our policy says that you can keep us from calling in the military authorities for a week, but it's just a waste of time, and more important, it's a waste of lives too. I suggest that you give us authority to call in the Navy right away. How many lives have you lost so far, I asked. Only a dozen but at regular intervals. That hardly seems excessive for an exploratory expedition, I commented. He shook his head impatiently. I said at regular intervals. The aliens treat us like we were cattle or sheep. Not exactly, I said, or you would have scarcely called me in. You must be operating at a profit, and that means you're trading with these aliens. He scowled, but did not deny it. Of course I knew this already. 
As an independent claims adjuster, it goes without saying that I'd checked on the case before teleporting to the planet. Their profit was enormous, and our losses would be potentially large if the military was invited to come in and spoil trade while saving lives. Their charter called for exclusive trading rights on any planet they opened for ten years, and they had the usual clause in their policy against loss by government action, meaning military, even at their own invitation. The military is fast, but it's not neat. The cost could run to billions for us, so my job was to try and find another way. Well, he said, can we send an emergency signal to the Navy? When does the next regular interval expire, I asked. He checked his timepiece, set in the sleeve of his suit, then scratched some numbers in the clean white surface of snow. His watch kept local time, of course. In about 14 Earth hours, he translated at last. Then there's no hurry, is there? I leaned against the gale that was blowing across the clearing. Why don't we go to your office so you can brief me? He turned and stumped his way heavily into a gap at the edge of the clearing, then along a narrow path that wound its way circuitously among the tall, slender, tinkling, half-living ice trees. I strolled lightly beside him, but my bare feet left deep imprints in the crustless snow. In about fifteen minutes, we reached the human settlement, with its airlock set modestly into a great mound of snow. Here we had a little difficulty. The lock was designed to pass bulky protective suits. If I'd gone through it bare, I'd have to let in some of the poisonous atmosphere into the camp. We solved that, though. Mr. Jones passed a suit out to me through the lock, and I put it on. Wore it all the way to his office, and then he wrestled me up one of his spare kilts, an ugly purple thing. Now, Obadiah, I said, after I had lighted one of his stogies and settled myself into his most comfortable chair. Why this urgent call for help? Our record shows that you've never hollered copper in your life. And you've had two expeditions nearly wiped out around you. You've got the best profit record in your organization. It's those aliens, said Mr. Jones. They arrived here on Sunder's Pride just a few days behind us. I've always felt that some day we'd come up against some life forms that would be too much for us. And I'm afraid we've done that at last. They trade us some of the most magnificent works of art that have ever been seen in the universe. You've undoubtedly admired some of them, and I'm sure you know the price they bring, and they do it as if they were tossing glass beads to savages. And if we are savages, what can we have to trade in return, I asked. There don't seem to be any great shakes with mechanical things, he answered. I call them gadgets, but they buy them. The only trouble is, that's not all they buy. He was sweating, his face turning as green as the polka dots on his kilt. He mopped his face and chest with a large handkerchief, and then sat there holding it looking as if he'd never seen a bandana before. I felt sorry for him. These provincial types have an automatic feeling of horror at the thought of meeting some superior creatures that will replace man in the galaxy. So I let him sit there for a couple of minutes to recover before I prompted him. Well, I said at last, the additional stuff they buy? What is it? This hadn't been part of the reports. Oh, yes. Once every five days, they take one man. I may have given you the idea that they killed them, they don't. They ship them off. They say we are very popular, and when there are enough of us on the market to bring the price down, we should make ideal pets, and we can't do a thing to stop them. I flicked the ash of my cigar delicately onto his carpet. You can't? What have you tried? He leaped to his feet and balled his fist belligerently. I'm trying to call in the military, but first I've got to get through the red tape of calling in you insurance people. Now, will you give me authority to call in a fleet before it's too late? I smiled at his superior manner and straightened a pleat on the hideous kilt. If you feel this way, then why do you worry about money? Why didn't you just call the fleet directly and forfeit your insurance? He glared at me through red-rimmed eyes. I tried that, he said. If only we had some central government to turn to. But that's impossible in space, of course. So I went to the only central force there is. And they said they'd have to count on voluntary contributions from the member planets and they couldn't afford to answer every call for help. They told me to contact my insurance company. Which, I commented mildly, is another centralized force in space. In spite of what you say, it's widespread, it's profit-making, and it gets the job done. Nobody has to try and beg for voluntary appropriations from penurious planetary governments. This isn't a crackpot fear of aliens, he said, as soon as I stopped talking. I've seen aliens before in all parts of the galaxy. I don't panic. Then you must have tried something else before hollering, Uncle, I said. Like perhaps keeping all of your men inside the dome, here, when the time for another abduction approaches. He waved his hand impatiently. We've tried everything a large group of top-flight minds can think of, he said. 
My own organization has an exceptional research staff, as I'm sure you know. The aliens work by mental control. We had everyone brought into this building, have double-checked them, have sealed the doors with a time lock. It turned out one of the men was missing. We'd only imagined he was among us when we assembled. We scoured the planet before we landed and saw no sign of aliens. We've seen no alien ships land since we arrived. We have no idea where they are, except that there's one sizable area, not far from here, that we can't seem to penetrate. The only evidence we have that the aliens arrived after we did is that they told us so, whatever that's worth. We've brought in some of mankind's best mental control operators, people like you, who are able to walk around in a poisonous atmosphere in sub-zero weather without any protection or any clothes at all. Every one of them is now among the victims. The aliens apparently thought it would be a good joke to take them. He paused. So you see, we don't expect you to be around very long. Just so you call in the military before the aliens call you in, we'll try to control our grief when you go. That's courteous of you, I said. But you're suffering under understandable misapprehension. You seem to believe, probably because of my somewhat unorthodox costume when I arrived, that I am a master controller. In point of fact, nothing could be farther from the case. I have no such powers. Or almost none, anyway. I arrived naked because of the enormous expense of teleportation. Those machines required gigantic amounts of power and skilled technicians. At ten thousand a pound, I saved the company five thousand by leaving my kilt behind. And even more when you consider my shoes. As for a protective suit, why, such an unnecessary cost would have been thrown out by our accountants in a minute. Obadiah Jones sneered at me in disbelief. But I totally ignored his attitude. Let's admit for the time being that these aliens are better at mental control than we are, I said. Then does it make sense for us to fight them with their own weapons, giving them cards and spades before the start of the game? Now, take me to the edge of this place where you say we can't go. In spite of Mr. Jones' urgent pleas, I refused to wear a protective suit, except to go out through the lock. I knew he was worried about the mind control, he still was convinced I was using to survive unprotected on the surface. He was afraid that when I came up against the aliens and what he called their superior powers, it would mean my death if I didn't have a suit, since I had equally valid reasons for not wearing the suit, and since I didn't want to explain them, I refused to argue. I just took the thing off as soon as we were outside. I left kilt on, though. I thought its ugliness might irritate the aliens. Obadiah Jones kept up a running patter of conversation. As he led me toward the forbidden area, we haven't been idle, he said. We've learned a lot about the aliens' mind control. For one thing, they work on our emotions. Several of us, who are still alive, have been exposed to that. There were eight or nine of us in a group. The first time one of us was chosen, he said, an overwhelming feeling of love was drawing him in one direction. Right after that, the rest of us felt a strong sensation of repulsion and fear. We ran away, leaving him behind. We never saw him again. They also control our senses. We see and hear what they want us to. It's perfect hallucination, but you'll know that for yourself in a few minutes. I knew it already, of course. It had been in Jones's report, all except the bit about their capturing his men, and I had come prepared. I must admit to feeling a distinct sensation of excitement as we approached the area, but it was not induced, I am sure, by the aliens, and in any event, it was not sufficiently intense to trigger my defense mechanisms. Here we are, said Obadiah Jones, at last, pointing to a marker attached to one of the ice trees. Beyond that sign, the troubles begin. It doesn't look like an alien artifact to me, I said, examining the crudely made marker carefully. It isn't. I had it put up after one of our men was missing for two days, wandering around in that area they claim for themselves. Well, I'll find out just how good their claim is, I said. I'm going in there. Good luck, said Mr. Jones. I'll wait for you here. But just in case I never see you again, won't you please give me authorization to call in the fleet? You can post-date it and cancel it if you get back. I nodded. I'll give you an authorization dated tomorrow, if you'll give me your gun first. You might just accidentally happen to kill me after getting that paper for me, considering how important you think it is to get the fleet here fast, and how sure you are that I'll be trapped. Jones looked startled and then sheepish, and gave me the gun without comment. I wrote out the paper he wanted, and then strolled up the path past the marker. It didn't look any different on the other side, 
It went straight into the forbidden area, and I do mean straight. It went on without the slightest sign of a turn, as far as the eye could see, and there were no cross trails anywhere along it. I stepped out at a good swift pace. Striding along after Jones disappeared from view behind me, I saw no sign of aliens. I saw no sign of anything unusual at all. Until about two hours after I started, I saw a marker in the distance ahead of me. Jones was sitting on the snow, just on the other side of the tree, with the marker on it. I strolled up toward him, crossed the invisible line, hiked up my kilt to keep it from getting down, and sat down on the soft snow beside him. Hello, he said noncommittally. You made pretty good time. In fact, that's a new record for the course. Then I'm not the first man to take that walk, I asked. Nope, just the fastest. I'm glad you didn't try to turn around and come back along the path. That way, you'd have gotten lost. Well, shall we go back to camp and call in the Navy? No, nope. I'm going back in, I said calmly. He waved one gloved hand at me. It's your funeral, he said. Or what amounts to the same thing, anyway. I stood up, dusted off the snow where some of it had stuck to me, and settled my kilt into as fashionable a manner as was possible. I crossed the line and started down the trail again, just as I had before, but this time I didn't follow my eyes. Soon after losing sight of Mr. Jones... I cut sharply off the clearly visible trail to the right and started to weave my way through a thicket of ice trees. Gradually, a sensation of fear, entirely foreign to my usual nature, built up within me, but I ignored it and kept going. As the sensation increased to a nearly uncontrollable level, one of the automatic mechanisms I had had the foresight to have implanted in my body operated, and a few drops of a drug were shot into my veins and almost instantly took effect. I still felt the fear sensation, but it no longer had the power to bother me as much. With that drug in my bloodstream, no emotion could affect me strongly. As I worked my way through the tinkling jungle of ice trees, there was an amazing change. Before my eyes, the trees suddenly seemed to clothe themselves in leaves and bark, and the sounds became those of birds and insects. I was working my way through a jungle of earth. The heavy gravity of Sunder's pride had not disturbed me before, but now it was replaced by the almost buoyant feeling resulting from the far lighter gravity of earth. The harsh yellow glow of the sunlight striking on eternal ice was replaced by the vibrant blues and greens of tropical earth. My fear sensation, which had been generalized, suddenly sharpened. I was reminded of a time on earth when I had nearly died in a tropical river teeming with piranha fish. I still have a couple of scars from that episode. Before me, I could see the river flowing, even under the calming influence of the drug, I could feel my heart pounding in my throat. I must confess that it took a distinct effort of will for me to wade into that water. It was boiling with the flashing forms of angry fish. As I stepped forward, I could feel their greedy jaws snapping into my flesh, feel the pointed rows of teeth on the bones of my ankles, then my legs, then my thighs. Despite the agony... I continued on, and the water level gradually rose until it closed over my head, and my sight faded as the fish bit out my eyes. I think I might have screamed then if I hadn't already felt the fish tear out my throat, so that now I knew screaming was impossible. Besides, I didn't want to open my mouth and let them go to work on my tongue. I protected the soft spot under my chin with the hand that held Obadiah's gun. If any of you homeside heroes... Ever wonder if we claims adjusters really earn our considerable salaries? Let me clue you. We do. When, stripped to a skeleton, I still kept moving, stolidly ahead. The boiling of the water slowly died away. The pain ceased, and my sight gradually came back. The jungle was still there, but I found that I was climbing up out of the river onto a trail that somehow seemed familiar. The fear sensation was gone, too, to be replaced by a very different one. I remembered why I had gone into the jungle on earth so many years before, and why the trail was familiar, and who had been at the end of it, and who was at the end of it. She was soft and beautiful, and she had loved me for a while. She loved me still, I realized, and she was waiting for me. I hurried my steps, and the automatic mechanisms again put a few drops of drug into my bloodstream. I could still feel the sensation of longing, but the urgency was gone. I let the feeling continue to pull me forward without fighting it, and willingly followed the twists and turns of the still familiar trail. As the trees thinned out, 
until I could see the well-remembered cottage, with its thatched roof, its single room, its wide veranda. I slowed. The house stood alone, with no trees around it, just the way she and I wanted it. I stopped at the last tree and looked at the house for several minutes. Nothing moved that I could see, circling slowly from tree to tree. I continued watching the house until I was staring at it from a point nearly opposite the place where I had first seen it. Then I began to walk toward it. Even the sound of the birds had faded away, although I could still smell the heady fragrance of tropical flowers. She had always kept a large bouquet of them on the table beside the bed. When I reached a point, about twenty paces from the house, I wheeled suddenly and leapt forward, aiming at a spot where nothing showed to the eye. There was a moment, the merest instant, of dizziness, and then a room suddenly materialized round me. The room looked alien, and there were two aliens at the far end of it. The usual drag of one and a half earth gravities had returned. This, I felt, was the first undistorted view any man on earth had had of these aliens, except as a pet. I had not expected any human to be able to find his way here, to this room at the center of their base. The room was not what I had expected. I had thought that I would find myself on the inside of a spaceship, and by no stretch of the imagination could this have ever traveled between stars. It was unmistakably a prefab hut. The two aliens better fit my preconceptions. They looked something like overgrown sea anemones, with three multiple jointed arms and three short legs. They were just over two meters tall. They were extremely sluggish in their movements, as might be expected from creatures that depended almost entirely on their mental abilities for control of their environment. They looked at me for a few minutes. All of their eyes were amazingly human-like in appearance, and I imagine that they had had expressions of surprise. If I could have found any expression, or interpreted from their tendrils just where their faces were, finally one of them moved slowly to the far wall, extended one of his arms, and depressed a lever on a rather crude-looking panel attached to that wall. He then moved slowly back to his companion, and both of them continued to stare at me. I waved cheerfully at them. Hi, fellows, I said. I could detect no answer, but the room wavered a little before my eyes. I blinked and shook my head, and my vision cleared. So you haven't been trained in the techniques of mental control of Earthmen, I commented. That's interesting. A feathery stalk slowly rose from among the coiling things that circled their tops, and at the same time I heard a gentle, dragging noise approaching the door of the hut. It sounds as if we might be about to have company, I said. That will be pleasant. I examined my two hosts closely, because I had a feeling that I wouldn't be able to see them much longer as they really were. It's good of you to be so cautious, I said. If you hadn't been so careful as to shield this hut, just in case we earthmen turned out to have adequate mind-control powers of our own, I wouldn't have had this chance to see you two in all your natural ugliness. Your friends out there would have had kept me under control all this time. And what's more, I added, I wouldn't even have known that you creatures had something that would shield your power. Our scientists will be very interested in examining this hut in great detail. Just then, the door of the hut swung open, and two elf-like creatures appeared to walk briskly in. I glanced at them, and then back to where my two slow-moving acquaintances had been standing. They were no longer in sight. Perhaps we can make things a little more comfortable for you, said one of the brisk elves. You have earned most special treatment from us, he gestured, and the strangeness of the room strangely disappeared. The walls were suddenly paneled in mahogany and hung with rich drapes. Easy chairs were placed at intervals, around a long, polished table. A picture window showed a bucolic scene bathed in cool sunshine. A deep pile rug covered the floor. I looked around, appreciatively. Very nice, I complimented them, and in excellent taste. But you have forgotten one thing, haven't you? What's that? asked the second elf in a piping voice. Why, you forgot about the gravity. It's still at Sunder's Pride Normal. So it is, said the elf, but then you can't expect us to think of everything. Besides, it doesn't seem to bother you the way it does most of the other creatures of your kind. The gravity did not appear to change. No matter, I said politely. I strolled over to the table and stroked it with the hand that was not holding the gun. It seemed very real. 
Won't you sit down? asked the first elf. I'm sure you'll find the chairs are very comfortable. I'm sure I would, I said, but no thank you. I'm certain it would provide you with a lot of innocent merriment if I squatted in thin air under the impression that I was settled into a cozy chair, but I did not come here to amuse you. The elf smiled. You are very different from the others who lumbered to this planet in those clumsy artifacts. You are almost like a person, in spite of your feverish running around. Several of our laboratories will bid very high for the right to examine you. I bowed, acknowledgment of his compliment. I am not in one of your laboratories yet, I said mildly. It will be very interesting to find out how you managed to get here, in spite of our mind control, said the second elf. Your arrival, without that necessity of swaddling yourself in awkward garments, indicated a certain amount of ability along mental lines. But I sense no more of it in you than several others of your kind have managed to muster. The others all brought premium prices on the market, despite conveyances and garments. I gather you don't think much of mechanical contrivances, I said lightly. Alien the first shrugged. They make interesting toys, he said. But of course, they are useless crutches in building a civilization. They bring good prices when peddled for the amusement of our children and the shallow-minded adults. Listening to your remarks about our spaceships, I continued, I presume all of you teleported here? We Earthmen may not be very good at mind control, but I think we have a good grasp of the principles, and I don't see how you could teleport without some sort of terminal device. Didn't you have to send those here by machine? There was a brief silence, and then Alien the Second answered, I suppose it doesn't matter if we tell you. After all, we have you in our possession. As you suggest, we do need a terminal device, but we didn't use machinery. We used mines. The mines of you Earthmen. When the first of you landed on this uninhabited planet, we discovered that your undirected capacities were sufficient to serve as the terminal of our teleport system. We couldn't go directly to any of your more populous planets, because the vast numbers of your untrained minds causes so much static that the noise level is too high to permit a sharp enough focus for teleporting. Of course, now that we're here, where you've set up a teleport terminal that connects into your foolish mechanical network and ties into all of your thousands of planets, we'll have no trouble going anywhere among your worlds that we want to. And as soon as we've built up enough consumer demand for you creatures as house pets, we'll move in for the harvest. It might not be too bad at that, I said. I've got a cat back home on Earth, and she runs my household pretty much to suit her fancy. But I'm afraid it's not the same thing for Earthmen to be house pets. The ones we've got are doing a very good job at it, said number two. And as we indicated, you won't get a chance to be a pet. You seem very sure that you have me under your control. Very sure, said number one. In this confined space, with our training, the two of us could overcome all but one in a thousand of your own kind. So do you think you have a chance? I decided that a simple expletive would suffice as an answer. I didn't know enough about them to be sure it was biologically possible for them to carry out my suggestion. But it wasn't important. They ignored me. At least they didn't answer me. Instead, a cage suddenly appeared around me, leaving me scarcely room to move around. I reached out, tapped one of the bars. It seemed very strong. I didn't think I was even close to panicking, but the implanted devices in my body fed some more of the drug into my veins. I may have felt a little more tense than I realized. At any rate, the time for action seemed to have arrived, and it was not on the mental level. I spun toward an apparently empty portion of the room and emptied Obadiah's pistol. The sound of explosive pellets was very loud in the room. The bars withered, wavered, and disappeared, as did the two elf-like creatures. The atmosphere of the room turned momentarily opaque, and when it cleared, what I could see was once again a clumsy prefab. Two of the aliens were still standing in a corner. The remains of the other two were splashed pretty generally throughout the room. It was quite a mess. Well, I said, thanks for the party. You'll excuse me for running. There was no answer. The two surviving aliens hadn't learned much about Earthmen. I walked over, lifted one of them. He weighed about 300 pounds, I judged. That would be a couple of hundred on Earth. Hefty creatures. I figured that one was about all I could handle. I looked around at the articles in the room and then decided not to use any of them. I was sure that everything I saw was actually there. 
but it didn't seem wise to take chances. I took off Obadiah's purple kilt and tore it into strips without regret. Then I used the strips to fasten one of the aliens securely so he couldn't use his arms or his legs. I didn't know if he could do anything loose, but I didn't want him to try. The other alien I heaved up onto my shoulders, and then I walked out of the room. There were a few of the ice trees scattered around, but the countryside looked barren. I couldn't visually identify any landmarks, but I started off without hesitation, and in about three hours, I was back at the marker. From there on, I used my eyes to follow the path back to the airlock. I had no trouble. This time, Mr. Jones gave me a checked kilt. I know you won't believe me, but it was even more hideous than the purple one. The red and yellow squares were at least three inches across. Luckily, I didn't have to look at it, just wear it. Jones was a little confused as to why I had brought back one of the aliens. He didn't even recognize it as an alien at first, of course. He'd never seen one of them before, just the elfin form they'd wanted him to see. I had no more hallucinations, and the other Earthmen seemed to be seen normally, too. Apparently, there had only been the two trained beings among the aliens on Sunder's Pride, and only four of them in all. Nonetheless, I was in a hurry. I sent out an urgent call for one of the most skilled mental controllers in interstellar insurance. I'll admit, there are times when they can be put to use. Jones and I went down to the clearing that was the teleport terminal to welcome him. The company chose to send that young, self-styled genius, Ralph Carter. He's supercilious and conceited and altogether obnoxious. I don't know why you hire such people, but no question of it. He's really an expert in his field. He was dressed in a dark green kilt in the latest style, and he smirked when he saw the thing I had on. I ignored his attitude, as befit a gentleman. I figured that it was time to move fast. While I showed Carter the way to the headquarters, I explained why I had called for him. I wanted him to get into communication with the alien and find out the location of his homeworlds. But how can I do that? Carter asked. I don't know anything at all about these aliens. Can't you use your mental training to help you learn to talk mind to mind? I suppose so. That shouldn't take more than a few days. The techniques are well established with other new races we've encountered. But learning his language won't make him answer. I looked at him with my most superior manner. While you're learning his language, I suggest you learn some of his psychology. Then you can get some of our engineers to design you a machine that will function the way a polygraph does with humans. Act as a lie detector. With the proper choice of questions, you should find out anything you want to know. He shuddered, delicately at the mention of the naughty word machine. Mentalists sometimes become purists and make fools of themselves by trying to do without machinery, something like the attitude of the aliens. When I had given Carter his instructions, I turned to the rest of the expedition. I want all of your weapons, I said, and don't try holding out on me. That's to include knives and scissors, too. We'll lock them up in Jones's vault. Now see here, said Jones. Some more of those aliens may show up any time. We can't afford to go without our guns. That's just the reason you've got to get rid of them. I don't want you to start shooting each other and me. Now send out a party as fast as you can to bring back a sample of that building material that blocks out their minds. We'll ship it back to Earth and see if they can put it into mass production. Have the party bring back that second alien, too. If we happen to spoil the one we've got making him talk, it would be nice to have a spare. While the small group was away, I had Obadiah improvise some leg irons out of light chain and padlocks and use them to hobble all of the Earthmen who remained in camp. Jones screamed like a Holta, whose mate had estivated, but it didn't do him any good. I had the authority. He got even madder when I put the irons on him and at the same time turned him down again when he wanted to call in the military. The idea of a space fleet around while the aliens were still free to use their mind powers gave me cold chills. When the group returned from the aliens' camp, they did so without the alien. They brought back the still-tied strips of the purple kilt. It looked as if he'd teleported right out of them, but at least they did have a piece of the prefab hut with them. I had it sent back to Earth, but not until after I'd attached chains to the party's legs, so they had to creep along with six-inch steps like the others. As the days passed, without any apparent action from the aliens, dissatisfaction and grumbling grew. My precautionary action with the chains was very unpopular. At the end of my first week after my arrival on Sunder's Pride, Jones tried to invoke the policy he'd signed with the company to call in the military on the grounds that the situation hadn't been resolved in the prescribed time and that the use of chains proved 
that the colony was in even greater danger than before I had arrived. I invoked the substantial progress clause, of course, but the fact that I'd changed the combination to the vault and had the only gun in the entire camp outside of it probably was more convincing to him. Carter called in a top-flight engineer and made real progress in developing lie detector techniques against the alien. The aliens were basically a guileless lot. I almost felt sorry for them. Things eased up a little. When Earth sent us a stack of sheets, they claimed would be just as good in blocking out thoughts as the sample we had sent them. The alien captive told us, after Carter persuaded him a little, the blocking power was impressed on their building materials by a mental process. We used electronic techniques, and our engineers said they could have done it years before if mentalists and they could have gotten together on the work. By testing, we found the stuff we had blocked out anything Carter could transmit. So I let the rest of our people take off their chains, as long as they were inside the camp, as soon, that is, as we had it fully protected. They worked faster on that job than they had ever worked in their lives before. A few hours later, I was strolling down toward Telepath Clearing with a courier to send back a report to Earth when the aliens returned. The first warning we had was a sudden wave of hate that struck like a physical blow. It brought the courier to his knees, momentarily helpless. Even with an automatic, instantaneous shot of the drug, it had me grinding my teeth. Whether it was the rapidity of my recovery and my quickness of thought, or whether it was just the effect of the hate spasm, I don't know. At any rate, I did the right thing. Before the courier could get up off his knees and try to kill me, as I was sure he would do, I slugged him along the ear with the butt of my pistol. The hatred sensation seemed to be channeled and directed. It made us want to destroy aliens, not each other. And that was unexpected to me. And because the courier was on his way back to Earth, I'd left the chains off of him. In another few seconds, I figured he'd have tried to kill me, or at least that was my initial thought, until I realized that, since I'm a human, he wouldn't have felt hate for me. By that time, and quite properly, I had laid him out cold. I reached down and picked up the courier, intending to toss him lightly across my shoulder and start back to camp. I found that I had a problem. I couldn't figure out which one of my three stumpy legs to start walking with. I extended all my eyes and examined myself. I looked like an alien wearing a checkered kilt. Unhappily, I tried to lip my labial fringes with my tongue. And suddenly I realized that I had no tongue. It was an unnerving realization, even to me. But then I knew why the aliens were transmitting hatred of themselves. Any Earthman who knew what an alien looked like would attack me on sight. I closed all of my eyes and concentrated. But I couldn't seem to be able to figure out which of my three hands held the gun for I could no longer see it. I decided it was time for me to get back inside the barrier. That was a devil of a lot easier to decide than it was to do. I could see three legs, and I could feel three legs, but I didn't know how to operate three legs. I was slowed down to sort of a hobble. It wasn't as slow as the sluggish amble of the real aliens, but it wasn't any faster than other Earthmen could move, hobbled by chains. I couldn't afford to delay very long, though. Some of the unchained men inside of the shack might take it into their heads to step outside without remembering to hobble themselves, considering I was not there to remind them, and I didn't feel up to trying to handle anything like that. I sneaked up as close as I could get to the lock without being seen. There were six men gathered in front of it, waiting for me. I couldn't think of anything else to do, so I just lit out for the airlock, shuffling along as fast as I could go. The men swarmed around me. I threw the courier at the first group to arrive. He was still out and gained a few seconds. But they hung on me. They pummeled me. They bit, and they clawed. I just kept struggling bravely forward. I couldn't think of anything else to do. At the last minute, just as I thought I was going to go down, under the mass of feet and fists, two of the men somehow got tangled in each other's chains, and I managed to break loose long enough to pull myself into the lock. As the outer door swung closed, I found myself with two arms, two legs, and praise be a tongue. Obadiah's kilt was missing, and I'm happy to say I never saw it again. The gun was visible once more, still firmly clutched in my right hand. It was empty. My fingers were squeezing tightly on the trigger. Much good it had done me. I passed quickly into the headquarters building, bringing with me a breath of poisonous outer air that sent the men inside except for Carter to gasping and choking, not even pausing to say hello or to apologize for bringing in some of the outer atmosphere with me. I hurried over to the control panel and switched on the visual receptors that showed outside of the airlock. The men out there were fighting each other to get inside the building and kill me. 
As they managed to battle their way in through the airlock, they looked bewildered for a moment, and then all of them, released from the frenzy of hate, collapsed into unconsciousness. We were a bloody mess, every one of us, but not one of us was seriously hurt. The aliens had outsmarted themselves. While I had looked like one of them, those parts of me, like ice stalks, that had seemed most vulnerable, so that the Earthmen had gone after them, had turned out to be things like ears and noses. They hurt, but they didn't put me out of action when they were battered. And that's all that saved me from being killed. I didn't figure that out until later, I must admit. I counted this. We were all safe inside. Then I used an amplifier, connected up to a loudspeaker, outside to call the aliens. I called for several minutes, without receiving any response, before I realized they spoke with their minds exclusively and couldn't penetrate into the headquarters, where we were, with their pseudo-voices. I sighed, and started to go outside. But Jones hauled me back and made me put on a protective suit. He said he couldn't stand another whiff of that atmosphere. Once outside, I had no trouble communicating with the aliens. They were very anxious to talk. Apparently, they were convinced that since they believed my mental powers were at least as strong as theirs, there were probably many more Earthmen like me that they wouldn't be able to tackle. I had no trouble at all making a lucrative trading deal with them for Jones's company. Once I convinced them that I knew the location of their planets and that it would be an easy matter to blast them from the face of the universe with primitive, uncivilized fusion bombs, they even promised to send back the men they had taken as pets. After that, I staggered back into the camp and slept the clock around. When I awoke, I found that all of the men were very anxious to know the secret of my success, especially Carter, who knew very well that I had no skill at mental control. I was glad to oblige them, as a reward for Carter's courtesy in giving me his stylish green kilt, which fitted me very well. Obadiah gave Carter another one of his horrors, and it was the worst we had seen to date, as I let that young worthy know with a simple cock of an eyebrow. It was all very simple, as I explained to my admiring audience. The reports we'd had back at headquarters of the Interstellar Insurance Company indicated that it was useless to try and compete with the aliens on the mental level, where they were the strongest. This was the mistake that Jones and his so-called experts had made. I decided, when I was given the assignment to straighten things out, that the best way to compete was where we Earthmen were the strongest, with mechanical gadgets. So I had our scientists implant a power source in my body, I made use of short half-life radioactive isotopes for the energy source. Not too well shielded, but what the hell. I had already fathered my family, and it gave me more power than I could ever need. In order to be able to use that power, I'd had the scientist set up a closed-cycled system in my body. The combustion products, created by the burning of food by my body cells, as in all humans, were carbon dioxide and water. These were broken down, in another gadget implanted in my body into oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. The oxygen I used directly, another compact machine, synthesized carbohydrates to complete the closed-loop cycle. I neither breathed nor ate during the entire time I was on Sunder's Pride, except for the purpose of talking, and that breathing never went past the larynx. It was lucky I didn't need to breathe, too. Otherwise, I'd have drowned in imaginary water, while waiting in that river, the aliens had created my mind. Also, I explained, I had a lot of supersonic devices sent into me, with the transponder in my chest. That's why I had to avoid wearing a protective suit. Unless my chest was bare, I squelched the signals. I used this sonar to judge what was going on around me, no matter what I seemed to see. Now don't feed us that, said Jones belligerently. We aren't that dumb. Don't you think we tried using sonar and radar to fool the aliens? They worked on all of our senses. What we saw on radar or sonar matched perfectly the false picture we thought we were seeing with our eyes. It was the same when we used oral reception. What came into our ears matched what we thought we saw. So now stop kidding around and tell us the truth. I smiled condescendingly. I am telling you the absolute truth, Obadiah. You didn't use your head. Of course, the sound signals I received from the sonar matched what I thought I saw. I didn't underestimate the aliens. It's just that the sound to my ears wasn't the only readout method I had used. In addition to connecting to the nerves of my ears, which the aliens expected, the sonar output also connected to the nerves of my tongue. Anything ahead of me tasted sweet, anything behind me tasted salt, to my left was bitter, to my right acid. The aliens didn't expect me to taste what was to be seen around me, and what they didn't know about, they couldn't counter. No matter what I saw or heard, I just followed my tongue. I had a few bad moments one time, 
when by accident, more or less, the actions of the aliens almost made me imagine that my tongue was being destroyed. But I managed to work my way out of that by keeping my mouth closed. Just the other day, though, I had some more rough minutes, when I found that along with thinking I had the body of an alien, I also thought I had no tongue, like them. You see, I used what the aliens considered to be primitive mechanical toys. Oh, and one more thing. Not quite so primitive. My brain. You might all profit by trying that once in a while. Well, said Jones at last, I've got to give you credit. You knew what you were doing. That's right, I said, magnanimously. I had the choice of trying to combat them with mental control, where the aliens are stronger, or with mechanical science, where humans are stronger, which I chose to use. I punned. It was just a matter of taste. End of report. I'm going on a long vacation with my bonus money. And what I do while I'm away is none of your business. Don't send me any of your preaching letters this time. How I have my fun is also a matter of taste. End of A Matter of Taste by Joseph Wesley Recording by James Jenkins